Welcome back to my channel. We are sticking with sports romances and this theme for right now. Um, we just finished up the baseball romances and now we're moving into the football romances. And I thought about waiting until fall to release these, but I realized that once they're up, you can listen to them any time of year that you want. So I don't have to worry about that. You guys can pick whenever you want to listen to these. Um, so the Miracle Groom is the first one in the Texas Titan romance series. And it is about a line packer named Teo and a um, master's graduate named Cedar. And what I love about these two is the thing that brings them together is actually Teo's son. Teo is a single father and he has a tragic past, but Cedar is just the woman to swoop in and pull it all back together and heal his broken heart with love. So if you're ready for a alpha male with a sweet side and a adorable son, then this is the audiobook for you. I'll see you on the other side. The Miracle Groom, a Texas Titans football romance novel, written by Lucy McConnell, narrated by Christina Dimmick. Chapter 1 Cedar Bell fanned her face with a clipboard, grateful that her billowy cream top didn't stick to all the sticky places on her body. The Texas sun was quite different from the California sun she'd grown up with, and the humidity here was stuffy. Even after two years in Texas, she was still getting used to the differences in climate and culture. Several Texas-themed slogans came to mind as she waited just outside the practice stadium doors to welcome the Titans players to the first annual Tiny Titans football camp. The players would go over fundamentals with children ages 7 to 12. Cedar had opened registration two months ago and was ecstatic when all 100 spots were filled within seven hours, an omen that she was on the right track with the camp and with her life. Cars began streaming into the player's parking lot, two sporty numbers with shiny paint and one pickup truck with a lift kit. Go big or go home, Cedar thought. The man they called Zeus, Kate Kincaid, and his recently signed brother, Anthony, climbed out of their trucks at the same time. They grinned at one another and headed her way, joined by Xavier Newton. Cedar sucked in warm air to calm her trembling limbs. She'd poured her heart and soul into this camp for the last four months. With only two positions available, organizing the inaugural Tiny Titans football camp was the coveted internship in her master's program. Cedar had heard that the Titans organization planned to hire one of the interns for a full-time position at the end of the internship. Choosing between Cedar and Darren, the other intern, was a no-brainer. Darren hadn't done a half-day's worth of work since they smiled for their IDs and created passwords. There was no way the field facilities manager, Mrs. Kent, would hire him, not when she could barely stand to be in the same practice stadium with the slacker. As long as everything went well today, and everything would go well, then her post-graduation job was in the bag. Hello, Mr. Kincaid, Mr. Kincaid, Mr. Newton. She checked their names off the list. Thank you for coming. If you'll head to the lounge area, Trudy will have your shirts and schedules for the day. She pulled the door open, enjoying the short blast of cool air as the hunky men passed by. Her eyes lingered on their broad shoulders and fit bodies. Everything's bigger in Texas. She pulled back her smile in an effort to appear professional. As soon as the door shut behind them, she fanned herself again. Forget spray-on tanning salons. This town needs a spray-on deodorant station. She lightly tapped the clipboard to her chin as she considered the possibility of an antiperspirant business. Of course she couldn't call it a sweat salon. What woman wanted to walk into a place with a name like that? There had to be a better term. Something that sounded inviting and sweet and sophisticated. Was there a sophisticated term for perspiring? Or sweat? Drizzle? Moisture? Dampness? She frowned. Names were the hardest part of dreaming up a business idea. Taking her thoughts in the other direction, she focused on the benefits a deodorant salon offered as she smiled, held the door, and gestured which direction players should go once inside. 
dry, parched, parched was pretty good. It could be cute in the right font, and it didn't give away what went on behind closed doors. Women like to look beautiful, they just didn't want the world knowing how hard they worked for it. That's where the billion-dollar cosmetic companies cashed in. Not to mention clothing designers, hair product manufacturers, perfume, lotions, the list danced on, leading dollar signs in a cha-cha through Cedar's head. What's his name? Ariana Sanchez startled Cedar from her musings with a teasing smile. She carried a large box in her thin but defined arms. Ariana wasn't one of the players, but she was helping out with the camp today in the agility station and had primo parking. Cedar tucked away her idea for parched. Her fingers tickled with the need to start typing. She had a half dozen small business plans on her hard drive, and she almost had the degree. Ideas for small businesses rolled out of her as easily as Cade, Kincaid, through touchdowns. Unfortunately, she didn't have the Kincaid money to back her up. Excuse me, she asked Ariana, reaching for the door. Ariana rested the box on her hip. I asked what his name was. Cedar looked around the parking lot to figure out which player Ariana wanted to meet. There were only a few stragglers at this point, but she was pretty sure Ariana knew most of the guys on the team. Her brother, Ace Sanchez, was part of the triple threat that led the team last year. Ace was sidelined this year with an injury, but he was still active in the football community. Which guy? Ariana laughed at her cluelessness. The one you're daydreaming about. Cedar pulled the door open wider to give Ariana and her box room to pass through. Actually, I was dreaming up a new business idea. Ariana lifted her sculpted eyebrows. If there was one way to describe Ariana, beautifully sculpted was it. She owned a fitness gym and had the definition to prove it. Although tough, she managed to maintain a level of femininity with her swoopy eyeliner and diamond stud earrings. Running your own business is tough. Take it from someone who knows. She adjusted the box as three players hurried past. Cedar waved them in with a smile. Hey, I used to be a camp counselor for six- and seven-year-olds. Nothing scares me. Ariana laughed. Sounds like you're in the right place, then. You too. Thank you for all your hard work. Cedar motioned Ariana through the door as another player approached. Ariana called farewell and made her way into the building. The man was a walking house who cast a long shadow. Cedar would hate to be on his bad side. Hello, Mr. Carter. Thank you for coming. She pointed the defensive tackle in the right direction. He nodded, his headphones still on his ears. Cedar wasn't sure if he heard her, but he turned the right direction, so at least he didn't wander off. She checked him off her list. Her first list for the day, that is. There were several. She continued to welcome the last of the players who poured in like Gatorade vendors before a game. Several others wouldn't arrive until after lunch when some of these guys would go home. She'd tried to be flexible and still get the first string players here. They were the ones the kids wanted to see. They were the role models. In the meantime, that deodorant salon was looking like a better idea as muscles and bright smiles and testosterone paraded before her eyes and made her stomach turn to goo. Who knew she was such a sucker for a nice body? Not her, she'd always dated intellectual types who had strong brains and weak arms. Ariana's comment about being in the right place stuck in her head like chewing gum under a bunk bed in cabin 5. There was no doubt in her mind that her experience at Camp Buckeye was what put her above the other applicants for this position. She hadn't always thought that she was supposed to be here. Darren had broken up with her the night before they received their acceptance emails. Neither of them had been happy to have to work together. Once two people break up, they should be able to maintain a distance that allowed them to politely ignore one another. 
The best breakups include the option of never seeing the other person again, ever. Since that wasn't the case, Cedar had done her best to remain emotionally uninvested in Darren's activities outside of their shared responsibilities. When he started taking long lunches and leaving early, the relief of not having to look at a man she'd kissed and wonder what she had been thinking energized her to work all the harder. Though there were still moments when she thought she might, just a little, miss him. Sure, she was angry at him now, but they'd been good together for a while. He had the ability to charm a desk chair, and she enjoyed watching him work. He talked them into sold-out plays, and bettered tables at restaurants, and even managed to get their Ayana group project to a solid day after just a few minutes with the professor. Having Darren on her team had given her the confidence to take risks. Once the herd of players cleared and the parking lot was free of movement, she ran her finger down the list. One more to go. Cedar checked her smart watch. Camp started in five minutes. She needed to be in there to make sure Darren got the microphone turned on. Seriously, he was such a trust fund baby. She scanned the parking lot entrance for any sign of an offensive tackle. Teo Parada, where are you? She tapped her foot. If he wasn't there in two minutes, she would have to head inside without welcoming him. Cedar ground her teeth. She hated leaving a job unfinished. Feeling her temperature rise, she stepped inside the door and stared out the window, willing Teo Parada to appear. Chapter 2 Teo steered his SUV into the player's parking lot and took the first available spot at the end of a row. He'd have to sprint across the blacktop if he was going to make it on time. Shifting into park, he bailed out of the car and ripped open the back door. Come on, Akone, we're late. Akone lifted his pudgy arms, eager to get out of his car seat. The kid had a love-hate relationship with the straps. He loved to hate them and arched his back in protest whenever Teo tried to buckle him in. His efforts were admirable, matching Teo's determination to hold back the defensive line on the field. While Teo was grateful to see hints that his son would follow in his footsteps, maybe even play for the Titans one day, he would love to see Akone apply himself to a less frustrating situation. But there was no changing who the kid was, and Teo admired his spunk. Teo tucked the one-year-old into the crook of his elbow, threw the diaper bag over his shoulder, and took off at a sprint. He was pushing it. Not by running, that came easily enough. He was pushing the clock. Thankfully, this wasn't an off-season mandatory workout. Coach would have made him suffer for showing up late. Coach may not breathe down his neck today, but the camp was important to the Titans and to the downtown area. James Knight, the team owner, wanted to make sure Dallas loved the Titans enough to overlook the traffic jams on game days and approve changes in roadways to make life easier for the fans. Akone giggled as they ran. As much as Teo loved to toss his son in the air and have his laughter fill up their otherwise empty home, today was no game. He'd have to be on guard for reporters. Cameras were sure to be everywhere. Any chance columnists had to get the latest scoop on the Kincaid brothers was sure to be a feeding frenzy, and the last thing Teo wanted was his son caught up in a tank of sharks. Teo had been able to avoid the press after Amy died in the middle of last season by releasing a blanket statement asking them to respect his time of mourning and give him space. By walking through those doors, he was declaring himself open to interviews and comments. He reached for the door only to have to pull back quickly as someone opened it from inside. Whoa! The little woman tipped her head up and up until Teo was blindsided by her eyes, blue with swirls of green like the ocean surrounding his island home. The ocean he'd stared at when he needed to recenter himself, when he needed a quiet moment alone, and when the family gathered for luau's. Whoa, Teo echoed, taking in her strappy sandals, tight jeans, and flowing cream top that accented her peaches and cream skin. She had a name tag on a lanyard, and he glimpsed the word intern printed there. She cleared her throat. Mr. Parada? Teo, he corrected. 
A woman this beautiful should use his first name. That should be a rule. You're late. Yes, I am. He didn't bother to explain that Akone had a major diaper issue this morning, and he'd gagged his way through cleaning the kid and throwing out his clothing. Things like that happened with toddlers. Oh, you brought a friend. She nodded to Akone. Akone, a sucker for a pretty face, lit up, showing off his baby teeth. He was barely learning to walk and only said one word, but Akone's smile was practiced perfection. The woman smiled in return, softening for Akone's adorableness. Teo's kid was cute, that was not up for debate, and he knew it, too. She reached for Akone's foot and tickled his shoeless toes. Player, Teo muttered. The intern pulled her hand away and straightened her shoulders as if she were slipping back into the role of responsible intern. You're the last one to arrive, so I'm afraid you've missed your chance at orientation. I'll send Trudy to find you with a shirt. She pulled open the door and gestured for him to go inside. He would have held the door for her, but her lips were set in a line that pointed for him to get a move on. And he'd thought meeting his coach when he was late was a bad thing. She'd have him running laps around the parking lot if he didn't get out of her way. They marched down the hallway to the practice field, where the sound of children's voices welcomed them. Akone curled into Teo at the noise, as if he could become a part of him. Teo bounced him gently. Teo, called Brady Giles. A cornerback, Brady was six feet three inches tall and new to the team. Teo had heard the move had more to do with personal reasons than with football. Over here, man. You're with me. Brady had about ten kids bouncing around him like cheerleaders after a touchdown. He didn't seem phased by their enthusiasm. If the smile of his face was any indication, he was feeding off of it, excited to play. Teo had been looking forward to this camp for that very reason. Nothing made a guy feel better about his choices in life than having a bunch of kids looking up to him. Not that Teo had an overly developed need for attention. Quite the opposite, he relished his privacy from the public in general. In this situation, with kids who wanted to learn about football, he was thrilled to put himself out there and share as much as he could to help keep them safe on the field and feed their love of the game. All his excitement had petered out when his nanny up and quit that very morning, saying she wanted freedom to pursue other career paths. Her words had changed the camp from a fun opportunity to a have to task. Thank you for coming today. We appreciate your participation, said the polite intern before she hurried off, checking boxes on her list. Teo watched her leave, wondering what he'd done to offend her and if he should apologize. Teo. Brady threw a ball to Teo earning him a round of cheers from the peanut gallery. On instinct, Teo dropped the diaper bag off his shoulder and snatched the ball out of the air, spinning so he could maintain his hold on Akone. He scanned the room for a place to set Akone down. The tables had tablecloths with the Titans logo. Akone could grab onto the fabric to pull himself up and get a laptop in his face. He could crawl onto the field and be trampled by one of the kids, or worse, a player. Tail went head to head with these guys in practice and came back sore. His baby wouldn't stand a chance. He could fall down the concrete stairs, bite an electrical cord, put his finger in a socket. This place was a hazard. But Tail couldn't throw footballs and teach blocking while holding a one year old. Especially with the owner, James Knight, standing there with his arms folded, watching over things with his eagle eyes. Tail tossed the ball back. One second, he told Brady. With Akone tucked to his chest and the diaper bag in hand, Teo started toward a friendly face. Ariana Sanchez, a Sanchez's sister, was standing behind the group of kids waiting to hear their assigned station. Teo had eaten at the Sanchez family's restaurant several times. Ariana was an acquaintance, if not a friend. Surely she could watch Akone for a bit. He was only a few feet away when a group of kids rushed Ariana. 
Are you guys ready to have some fun? She waved for them to follow as she headed to the agility area. Teo cursed under his breath. Ariana was too busy. There had to be someone here who could help him. He spied the intern who had opened the door moving from the first aid station to the drink cooler. She didn't look frazzled, maybe she had time to spare. She smiled easily as she checked in with the players and fist bumping the kids. She's perfect, he decided, and switched directions to intercept her. Hello again. He smiled wide. She stepped back so she could look up at him. Hi. Have you ever worked with children before? Her mouth fell open slightly. I'll have you know that I have worked as a camp counselor since I was 15, and I worked in the camp kitchen at 13. He hadn't been expecting such a strong resume, but he'd take a career camp counselor any day. That's perfect. He shoved Akone her direction. What? She put both her hands in the air and took another step back. Teo left Akone dangling between them. He kicked his legs and grinned. I can't take him on the field, he offered by way of explanation. Sure you can. You just did. An older woman wearing a Titans polo shirt and slacks and a guy with smooth hair and two big teeth approached. What's going on? asked the woman as she tipped her head towards the intern indicating she should answer and answer quickly. There were things to do. Her name tag read Facilities Director. As in, the person in charge. The intern ran her delicate hand over her hip. I'm not sure, she replied. Teo found his we just won the game smile. I'm sorry. My nanny quit this morning, and I really want to be a part of the camp, so I brought Akone along, but now that I'm here, I don't think he should be out there with me and I was hoping the lovely miss, he nodded her direction. Bell, she said rather reluctantly. His heart did a somersault. Miss Bell. The name was as beautiful and strong as the woman standing before him. He couldn't remember where he'd heard it, but he thought Bell meant beauty. If he could have picked a name out of hundreds for her, it would have been that very one. Bell? Really? Yes, really. Her arms lowered and her thick lashes brushed her cheeks. For a moment, Teo forgot they weren't alone. His heart pounded hard against his ribcage, and he couldn't feel his feet. If Coach had chosen that moment to tell him to take his place on the line, he wouldn't have been able to get there because all there was in this world was her thick, soft, lashes brushing against her cheek. Her soft cheek, round like a peach. That's fitting. He shook his head and tugged his gaze away from her face. She'd rung his bell, that was for sure. Pretty. Thank you. Her eyebrows went all squiggly. She turned to her boss and lifted a hand, silently asking what she should do. The guy standing behind the boss spoke up. If the only way to get the league's best offensive tackle on the field is to hold his baby, then what do you do, Miss Bell? He cuffed Teo in the arm. Teo resisted the urge to cuff him behind the head. He'd never liked lackeys. Several players kept them around, enjoying their yes-man attitudes. Miss Bell sucked in a sharp breath and whipped around to face Teo. She wasn't smiling, but she wasn't angry at him either, more like determined mixed with a healthy dose of knowing how to make the best of an imperfect situation. She reached for Akone. I'd be happy to compensate you for your time, Tao offered hoping to make the deal a little sweeter for her. The jerk jumped in. That won't be necessary. Miss Bell is on a paid internship. Besides, she is loaded with motherly instincts. Miss Bell's jaw flexed. She settled Akone on her hip like she carted kids around on a daily basis. This guy was being a world-class bully, but Miss Bell didn't lower herself to his level by arguing or hurtling insults. She was entitled to, though. Teo remembered being the freshman on the college team, forced to clean up towels and wash uniforms. 
He hated being pushed around, but he'd had to take it or risk being ostracized by the older players. He saw Miss Bell make the same decision, only she wasn't worried about being socially cut out, she was protecting her job, her internship. Which made him feel like a brute for putting her in this situation. He narrowed his gaze at the jerk and cocked his head to the side. Sending a silent invitation. If this guy wanted to take it to the mattresses, he'd be willing to see it through and see his smug smile wiped across the astroturf. The boss, who had been dividing her attention between this situation and several others, pointed to the water station. Darren, go make sure the water jugs are full. Darren frowned and slunk away. Are we okay here? she asked Miss Bell and Teo. Akone clutched Miss Bell's flowing shirt in his tiny fist. He laid his head on Miss Bell's shoulder, and she patted and rubbed his back. Teo may feel like a stinker, as his mom would say, for asking her to watch his kid, but a strong sense of peace washed over him knowing Akone was in her capable hands. Yep. He started backing away. Thank you, he told Miss Bell, trying to express his sincerity in his voice. Miss Bell was talking to Akone and not looking at him. He spun on his heel and clapped his hands for Brady to throw him the ball. He'd have to figure out the nanny situation, and soon. Not only did he have meetings with his agent, workouts, and a slew of other responsibilities, the season started in eight weeks. Without someone to watch Akone, he'd be forced into early retirement. He dreaded the interview process that came with finding a nanny. The nanny service he'd used to find Tiffany had sent him ten women who weren't right, and each interview ended with him more discouraged than the last until Tiffany had shown up in sweats and a messy ponytail. She had no idea what football was and didn't care that he played as long as his checks didn't bounce. He thought having a woman around who wasn't trying to impress him was a good thing, but he should have looked for someone who cared at least a little bit about what he thought. If he had, he might have had two weeks' notice to find another nanny instead of being dropped at the last minute. Mr. Parada, asked one of the reporters. He'd ventured into their territory, and now he was open prey. He mentally scrambled to get into the interview mindset where every word counted. Cassidy Stone. It's nice to meet you. Can you tell us how the offensive line is doing? Teo hooked his thumb into his pants pocket. We're committed to being in the best shape of our careers for the upcoming season. He took a step back. If you'll excuse me, I need to get back to the camp. I don't want to keep the kids waiting. Because you're a father too, right? Teo lowered his eyebrows. Akone was not acceptable interview material. I am. I'll see you later. He hurried off, all the more determined to find a new nanny so he could leave Akone at home and out of the spotlight. There was someone out there who would work for both him and Akone, he just had to find her. In the meantime, Miss Bell was the perfect solution. Sometimes things just worked out. Chapter 3 Cedar continued to rub the little boy's back as she made her way around the room. She passed the water station and heard Darren snigger. Really, who above the age of nine sniggered? The man was a tool. Their breakup kept her up at night, mostly because Darren filled her evenings with fun and going to bed at 9.30, while great for her skin tone and energy level, wasn't exactly thrilling. Akone sighed against her, and her maternal instincts did a little happy dance. Forget Darren. He could be trampled by the Titan's entire defensive line for all she cared. Lifting her nose in the air, she continued past the drink station, intent on checking in with the press gathered off to the side. She waved at Cassidy Stone. They'd exchanged emails and even met for lunch a couple weeks ago in preparation for Cassidy's interviews with the players today. Hopefully the extra time would pay off in a great article about the camp. All the reporters would have a chance to interview a few select players later in the day. She'd hoped to see cameras flashing away, but the group lounged against the wall or in seats, 
waiting for the opportunity to get an exclusive quote. Cedar would be more than happy to provide sound bites and tidbits to fill their stories. She also wanted to rush over because it looked like Cassidy and Anthony Kincaid were in some sort of standoff. That just wouldn't do. As she lengthened her stride, the clipboard slipped out from her arm and she spun to try and catch it, only to see Darren leafing through her carefully compiled lists. She snatched it away from him. What do you think you're doing? His eyes widened, feigning innocence. You're the one who wanted to be tied to a kid. I thought I'd take over the real job and let you sing lullabies. Cedar turned slightly to mitigate Akone's exposure to all things Darren. Is this who you really are? I thought so much better of you before we broke up, Darren. I thought you were one of the good guys. Cedar bit the inside of her cheek to stop herself from spilling her guts. Darren paused as if her words had hit something soft inside of him. You did? Yeah, she barely whispered. He tipped his head to the side, considering her. Let me be that man for you today. He reached for the clipboard. We've worked too hard on this camp to let a baby ruin it. Cedar twisted out of his reach, just like her heart twisted at his words. Let's get two things straight. Number one, I organized, planned, and created this camp. You did nothing but drool when the cheerleaders practiced. His innocence faltered. How did you? Cedar tossed her head, cutting him off. Number two, babies don't ruin anything. I can run this camp better than you ever could, and I can do it with a baby on my hip. Without waiting for his reply, Cedar stomped off. After two stomps she realized she looked like Darren had gotten to her and she didn't want to give him the satisfaction, so she slowed down and softened her steps. Akone's fingers gripped her shirt so tight he was going to leave behind permanent wrinkles. Don't worry, sweetie, she cooed as she set the diaper bag on a chair. There was no sense carrying the thing around. I've got you, and I'm not letting you go. Whatever had happened between Cassidy and Anthony had run its course by the time Cedar made it to the press area. She made quick work of orienting the press before circling the room again to check on the workers over each station. Somewhere along the way, Akane sighed and went limp in her arms. His breathing evened out, and Cedar wished she had a blankie and a rocker and ten minutes to enjoy his baby shampoo smell. It wasn't his fault his daddy was a jerk. Sure, a nanny gone missing was an unfortunate situation, but Teo needed to take some responsibility for his son instead of dropping Akane into the first pair of arms he could find. For all he knew, Cedar would lock Akone in a closet or hand him off to the homeless man who lived in the alley behind the facility. Throughout the course of the morning, Cedar had little downtime, but the time she did have was spent arguing with herself over who she was more upset with, Darren for thinking babies were problems were Teo for thinking all women were at his beck and call. Like she didn't have a day full of potential fires to monitor. She'd already put Darren in his place. After the camp was over, she'd give Teo Parada a piece of her mind. Cedar cursed her wedged sandals as she hurried to the cafeteria to check on lunch. Her feet were sore, and carrying around an extra 50 pounds of toddler wasn't helping. The lunch staff was behind, so she ended up adding applesauce cups to brown paper sacks while rocking Akane back and forth. He was warm against her, and oddly enough, he calmed her indignation enough that she could focus on her job. Trudy rushed in just after she'd finished the lunches. I need emergency contact information for a parent. We had a boy injure his knee. Cedar shifted Akone. There's a file box under the table by Haley's station. Haley Knight was a team trainer and had agreed to come in and be the medical personnel for the camp. Cedar had paused to listen in as Haley talked about post-game recovery with a group of 12-year-olds. She was so beautiful, even in her Titans t-shirt and workout pants, that the little boys stared at her as if she were a princess. Cedar looked down at Akone, debating handing him over to Trudy so she could take care of the situation. 
Her feet ached, her lower back hurt, and she was sure that hauling this chunk of adorableness around was tweaking her spine out of alignment. He'd hardly made a peep all day, except when he needed a diaper change, and even then it was more of a squirm and a grunt. He hadn't even cried when Teo left. He would probably be fine with Trudy, except Cedar was growing attached to the kid. He was seriously calm. His big brown eyes took in the world and accepted it and he was just chill. She needed chill today. Between making sure Darren didn't take credit for her work and putting out fires, she would be a mountain of nerves if his chubby fist wasn't clutching her shirt. So, instead of handing Akone off to someone else, she cursed her wedges and headed off to the first aid station to find the paperwork with him tucked into her side. When the day was over, she planned to soak her feet and tell Teo to get his life in order. Chapter 4 Teo thundered through the upstairs hallways. He shouldn't be up here, players rarely traveled upstairs unless they were called into the owner's office. He didn't care. His son was more important than corporate rules and maintaining appearances. His pulse roared in his ears as he frantically searched for his Akone. Camp had ended thirty minutes ago, and he hadn't seen the intern in over an hour. He poked his head into open executives' doors and checked the shut ones to see if they opened. Most of them were locked on a late Saturday afternoon. A locked door was just as frustrating as an empty room because neither of them revealed Akone's whereabouts. He thought back to the last time he'd seen Akone. Miss Bell was patiently feeding him applesauce from the provided lunches as she talked on the phone. She made funny faces that had Akone smiling wide enough to slip a spoon between his lips. Miss Bell was simply stunning in that moment as she balanced Akone's needs and the many demands pulling at her attention. Her eyes were bright and reflected caring and even silliness. Light danced off her tresses as she bobbed back and forth between the applesauce cup and Akone. Teo had stopped in his tracks, causing several boys in his group to run into his backside. Even as they laughed off the collision, Teo marveled at Miss Bell's ability to multitask. When he was in dad mode, everything else fell away. He couldn't even get the dirty clothes in the hamper. All the cleaning he did was after Akone went to sleep. What stood out, particularly, was the way Miss Bell's blue eyes lit with an inner happiness, a happiness he'd never seen in his deceased wife's eyes. He hadn't learned until it was much too late that Amy didn't know how to create her own joy, that she spent all her time looking for it outside of herself and outside of him. Akone was the one bright spot in her life, because he was always content. Teo could use some of that contentment right about now and wanted his son in his arms. He clapped a doorway with his palm as he barreled on. He didn't want to think about what might happen if Miss Bell had taken Akone. He didn't even know her first name. What would he tell the police officer that he'd passed off his son to a stranger, but she was supposed to bring him back? He headed toward the elevator, ready to try the parking lot. If he could catch a glimpse of her car before she hightailed it out of there, then he could give a license plate to the officers. Anxious and needing to move, Teo took the stairs just to the right of the elevator. The sound of his big feet devouring the concrete steps echoed all the way to the top floor. He was running past the practice field when he heard a delighted giggle. Reversing direction, he stopped in the open door of the training room. Miss Bell was standing in the middle of the room with Akone on her hip. Haley Knight tickled his tummy, and Akone soaked up the attention like he'd never seen a beautiful woman before, let alone two. All the worry and fear trickled out of Teo, forcing him to lean against the door for support. During practice and games, he could go at that pace for hours, his determination stronger than his body. That's why he never played scared. Fear drained. He held back, letting Miss Bell finish her conversation and then taking a moment. Haley was a bombshell, but Miss Bell was the one who drew and held his attention. Her long, curvy frame was a figure he could spend some real time studying. 
His chest grew warm and his blood pounded in his pulse points as he brainstormed opening lines. The surge of nerves surprised Teo. He'd stomped down that part of himself as best he could a couple years ago, shortly after Amy told him she was pregnant. She'd blamed him for ruining her body and refused to let him near her. Any chance at flirting with his wife had been crushed under her steely gaze. Teo shook off the ghosts of the past, willing their slimy, cold tentacles to release their hold over his heart. Neither woman noticed him standing just outside the door as they said their goodbyes, which was probably for the best considering his tongue was glued to the roof of his mouth, and he couldn't come up with one cute, funny, or somewhat interesting thing to say. Haley smiled and left through the side door. When the latch clicked, Miss Bell slumped and let out a sigh. She tipped her head, leaning her cheek on Akone's black hair. Should we go find your daddy? she asked Akone. He patted her soft-looking cheek with his pudgy hand and she pressed a kiss to his palm. Teo squirmed. Miss Bell's kiss to Akone's palm stirred something deep in his soul, a yearning for tenderness and the sweetness of sharing life with the one you loved. He cleared his throat to announce his presence and entered the room. There's my boy, he said brightly. Addressing Akone was much easier than talking to the lady. Akone yelled and lunged for him. Teo caught him easily enough and hugged him close. They'd been two peas in a pod for a while now. Miss Bell shook out her arms and then locked her fingers behind her back and stretched her shoulders. Teo did his best not to notice the way her curves moved fluidly. If he wanted to be able to talk to her, he couldn't keep noticing things he liked about her. Like the way the lace at the bottom of her shirt bounced when her hips moved. That kid is solid. She twisted from side to side to stretch out her back. For some reason, her comment raked. Akone was the perfect size for his age. I hadn't noticed. He moved Akone to one arm to show how light he really was. Of course you wouldn't. She snorted, a dainty little sound, and moved to massaging her triceps while looking pointedly at his arms. Teo looked from his single arm to both of hers, which, comparatively, were as thin as sticks. Okay, so Akone might be heavy for her. He fought a ridiculous urge to flex while her eyes were on him. Thank you for taking care of him today. Her eyes narrowed. You're welcome. I'm being sincere. I appreciate you taking him for me. I'm committed to make sure that Tiny Titans football camp is a good experience for everyone involved, including the players. Her tone was worn and flat. You mentioned your nanny issue this morning, and while I can appreciate the situation, please make sure Akone has a competent and kind caregiver before next year's camp. He had the feeling she wanted to say a lot more, but was doing her best not to chew him out for dropping his kid in her lap. She'd been a blur at the beginning of the day, running everywhere with Akone. She was probably worn out and hungry. A desire to take care of her surged through his system. To ease her burden as she'd eased his today. Can we take you to dinner? he said. A. Sanchez's family owns a restaurant not far from here. They're low-key and the food is great. She took a quick, sharp breath. Are you asking me out? His pulse pounded away. She made asking a person out sound like a bad thing. Not that he was asking her on a date. He wasn't dating. Didn't have any plans to date, ever. No. No, he said firmly. I, listen. She stepped forward and poked him in the chest. You may think every woman in Texas is dying to fulfill your every wish, but I've got better things to do than follow you around and fawn over your muscles. Teo swallowed his anger. Of all his teammates, he was the quietest, the least likely to chase after a woman or assume she was into him. He had a kid, for crying out loud. I was trying to say thank you for all you'd done for us today. Believe it or not, I don't trust just anyone with my son. Leaving him with you was a special circumstance. 
she folded her arms and lifted her chin. So I'm supposed to feel special that, even though I had an entire camp to run, you allowed me to take responsibility for your child? The whole camp, Teo pointed to her chest. Your name tag says, in turn. He realized he was still pointing at her chest and quickly put his hand down. His mom always said it was rude to point, and she'd box his ears for pointing at a woman like that. She puffed out air. And that is why I would never go out with you. Teo frowned. Miss Bell was as prickly as a cactus. What did I do? Even an intern's time is valuable, Mr. Parada. She pressed her fingers to her lips and then tapped the kiss on Akone's nose. You, I will miss. Akone grinned at her, confident that she adored him. With a cold good day, Mr. Parada, Miss Bell, flounced out of the first aid room. Teo stared after her. He hadn't meant to sound like he didn't value her time, or women's time, or intern's time, or whatever he had implied. He did value people, and not just for what they could do for him. He'd needed help this morning, and she felt so, right. He continued to stare at the open door until Akane tilted his head up to take in his dad. I messed that up pretty good, Teo said. He headed towards the parking lot. You'll figure this out one day, little man, but your daddy doesn't have game with the ladies. Football, that's where my skills are, and the Titans field is the only field I can play. He pulled open the glass door, and they headed for his SUV, one of two cars left in the lot. Not that I was trying to impress Miss Bell. He made eye contact with Akone. I wasn't asking her out. Even as he said the words, he knew they were a lie. He wanted to spend time with her, wanted to ease her burden and see her smile and watch that inner light shine through her stunning blue eyes. Which was why he was happy that Miss Bell had turned him down. The only woman he should be looking for was a new nanny. Who cared if one woman thought he was a typical egomaniac player? Later that night, after Akane was in bed and Teo had a chance to start laundry, he caught himself wondering if Miss Bell had someone to sort dirty clothes with or if she was as lonely as he was at the moment. With a shake of his head, he picked up the pace, forcing his thoughts off the shamelessly beautiful Miss Bell and onto the tasks that kept his house in order. Chapter 5 the next Monday, Cedar nervously made her way to Mrs. Kent's office for her exit interview. She'd gotten up early and smooth and sectioned her hair into a messy French braid that curved around her head and laid over her left shoulder. She had changed shirts too. Thinking that the Titan's polo was a little too obvious, she'd switched to a peach-colored cotton blouse. The color did wonders for her ivory skin and apricot lips. One of her undergrad professors had told her, when you look your best, you do your best. She wasn't so sure about that, but she agreed that looking her best raised her confidence. Her phone rang just as she entered the elevator, and she hurried to answer her mom before she went into the meeting. If not, her mom would call every five minutes until she did answer. Hi, mom. How was Cabo? Her parents had taken a seventh, or was it eighth, honeymoon to white sands and warm surf. The surfing was excellent. How did your little camp thing go? Cedar suppressed a sigh. Smooth, all things considered. I saw the video this morning. Great. Just great. Even her parents had seen the video of Ariana Sanchez knocking Renan the ghost Bradley on his backside in front of a group of kids. Their sparring match appeared to be in fun, so the exposure was positive, thank goodness. The fact that the whole incident had happened at her camp and she found out from YouTube had her wondering what else she'd missed. Hopefully nothing big. I'm itching to get on top of the publicity the viral video could provide for the camp and hook a few new sponsors for next year while there's still a buzz. Once my job offer comes through, I'll be able to spend more time on it. How do you plan to do that while you're still in school? Mom, I graduate in less than a month. Has it been four years already? 
too. A master's takes two years. Yes. Yes. I know. I just can't help but think of you as that sweet little undergrad we took to Florida for spring break. You didn't take me on spring break. We didn't? No. You two went, and I stayed home and fed the dog. Was it possible her parents had dementia for the last twenty years? That would explain how two people could forget they had a child as often as her parents forgot. I miss Sprinkles. He was a great dog. If given the choice, Cedar would have stayed home with Sprinkles for spring break every year. I'm coming, Mom said to someone on her end of the line. Honey, your dad says to tell you hello and that he's looking forward to a ping-pong rematch at Thanksgiving. There wasn't a word for the jagged shard those words drove into her heart. On the surface, they seemed harmless enough, a father looking forward to spending time with his daughter. But, by peeling back just one layer, the real meaning was revealed. Her parents didn't have time for her. Nor would they make time for her until it was convenient for them, and that meant Thanksgiving. Unable to come up with an appropriate response, Cedar hummed. Her phone beeped. Mom, I have to go. I have an important meeting in just a few minutes. Don't work too hard. Life is supposed to be fun. Bye now. Bye. Cedar slumped against the wall. Parents are exhausting. She glanced around to make sure no one was watching her have a parental-induced emotional crash. She still had a few minutes before she needed to report to Mrs. Kent. She should duck into her cubicle and reapply her barely there lip gloss, but she might run into Darren, and she couldn't handle another all fun and no work adult today. Instead, she checked email on her phone to make sure she hadn't missed a reply to the message she'd sent Mrs. Kent this morning. Several emails came in over the weekend thanking the Tiny Titans football camp for the improvement in a child's football skills and for providing the kids an opportunity to meet some of their heroes. She compiled the compliments into one document and forwarded it on to Mrs. Kent a couple hours before the offices opened so it would be waiting in her inbox. The job may be hers, but that didn't mean she couldn't help Mrs. Kent feel good about the decision to hire her. Besides the sparring match gone viral, there was one injured knee and a few other scrapes and bruises on Saturday that were easily patched with ointment and band-aids. Overall, the parents were happy with the outcome. There had been one hitch in the system. A hitch in the nice shape of an offensive tackle she'd told off at the end of the day. Hopefully, Teo hadn't reported her less-than-professional demeanor to Mrs. Kent. In her defense, Teo Parada was selfish and self-centered. Sure, he had an adorable kid, but that didn't mean he was adorable. Teo thought he was handsome and charming and irresistible. And no wonder. Instagram had blown up with images of him with two kids hanging from each flexed arm. The man did know how to work with children. He drilled them on field safety until they knew his three points to staying safe and could recite them in their sleep. She arched forward to stretch her lower back. Whenever she thought of Teo asking her on a date and acting like he was doing her a favor by gracing her with his invitation, her muscles bunched and she had to resort to stretching and breathing and picturing large baskets of puppies. Cedar would be lying if she said it didn't bother her that Teo garnered so much attention. He swooped in at the last second, nearly putting the camp behind schedule, flashed his pearly white teeth, thrown a few balls, and then picked up his kid and took off while she stayed to make sure the practice field was returned to acceptable Titan standards. Where was Teo Parada when the food allergy special lunch requests came pouring in? Where was Teo Parada when Darren lost 63 sign-up forms? Where was Teo Parada when that boy twisted his knee and needed a hand to hold? She stopped outside Mrs. Kent's office door to adjust her blouse and run her fingers through her long hair. The honey-colored highlights around her face had taken some time to get used to, but she liked them now. They were different for her. She felt different after accomplishing something big. And there was one person whom she'd worked closely with, 
who knew just how many nights Cedar's car was the last one in the parking lot. Mrs. Kent was the one who had to force her to go home. So this interview may not be just an exit interview, it could also be Cedar's new hire interview. That was a cheery thought, and she allowed it to grow inside of her until it took over all the negative brainwaves associated with Teo Parada. Smiling came easy then. Cedar tapped lightly on the door before pushing her way inside. Mrs. Kent turned away from her computer. Cedar. She motioned her forward. Have a seat. Mrs. Kent was dressed in her usual Titans polo shirt and slacks. Cedar was thankful she'd changed. No sense looking too interested. Cedar smoothed her pants down as she settled into the padded chair. They exchanged pleasantries, and then Mrs. Kent laid her palms flat on the desk. She must have had a nail appointment the weekend before, because they were freshly painted with a Titan star on the ring fingernail. The Titans organization couldn't be more thrilled with how the camp turned out. You and Darren, she coughed on his name as if it had stuck in her throat. Did an excellent job. I forwarded the emails you sent me this morning to James Knight, and he said you exceeded their expectations and he's looking to expand the Tiny Titans camp to allow for more participants next year. Cedar's whole chest swelled with pride. That's high praise. Thank you for telling me. You earned it. Mrs. Kent turned to pull a sheet of heavy cream paper off the printer behind her. I've written a glowing letter of recommendation for you and finished your internship evaluation. She slipped the paper inside a folder with a Titan star emblazoned on the front. She held the folder out to Cedar, whose smile had frozen in place. Here you are. Cedar leaned forward stiffly. Everything Mrs. Kent had said was glowing and positive, but in all of that, Cedar didn't hear the words you're hired. I'm sorry. Letter of recommendation? Yes. Mrs. Kent's cheeks stretched wider. Cedar spoke before her brain could censor the words. I thought I'd be working here. If they're making the camp bigger, we'll need to start sooner, bring in another sponsor or five. There's so much to be done. Mrs. Kent's cheeks drooped. I've already compiled a list of possible rotations for next year. And then there's the viral video. I'm ready to use that to our advantage. The folder sank slowly to the desk. Cedar hadn't dared accept it, fearing that once she made contact the job would go up in a puff of smoke. The higher-ups are already working to leverage the video. They're putting together a publicity stunt of some sort. It's out of our hands. And, I've been instructed to make this a permanent internship position. I'm sorry if you were under the impression that this would transfer into something else, Cedar, Mrs. Kent said with true sympathy. So you weren't ever planning on hiring me? Cedar drummed her fingers on the chair. Stupid Darren. He planted that seed in her head, and like a dupe she'd watered it and watched it grow. And, like a bigger dupe, she was smudging her spotless reputation with Mrs. Kent and making her uncomfortable. I must have misunderstood. She recovered quickly and, with major effort on her part, reset her smile. I appreciate all that you've done for me, Mrs. Kent. I've enjoyed my time with the Titans and learned so much from you. She stood, extending her hand over the desk. Mrs. Kent smiled hesitantly. Let me know where you end up. I'd like to keep in touch. Of course. They shook hands and said goodbye. Cedar took the cursed folder with her as she exited the office on wooden legs. Her cubicle wasn't far, and she managed to make it to her chair before her legs gave out. Darren's workspace was already cleaned out, and a fine layer of dust had settled on the empty bookshelf. But then, he spent so little time in the office that the dust had probably been there a while, and she'd been too busy to notice. She was really starting to hate her ex-boyfriend. Breaking up with her because she wanted a family one day was bad enough, why did he have to play with her head about the job? What now? 
She stared at the black computer screen as if the idea would magically appear. She hadn't applied to other companies, hadn't even talked to the career counselor at the college, because she'd been sure that she had this job. There were details they would have to hash out, like salary and time off, but she wasn't worried about those details because she was so excited to plan the next camp. And now she wouldn't. Her head throbbed. She'd been a student for the last two years and had loans to pay off. There wasn't enough money in her account to pay two months of rent let alone a monthly installment. Two minutes, she muttered. She needed two minutes to mourn the job that could have been. Then she needed three minutes to imagine Darren in a straitjacket on his way to an insane asylum for horrible ex-boyfriends. Then she would be able to make a plan. With a groan, she put her head on the desk. She'd start with the straitjacket image. Just when she was getting to the good part where a big guy in white scrubs, who weirdly enough resembled Teo Parada, loaded Darren into the back of a white van, she heard the department secretary say, Miss Bell? Cedar bolted upright and rubbed at her forehead, hoping she hadn't been on the desk long enough to leave behind a red mark. She swiveled around and wondered just how good her imagination was, because behind Fern stood Teo. His broad shoulders and massive arms shadowed the petite woman like a mountain shadows a baby pine tree. A cone was nestled into the crook of his arm. Is everything okay? Fern asked. Fine. I'm fine. Cedar saw something bright pink on her shirt and snatched the post-it away. What can I help you with? Fern smiled. It appears this gentleman left a diaper bag here last Saturday. He thinks you might know where it is. Cedar blinked long and hard. Teo really was standing in her cubicle. Well, not in her cubicle. He would never fit in the small space. But he was here. And she'd chewed him out to his face. Unless she imagined that too. No, she was pretty sure that had actually happened. I haven't seen it since. She thought back to the hurried diaper change in the executive's restroom. She'd run in and out as fast as her stupid wedges could move and must have left it behind. Oh. I think it's upstairs. The phone rang up front and Fern sidestepped towards her desk. Would you mind showing him the way? Cedar waved her off. Sure. It wasn't like she had anything more to do than stash a few folders in her car and leave. Fern sprinted to the phone and snatched it up. Thank you for calling. Cedar slowly lifted her eyes to Teo's face, reluctant to look him in the eye after telling him what she really thought of him only a few days ago. He wasn't smiling. Are you still mad at us? Cedar stood and plucked at her blouse to make sure it hadn't accidentally tucked into her skirt. I was never mad at Akone. She brushed the baby's soft cheek with her finger. His gaze traveled to her face and he lit up with recognition. He reached his hands out for her and she felt like she might be able to smile again. Teo let Akone go with her and she scooped him into her body, curving her shoulders forward in a protective gesture. He jabbered to her for a moment before laying his head on her chest and sighing. Cedar soaked him in and rocked side to side. This was the calm she'd needed. Teo ruffled Akone's hair. So, the diaper bag? This way. Cedar thought Akone had been shy with so many children around on Saturday, and that's why he didn't say much, but he was just as contented and silent today. Is he normally this chill? She started towards the elevator that would take them up to the executive level. There was a couch and a green fern up there in the ladies' room, and she was pretty sure the bag was tucked between the two. It's a family trait. My mom says the Parada men are born with an extra share of good looks and half a share of words. Cedar rolled her eyes. Yeah, and a double share of ego. Hey, my mom said it. Not me. Uh-huh. Really, though, he can be a terror when he wants to be, but he's most comfortable at home. 
That's another Parada trait. What? Being a terror? That one I believe. Cedar was only half teasing, but she managed to keep her tone light. I'm a terror on the field, so I guess you're right, Teo said with a proud tilt to his head. He's taken with you, though. Normally he glues himself to my side. Now that she was up close and personal with Teo in the elevator, she could see the benefits of being tucked next to a body like that. And what was that smell? Some kind of designer cologne that was three parts man and one part make my hormones dance. The elevator doors opened, and Cedar rushed out of the small space, grateful her hormones hadn't said something stupid. She was still mad at Teo, but not as mad. The camp hadn't suffered and she'd shown Darren that she was just as capable with a baby on her hip as she was without. Although, she had slept pretty hard over the weekend. She may have been as efficient, but the effort had drained her. Not that she'd let Darren know. As far as she was concerned, he could see her as Wonder Woman all day long. It's this way. She paused outside the women's restroom when she realized Teo wasn't going to follow her in. I'll be right back. Using her hip, she pushed open the door and headed for the couch. Sure enough, the bag was right where she'd left it. At the sight, memories from Saturday rushed over her. She'd felt so alive running the camp, being the go-to person. She was in the flow, able to handle anything that came her way. Even you. She pressed a kiss to Akane's head as the weight of her current situation pressed down on her. She sank into the couch and rocked the baby. Rubbing circles on Akane's back, she soaked in the comfort of his trust in her. We make a good team. Akone had smiled at the kids and they'd smiled back. People stopped to talk to him, to tickle his foot or shake his little hand. There is no way you're a terror. She squeezed his knee, eliciting a giggle. Cedar chuckled. You're too cute for your own good, just like your daddy. She clamped her hand over her mouth. I shouldn't have said that, she whispered. There was no point in noticing how fine-looking Teo Parada was in his button-up plaid shirt and cargo shorts. Sure, he had muscles everywhere, but that didn't mean he was worth drooling over. In fact, there were enough women out there who would be happy to fan him with palm fronds and feed him protein bars that she didn't need to jump in the fray. No fray. Stay out of the fray. Don't tell your daddy, okay? He doesn't need one more person feeding his ego. Akone gripped her shirt in his fist. Good. I'm glad you agree. She stood up to make her way out of the room and prayed that the door was thick enough that Teo hadn't heard a thing. Chapter 6 Teo paced in front of the ladies' room, wondering what could be taking Miss Bell so long. He wasn't used to waiting for a woman to do whatever women did when they disappeared behind that forbidden barrier. He had an appointment with his agent to get to and was already running late because he'd spent twenty minutes scouring his house for the diaper bag before he remembered not bringing it home on Saturday. With his thoughts bouncing to that moment in the cafeteria where he'd been struck by the sight of Miss Bell and Akone together, he raised his hand to knock. Just as he moved his fist forward, the door swung open, and Miss Bell barreled into him. Oof, she grunted on impact. Teo rubbed his belly where her elbows had landed. He was used to getting hit, but usually the people who hit him were thicker. Did you just call me an oaf? She blushed. No, but I should have. She looked over Akone to make sure he hadn't been injured as they stepped into the elevator. Her concern for his son caused a warm sensation to bloom in his chest again. Since his family had flown home after the season, Teo had carried the weight of Akane's well-being on his own. He had amazing teammates, but they scattered during the off-season, and he wasn't sure they would appreciate babysitting duty. His loneliness scared him sometimes. He tried not to think about how quiet his house was compared to the home he'd grown up in, where there was always someone to play with, wrestle with, and talk to. 
When the solitude pressed in on him, he pushed back and dug deep. Somehow, this time spent with Cedar had shined a spotlight on his isolation. With a start, he realized this feeling was different from the dark blanket he'd thrown off before. This feeling was a deep desire to spend time with her specifically. That just wouldn't do. He reached for Akane, who came willingly. Thanks for your help, Miss Bell, Cedar. She dropped her lashes to her cheek. Teo forgot what he was going to say as he watched her cheeks turn the color of ripe peaches. Cedar. He tested the name, enjoying the way it felt on his lips. She smiled shyly. Teo realized he was staring and pulled his attention away from his recently formed fascination with the blonde beauty. We'll get out of your hair, he said as the doors opened. The light shimmered over her braid, and he made sure his mouth was shut. She wiggled her fingers at Akone. Bye, precious. Teo wiggled his fingers in response even though she'd been talking to Akone. He stared at his hand like it had a mind of its own as he hurried away. He needed to get out of here, to get back to his life where he could focus on moving forward without stopping every few minutes to admire Cedar. Yes, she was an amazing person. And yes, it was normal for a man to notice a woman with her full lips and beguiling blush. But it was not acceptable for him to allow all of that to overrun his level head. He didn't get overrun, on or off the field. At the end of the hall, he glanced over his shoulder to see Cedar moving slowly toward her cubicle, her back hunched and her head down. He'd seen that walk before, right after a receiver dropped the pass that cost them the game. It was the walk of someone who was defeated not only on the field but in their head. He hated that walk. It tore at his gut to see a teammate, or in this case a pretty woman, beat themselves up. She had been laying face down on her desk when he arrived. He thought she was catching a quick nap or something, not suffering. What did she have to suffer over? From where he stood, she had it all put together. A hearty dose of curiosity and that darn desire to take care of her burst through his veins like lightning. He jogged back. Hey, everything okay? She pressed her lips together. Fine. Really? Because you look like you just dropped a Hail Mary. She gave a self-depreciating chuckle. You could say that. She paused and then looked back and forth down the hallway. Teo settled in, a trick his dad used many a times to get him to open up after a hard practice or game. Are you waiting for me to spill my guts or something? Was he? Am I? No. I just, um, he moved Akone to his other arm and patted her arm. Hang in there, Kay? Okay. His phone beeped. Shoot. That was the you have five minutes to make the meeting beep. He reached for his phone in his back pocket to turn off the recurring noise. With a sudden jerk, Akone threw himself towards the floor, and Teo dropped the phone to save his son from pancaking his face into the carpet. Cedar bent to get the phone for him. She handed it over face up. Looks like you're late. Yeah, you wouldn't think a baby would slow me down, but just getting him in a car seat will take five minutes. I'd give anything for a babysitter. Five hundred. Cedar took Akone from him. What? I'll watch him until six tonight, but it will cost you five hundred dollars. She jetted her hip out to the side and settled Akone in place. I thought you were an intern here. Her jaw flexed. The effect was kind of sexy, and he had to work hard to tamp down on the attraction that flared to life. Today was my last day. Akone grabbed her braid and held on. With Teo, he never had to hold on, but Cedar was so much smaller that the kid must have felt the need. She didn't flinch as he tugged a little on her hair. Teo was torn. Meeting with his agent needed to happen. He put it off as long as he could, 
being out of the spotlight after Amy's death was a tender mercy. Jumping back in was going to be hard enough, he wasn't a razzle-dazzle type of guy, but being entertaining while feeding Akone a jar of prunes or changing a diaper would be impossible. I've already got the diaper bag. She slipped it right off his shoulder, her fingers brushing his arm and leaving a trail of heat behind. Her offer was almost too good to be true. If you're sure. I'm sure. Here. She programmed her number into his phone. Call or text anytime. She fumbled handing it back to him. Today. You can call anytime today, she clarified. He considered Akane's obvious comfort with Cedar and the easy way Cedar had with him, and a sense that this was a timely meeting, one that hadn't happened by accident, brushed its way along his thoughts like a whisper in the wind. He put one hand on her arm and leaned over to kiss Akone goodbye. Her hair tickled his cheek, and he caught a hint of sweetened pineapple on her skin. Cedar gasped, the sound so quiet, he wondered if he'd imagined it. She pulled away, and the moment was lost into the waves of time. I'll call as soon as I'm done. He began backing out of the building. Cedar picked up Akone's arm and had him wave goodbye. Akone grinned. Teo smiled back. Cedar was charging him a generous amount, taking advantage of his desperation. Five hundred bucks. But she was good for Akone and good to Akone, and that was more important than money. All the other feelings Cedar stirred inside of him were inconsequential. He had no right to feel that way about anyone, not when he had a son to raise. Akone needed to come first and Teo's needs should come second. Even if Cedar was good for both of them, he couldn't risk his heart again. He may look like a tough guy, but inside the body that could take a thousand hits was a heart that needed protection. Chapter 7 Cedar stood in the middle of the hallway and stared down at her charge. She hadn't thought past the chance to make a quick $500. She hadn't even thought about what she would do with Akone. She hadn't asked for a car seat or a stroller, which meant she'd be hauling him around again. Her triceps and lower back were screaming at her for not thinking harder. They already protested her idea of an easy paycheck. Hanging around her old job wasn't an option. She got to work, hauling the files and personal items from her cubicle to her car. Moving everything took three trips with Akone on one hip. I'm starting to understand why your dad is always late. Akone smiled, showing off his two bottom teeth. They were pearly white, like Teo's. Akone looked like his dad, the same black hair and smooth Polynesian skin, the same soulful dark brown eyes. Those eyes were old soul eyes. On Akone, they were simply adorable. On Teo, they drew her in and made her stomach feel all melted butter and brown sugary. With one last look around the space where she'd hoped to make her start in the world, she hiked Akone up on her hip and set out to explore the downtown area on foot. Their first stop was the gas station on the corner, where Cedar purchased fresh fruit and a yogurt. They soon came upon a park with several moms clustered on benches and children running around, grateful to have a shady place to run free. There were large trees circling the play area. Off to the right was a splash pad. More children played there, enjoying the whimsical water fountains more than a trip down the slide. Cedar didn't feel like wearing wet work clothes for the rest of the afternoon, so she and Akone played on the slide until the baby swing opened up. Akone laughed and laughed until he dropped into sleep. The transition was so abrupt Cedar thought he'd passed out and scrambled to get him out of the swing. He rallied long enough that she realized he was just exhausted and she hugged him close. With the humidity, the two of them sweat through their clothing as they rested on a park bench. The stickiness was a price she happily paid to snuggle him as he slept. He still had that calming effect on her, or maybe his deep breathing was like listening to the sound of ocean waves before bed. Either way, she was thankful for the serenity as she pondered her employment predicament. Her resume would need a once-over. 
the university required students to maintain an online version she could easily send out. Researching local companies to apply to would take a full morning. And then writing cover letters tailored to each company would take a day or two. Then there was the waiting. If all the stars aligned, she could interview in a week, nab a second interview a week later, and start a job in a month. There would be a lag in pay as her direct deposit information was processed. Six weeks without a paycheck wasn't too bad. But that was it the world worked on her schedule, and she was pretty sure that wasn't how the world worked. More than likely, she would have several weeks before an interview. That left her with few options. There was always the chance that if she didn't pay rent, she'd get a month before they evicted her, but the very idea was as ugly as a bold-faced lie. Her phone, nestled in the outer pocket of the diaper bag, dinged. She carefully maneuvered Akone to check the text from an unknown number. Just checking to make sure six still works. My agent wants me to do an interview. Ah, Teo. That was nice of him to check in with her. He didn't have to. She'd told him she was fine until six. Perhaps he was worried about his son. Cedar snapped a picture of Akone asleep against her chest, his mouth hanging open. She had to get the right angle so it didn't look like she was sending a picture of her cleavage. That would be so embarrassing. Not that the players didn't have women thrusting their chests at them. She glanced down at Akone. Maybe not Teo. He'd been married, though she couldn't remember seeing a ring. Nevertheless, there was no point in giving him the wrong idea. She'd already blushed under Teo's soulful eyes, she didn't need to advertise her assets. She thought for a moment before sending the picture and a reply. We're doing great. Good luck with the interview. Teo sent back an emoji with heart-shaped eyes. Cedar barked a laugh, cutting it off quickly when Akone jumped in his sleep. The big, bad football player certainly was in love with his son. Cedar glanced around to make sure no one was close enough to look over her shoulder before she did an internet search on Teo's wife. Images of Teo in a black suit and gray shirt standing beside a pale pink casket filled her screen. He wore dark sunglasses and an unreadable expression. In one picture, an older version of Teo had his arm around Teo while a woman who must be his mother patted his hand. The accompanying article explained that the cause of death was a blood clot in his wife's brain. Cedar's heart immediately went out to Teo and Akone. No wonder Teo was late and always running. He had to balance his grief with raising his son by himself and maintaining a career in the spotlight. The article continued with the funeral details and Teo's request to be left alone by the press. He hadn't been much of an attention grabber before, so the attention died off quickly. She switched over to the gossip pages. If Teo so much as looked at a woman after his wife passed, they would have been all over him for begging to be left alone to grieve and then partying it up. His name didn't bring up so much as one search result, which gave her pause. She'd assumed quite a bit about Teo because of his good looks and his job, all of which appeared to be untrue. Her conscience prickled, and she promised herself to be nicer the next time they talked. Another thought made her want to bury her head in the playground wood chips. She'd checked him out. Here he was, widowed six months, and she let the butterflies loose and, oh man, she'd told him off for asking her out. She sank lower on the bench, feeling the need to find a hole to crawl into. Akone's cherub cheeks were flushed from the heat. As soon as he woke up, she'd find them both water and air conditioning. Today would be a great day for the kid, and Cedar would be the best babysitter ever and reduce her fee. She hadn't worried about asking for $500 when she thought of Teo as a football star with a fat contract, but seeing him as a struggling widower made her feel like something slimy on the playground that all the kids wanted to poke with a stick, but no one wanted to touch. Yep, it was time to play nice with Teo Parada. Chapter 8 
With the adjustments to your portfolio, your investments should increase. Teo checked the time. Elijah had taken full advantage of Teo's undivided attention, scheduling conference calls and impromptu interviews with radio, television, and internet sportscasts. The interviewers all asked variations of the same three questions. How are you holding up after your wife's passing? It's been a hard adjustment, but I'm taking it one day at a time. Are you ready to come back? I'm always ready to be on the field. It's my home. What do you think about Anthony Kincaid coming on after his neck injury? He's good. He has a ways to go before he's at the same level he was when he was the first string quarterback for the Sentinels before his injury, but, from what I've seen, he's got some skills. The last interview had gone particularly well. The interviewer, Brooke Dasani, asked specific questions about his off-season schedule. He admitted that as a single dad, his time to work out was limited, but he'd hit every mandatory practice. So do you think you'll be in shape by the time the season starts? She batted her caterpillar-thick eyelashes. He chuckled at that one, teasing the interviewer over video chat by pretending to panic. Do I look out of shape? She trilled a laugh. Not to me. I'm sure my viewers would agree that you're looking nicely in shape. And the comments came rolling in, making the interviewer and Teo's agent happy. Teo was pleased that he'd been able to pull off the light-hearted response. He had refused interviews for months because he was lost in a world of guilt and regret. He didn't blame himself for Amy's death. The doctors had explained, in detail, how she died and that there was nothing he could have done to prevent her passing. No, his guilt was because as he walked behind her casket, he had as much grief for his wife as he would have if the woman inside were a stranger. He should have felt more, if for no other reason than the fact that she was the mother of his child. But he didn't, and that weighed on him to this day. Let's talk contracts. Elijah pulled his jacket off and draped it over the overstuffed chair. Elijah was a man who liked comfort. The office was full of soft surfaces. His desk was over a hundred years old with chinks and scratches and polished to a shine. Every chair had added padding, and there were throw pillows on the couch in the waiting room. The walls were navy blue or covered in dark paneling. There was a large globe in the middle of the room, the kind you would find in the Vatican, not an elementary school library. Teo had never dared touch it. Autographed posters of Elijah's clients hung on the walls. The only indication that Elijah had a sense of humor was the collection of bobblehead dolls on the well-kept bookshelves. The smell of pine cleaner lingered. Teo rubbed his eyes. I'm locked in with the Titans for another two years. I promise you that I will get my butt in your office before then, and we can talk all the contracts you want. Let's call it a day. Elijah leaned back in his plush leather chair. He didn't have any hair on his head, but grew a thick beard that he kept closely trimmed. I'll hold you to that. Teo felt like a linebacker had been lifted off his body. Okay. He gathered his feet underneath him to stand up, itching to text Cedar. She'd sent him one picture an hour of Akone. The latest picture showed Akone clutching a box of animal crackers to his chest, his hands were crossed in front of the box, and his face was so pleased it tugged at Teo's heartstrings. By the looks of things, the two of them were busy and happy. Akone had smiled a lot today. Too bad he couldn't hire Cedar as a nanny. She'd already proven herself more than capable of handling Akone, not only handling him, but nurturing and loving and caring for him. That was exactly the kind of person he wanted to find. Teo said a quick goodbye and put the address for the coffee shop, where Cedar said she and Akone waited, into his phone as he climbed into his SUV. He couldn't wait to get there, though his anticipation wasn't entirely about collecting his son. He wanted to see Cedar, make sure she was doing all right. She'd been down that morning, beaten by life, and he hoped she was walking tall once again. 
The closer he got to the coffee shop, the more he doubted his intentions. He didn't just want to make sure Cedar felt good, he wanted to be the one to cheer her up. Being around her was different in all the best ways. She was trustworthy. Her stream of texts and pictures throughout the day had gone a long way to bringing about that feeling of confidence. As had her determination last Saturday. Beyond that, there was this other level of communication going on between them. Like he could see parts of her soul and they were good, bright. He got that with people sometimes, a sense of them and their motivation. It didn't happen often, but when it did, he paid attention. Trust was hard to come by. Before he'd been drafted, he had a good group of friends, people he believed he could count on. After he'd signed with his first team, many of them came to him with open palms, expecting a handout for their loyalty. His nature was to help people, and in his first year, he'd almost gone bankrupt. Elijah noticed what was happening and stepped in to remove the moochers from his life. While Tao was glad he wasn't being conned out of his money, he had few true blue friends. The guys on the team were great, and this upcoming season, he planned to reopen communication with the men he had gotten along with before. It wasn't that his teammates had dropped him, he'd requested to be left alone after Amy died. And being a single father put him in a different place in life than many of his unmarried teammates. He didn't hit the clubs or bars or bask in the attention of groupies. There were some great, stable guys on his team. Zeus was one of them. Teo respected their quarterback, enough to put all he had into every block to protect the guy. The interviews today were a good reminder that, outside the walls of his home, Teo was a marketing tool, a product, and a brand. The interviewer's eyes lit up with every like, share, and comment on the video. To her, he'd been a tool to increase her ranking. Cedar didn't see him like that. He chuckled. She probably saw him as a nuisance. He was okay with that. Really okay. He leaned forward in his seat, urging traffic to move faster. Chapter 9 Cedar handed Akone another animal cracker. His chubby cheeks lifted and he pounded his palm on the table in excitement. He gummed the cookies to death instead of chewing them, creating a slobbery goo that coated his face and hands. She grinned back, taking a monkey cookie for herself and scanning the small room for Teo. Not that she needed to, he'd be hard to miss in this little space. A few minutes later, she caught sight of him through the front window. Her breath caught in her throat. He was amazing to look at with those muscles, that dark, flawless skin, and those dimples. He moved easy now that he wasn't late for an appointment and balancing Akone in his arm. His quiet confidence made him all that much more attractive in her eyes. Jolting herself out of her drool fest, Cedar reminded herself that Teo's wife had died less than six months ago. He wasn't up for grabs. And, given the day to reflect, probably hadn't been asking her out last Saturday. Having more of the story, she saw his actions a little differently, more sincere. She brushed the cookie crumbs off her fingertips and used a wet napkin to clean Akone's face and hands as best she could. His shirt was an unfortunate casualty in the animal cracker situation, having succumbed to the goo. At least you're drooling over cookies, she said with a cringe. Hi. Teo's voice was deep like ocean currents pulling Cedar right back under the attraction she tried to climb above. Her body froze, unprepared to fight the surge of warmth Teo's presence unleashed. Hi, she breathed. I mean, how did your meeting go? Fantastic, thanks to you. Teo's brown eyes burned with gratitude. I was able to do several interviews, too. Your first since the funeral, that's a big step. The moment the words fell from her mouth, Cedar wished she could wipe them away with a wet napkin. I am so sorry. That was insensitive and personal and none of my business. To her surprise, Teo chuckled. It's okay. 
I'm flattered you're keeping tabs on me. He winked. I am not. Cedar eyed the water glass, wondering if she should toss it in his smug face. She'd be better off throwing it in her own face. Her brain needed a cool splash of water to stop her mouth from running off. Uh-huh. He grabbed the back of the chair across from her, flipped it around, and straddled it as he sat down, giving her an amazing view of those dimples. Teo, on the other hand, got his first good look at Akone in all his slimy wonder. Whoa. Hey. She put up both hands. I only promised to keep him alive and happy for the day. I didn't say anything about keeping him clean. Teo patted Akone's head. It was probably the only place he dared touch him. We're good. I'd rather have him happy than clean. Oh. Little sparks of delight tickled Cedar all over. She leaned back and took a sip of her peppermint tea. Good, then. But that brings up an interesting idea. It does? She set her cup down. Teo dropped his gaze to the table as he tugged on his ear. I, uh, I wondered if you were looking for a job. I am, she said slowly. How about working for me? As a nanny? Cedar was shaking her head before he finished. Thanks, but it's not like I don't think you have other things to do, but you said today was your last day at the internship. And I know you aren't here to do my bidding, I think that's how you put it. And I know you're not into me, like, into me. I think I kind of annoy you. He quirked one cheek, waiting for her to disagree. He didn't annoy her. What annoyed her was the way her body kept reacting to him without checking with her first. She folded her arms and nodded for him to continue. Anyway, it's good you're not, because I wouldn't want someone who was interested in more than a job. Cedar lifted both eyebrows. An awkward silence descended as every heart-pounding thought she'd had about Teo played through her mind. She prayed they didn't show up on her face. He didn't need to know how cute she thought those dimples really were. Teo cleared his throat. The tops of his ears turned pink. No, red. No, coral. They were definitely coral. How sweet was that? But you like Akone, or at least you treat him really well, and that's what important. Cedar shook her head again. I'm finishing up my MBA. I have things to do. That's fine. I'm somewhat flexible until the season starts again. No. Why not? Because I didn't go through six years of school so I could be a nanny. Akone pounded his palm on the table to get his dad's attention. Teo handed Akone another cracker. What did you want to do? I, Cedar stopped. The loss of her dream job was still an open wound. I wanted to run the Tiny Titan sports camp. But that didn't exactly work out. So you're unemployed? Teo said, with much too much hope in his voice. Don't look so happy about it. She threw an animal cracker at him. It bounced off his chest onto the table, leaving a hundred crumbs. I'm not. I just think maybe there's a little miracle here, if we're willing to make it work. A miracle? she asked. Don't you believe in miracles? Yeah, but in my experience, they don't happen to me. I'm sure that's not true. She shrugged in reply, unwilling to go the rounds over her faith. She was good with God and didn't need to defend her beliefs to prove it. Well, I don't believe that there are coincidences. I think meeting you was a miracle. It certainly felt that way when you offered to take Akone today. Cedar laughed. Even when I named my price? Teo nodded. Worth every penny. Cedar took another sip of her lukewarm tea. Okay, earning $500 in five hours might be a miracle for her too, considering the money filled in the gap between her checking account and the rent, 
but she wasn't willing to give him the satisfaction of being right. Tao brushed crumbs to the floor. So you're unemployed, and I need an employee. Not a coincidence. He paused, considering her. It pays well. Cedar waved him off. Shu, let me think for a minute. Teo reached for the diaper bag and searched for a moment, pulling out a clean shirt for Akone. Using the wipes, he did his best to clean the kid and then slipped the shirt over his head, covering the dirty one. Cedar was about to protest when she realized he could remove both shirts and not get the slimy goo in Akone's hair. Teo might be smarter than she gave him credit for. Maybe it wouldn't be that bad to work for him. Today had gone well, not that she'd seen him all that much. But when they talked, there was a certain level of respect between them. For how long? she asked. How long what? How long do you need a nanny for? Teo considered Akone. Um, until he's fifteen. Or until I retire, whichever comes first. Cedar blew her bangs off her forehead. I can give you a month, maybe two, while I look for a job. That would give you time to find someone to replace me. Teo frowned, his whole face taking on a shade she would call dangerously handsome. I was hoping you'd get us through the season, at least. Aghast, she said, that's, like, six or seven months. He shrugged. I don't make the schedule. Cedar couldn't commit to that time frame. There was a whole world out there just waiting for her to conquer it. She stood and dug her purse out of the diaper bag where she'd stuffed it so she didn't have too many items to juggle. I'm sorry, really. I'll take the two months, Teo announced. Cedar looked down at him. With him sitting and her standing, she was just a little taller, but man, he was big. Massive enough to make her feel petite, and she was five foot six. For the briefest of moments, she wondered what it would be like to be held by a man that large. You don't even know me. I could be a witch or believe in unicorns or something. He leaned closer and whispered, Do you? No, she smacked his shoulder. Pausing, she considered him. After this slipshot interview, I'm tempted to take the job because I'm worried about who you would hire to care for Akone. His face grew stony, serious, and he pushed her vacant chair out with his foot. Why don't you sit down, Miss Bell, and tell me why you want to be a nanny? Cedar rolled her eyes and plopped into the chair. I don't. She blew out a breath. I want to start small businesses, make them profitable, and then sell them for astronomical gains. To start. Teo's eyebrows shot up. But if I were interviewing for this job, I would tell you that I love children, always have. And I worked as a camp counselor from the time I was 16 until 22 when I got my bachelor's. I worked for a few years before deciding to go back and get my master's, which I am finishing up now. He leaned forward, resting his corded arms on the table. Why do you want to start businesses? Cedar matched his posture, drawn in by his open interest in her. His attention was complete, even though there was a gray-haired grandma in the corner giggling like a teenager every time she looked at Teo. Cedar could only imagine the thoughts running through the woman's head. She was having a few of those thoughts herself. I have so many ideas, way more than I could ever do. I need to chase down this restlessness, get it out of my system. If I ever can. My dad says I have career ADD. She cringed. Probably shouldn't have said that in a fake interview for a job I don't want. Tail laughed, a sound that was as deep as the ocean floor and as warm as a Texas breeze. Her eyes dropped to his chest wondering if the laughter rumbled through his muscles and what she'd have to do to find out. He quirked up one side of his mouth in a crooked smile that made her heart thump as quickly as her fingers could type. What ideas? Cedar wagged a finger at him, unable to stop the smile that spread across her face. Tail was all too easy to blab to. Oh no. 
This is a nanny interview, not an investment presentation. Stick to the topic. And not one so close to my heart. Do you have any reference? She grinned. Actually, I have a glowing letter of recommendation right here. She slipped the folder with the Titan Star on the side out of the diaper bag. She hadn't even thought about bringing it along today, a nanny interview being the last place she thought she'd end up. Thankfully, she'd stuffed it in the side pocket to carry out to her car. Now that she needed the thing and it just so happened to be there, she began to wonder if meeting Teo wasn't more than a coincidence. She wasn't quite ready to call it a miracle, but, nice folder. Teo tapped the star before opening the folder and perusing the letter. With each paragraph, his dimples slipped a little further away. By the time he was done, his face was pale. You're right, you're overqualified. Cedar grew warm from the recognition of her accomplishments and skills. He slapped the folder shut. But I still want to hire you. Akone deserves the best. My schedule is flexible for now, so we can work around wrapping up your degree and job interviews. Cedar opened her mouth to protest, but hesitated. There was this feeling, a sense that this decision was bigger than an easy paycheck and a quick solution to her immediate needs. Try as she might, the outcomes of either taking the job or turning it down weren't within sight. A quick measure on a scale of pros and cons told her that taking the job was the smart thing to do. You've got yourself a nanny, Mr. Parada. She stuck out her hand. The dimples came back, full force, and she had to remind herself how to breathe. Call me Teo. Cedar laughed. She couldn't help herself. He made her feel like the whole world was floating on bubbles. Only if you call me Cedar. Their palms came together, and a feeling of destiny swept through the room like a warm breeze. Destiny. Miracles. She was losing her mind over this guy. If she wasn't careful, she'd do something stupid like lose her heart. That wasn't going to happen. Tail was too good-looking, too charming. That was it. He was charming her. Much like Darren had charmed so many people, herself included. She pulled her hand back and sat on it. Theirs would be a professional relationship with firm boundaries and no chance of a broken heart at the end. When should I start? Tomorrow. I'll text you my address. I used to work out in the mornings. Is 7 too early? Cedar had visions of Teo on a bench press his arms straining and bulging as he pumped a gazillion pounds up and down. That's fine. She cleared the squeak out of her voice. I'd better get going. Because I'm going to start giggling like that grandma in the corner if I stay here any longer. Teo stood, getting taller and taller, like a redwood tree. I'll see, I mean, we'll see you tomorrow. Yep. She took her purse and folder and kissed Akone on the top of the head. Teo blocked her path. She tipped her chin up to meet his eyes and was sucked right into his gaze. A small sigh escaped her lips. Teo's hand went to her shoulder and her breathing sped up. She slammed her lips shut, afraid she sounded like a panting hyena. I'll take that. He slipped something off her shoulder. Cedar blinked as she stared at the diaper bag. She must have grabbed it by accident. And you can have this one. He looped her purse strap in place. Thanks. She leaned closer to him, the warmth of his skin tugging at her resolve to remain professional. So what if she threw herself into his arms? He'd be okay with that, right? He brushed the pad of his thumb over her bottom lip. The grandma giggled again, much louder than before. Cedar glanced over just in time to get a two-handed thumbs up and a wink. Heck. No. She pulled away. Animal cracker crumbs, she mumbled and used the back of her hand to wipe at her mouth. 
her lip still warm from where Teo had touched her. If the brush of his skin did that, what would a kiss be like? They're messy little monkeys, Teo busied himself stuffing napkins into the nearby trash can. Thanks, she managed before making her way out the door. She could feel Teo watching her, and the sensation wasn't at all unpleasant. Once out in the open, she took a deep breath of city air full of exhaust, moisture, heat-baked concrete, and a hint of coffee from the shop. Teo was overwhelming in so many ways. It wasn't just his size, it was the way he commanded her attention. The job would be a good thing, a way to make ends meet and start payments on her student loans while looking for something within her field. Akone was a sweet baby. He would be easy to tend. Teo was a little unruly, distracting, and much too masculine for his own good. Hopefully she wouldn't have to see him much. He'd been right, she had thought he was annoying at first. The more time she spent with him, the less she felt that way. That's why being the nanny was a good job. Nannies were only needed when the parent wasn't around. Keeping her distance from the football star and therefore allowing the attraction she felt for him to die out was going to be as easy as making pinecone and peanut butter bird feeders. Chapter 10 Teo took one look at the coffee shop's menu and knew he'd have to go in search of something more substantial. He hadn't eaten since the subs Elijah ordered in at one. His trainer would have a fit if he knew how far off his eating plan Teo had gone but he needed some substance. Preferably in the form of meat, and lots of it. Come on, Akone. We've got to go too. Teo did his best to leave the table semi-clean, tucked Akone into his elbow, and headed to his car parked just down the block. Akone didn't argue about getting into his seat, a testament to how much fun he'd had that day. The more tired he was, the less fight he had. They were on their way to a health food store, not far away when Teo's phone rang. Elijah, it's been an hour, man. Go home. Elijah laughed. You sound like my wife. She's a smart woman. And a saint. One of the few people who didn't treat Teo like he was broken after Amy died. Deja was sympathetic and kind, but without the pity. Of course, she probably had an idea that their marriage wasn't good, so maybe she sensed Teo wasn't lost without Amy because he'd been alone long before she died. The requests for interviews are rolling in, and I haven't been able to set the phone down. People want to see the single dad football star. A sick feeling settled in Teo's gut. No, ye. My kid is not a publicity stunt. It's not like that, T. There are other people out there going through what you're going through. You can be a symbol of hope for them. You are for me. If Deja died, I'd be in a ball for years. Even though Elijah was trying to help, his admiration only made Teo feel worse. He didn't say that, though. Elijah continued. Just think about it. We could do a private photo shoot at your house and release a story from our office. I don't know. T, I know you're confident in your two-year contract, but you need to lay the foundation for a favorable trade or negotiation now. I'll think about it. Thanks. Hearing Elijah's voice reminded him of another item they needed to settle. Hey, while I have you, I should be able to film the deodorant commercial on Thursday and Friday. I hired a nanny. Fantastic. Teo's thoughts jumped back to when Cedar kissed Akone's head. Yes, she is. He drove in silence for a bit, content with his thoughts on Cedar, before he realized Elijah hadn't said anything. E? I'm, um. What? It's nothing. I just thought I heard something in there. What? Teo demanded. Forget it. I'm glad you hired someone. We need to meet about those investment opportunities we talked about before. Sounds good. 
They said goodbye and disconnected the call just as Teo pulled into the parking lot of the store. The lot was small and there were only a couple cars. Teo hadn't been joking when he told Cedar that miracles happened. Meeting Elijah was one of those miracles in his life. His agent was more than an agent, he was also a financial coach. Teo kept tabs on his money, but he appreciated and trusted Elijah's guidance. The man's business practices were as transparent as a windshield. He considered the strange feelings Cedar stirred inside him. Talking with her was easy, like conversations had been before marrying Amy. He used to see himself as a social guy but Amy sucked more and more of his time and attention until she was his whole world, and then she'd turned on him. Akone screamed to be let out of his seat. Having napped for the short ride, he was full of vim and vigor. Okay. Okay. Teo hopped out to rescue his son from the car seat monster. He was grateful for the distraction from his spiraling thoughts. While he shopped, he wondered if he should get some food Cedar would like. He bounced his hands on the shopping cart handle as he walked down the aisles. When he'd walked them all, he huffed in frustration. He had no idea what she liked, but he wanted to. He wanted to make her happy, and the thought scared him. In the end, he decided she could bring her lunch or order in. She was the nanny and employee and not his responsibility, no matter how much he liked the way her hair brushed her forehead or that she'd played along with his interview. She may be fun and beautiful and all sorts of wonderful things, but he couldn't let all those things into his heart. He couldn't take a beating, not again. Chapter 11 Cedar did her best not to ogle Teo's muscular back as he showed her into his home. But come on! He wore a tight workout shirt without sleeves and every line, bump, valley, hill, bulge, and curve was right there at eye level. As it was, she was proud of herself for keeping her gawking at eye level when there was so much more to take in below in a pair of loose workout shorts. The shorts may have had the team logo across the top of them. Her peripheral vision could make out a T, but that was all she was willing to let it identify in that region. With her luck, Teo would turn around right as her gaze dropped and catch her in the act of reading his backside. This was her first day on the job. She needed to appear professional, because she was a professional. The way her stomach fluttered and flipped when he opened the door had nothing to do with his amazing physique paired with those adorable dimples. Nothing at all. Her obvious attraction for her employer wasn't doing much to calm the anxiety she had about taking this job in the first place. She should have held out for something in her field, but financial security was an addiction she wasn't willing to break. This is the kitchen. He waved his hand slightly. Hmm, Cedar managed, tearing her eyes away from the real-life sculpture before her and taking in the gorgeous kitchen. The messy, gorgeous kitchen. The white cabinets had silver knobs and drawer pulls. The black granite countertop was covered in crumbs and books and water bottles and fruit. The stainless steel sink was full of dishes and the far counter, accentuated with a cut glass backdrop, was covered in dirty pots and pans. Teo rubbed the back of his head sheepishly. The other nanny used to clean, too. Cedar managed a smile. Don't worry about it. He dropped his hand and his shoulders sagged in relief. Thanks. His relief was early. Cedar wasn't agreeing to scrub his dirty dishes. I'm sure you can find a wonderful maid service. There are a half dozen in the area. Oh. His dimples disappeared. See, the thing is, I don't let just anyone in here, and I don't want a service to tell me who is coming in and who is not. Cedar popped a hip. She was not going to spend her days cleaning up after this guy. Who cleaned before the nanny? My, um, Amy took a lot of joy in a spotless home. She, Cedar caught a hint of bitterness in his tone. You don't like a spotless home? He lifted a hand. It's not like that. 
I just think there are more important things in life than an empty sink or a made bed. Agreed. Cedar rubbed her hands on her pants. She'd worn linen capris and a button-up shirt with a loud print in shades of coral. The color reminded her of Teo's blush, and she'd been drawn to the outfit this morning. She was finding herself drawn to him, and that just wouldn't do. And for the record, I'm not judging you. I'm just making sure both our expectations are clear. I appreciate that. His dimples were back. Cedar reached for the counter, needing some support, because his smile was doing funny things to her belly and her knees. Happy squeals and gurgles came through an intercom. Akoni's awake, said Teo as his face lit up. Cedar's heart jumped at his obvious pleasure. She tipped her head, considering the contradiction between his imposing stature and his adoration of his child. It was such a fun combination, one she hadn't considered before. Most of the guys she dated who had great bodies were too self-absorbed to think about another person's long-term needs and care. Maybe Teo took his size for granted and not his kid. What? Teo asked, watching her watch him. Under all that muscle you're a pushover. He took a deep breath, expanding his chest and broadening his shoulders. Let's get one thing straight. I push people over, I do not get pushed over. Duh, called Akone. Coming. Teo sprang down the hallway at a half sprint. Cedar laughed. You think you're so tough, she muttered. Are you coming? Teo called down the hall like a kid's invitation to run outside and play. Cedar giggled and broke into a sprint, following Teo's pounding footsteps through several rooms, zigging around a coffee table and zagging past a chair as if they were playing a game of indoor tag. There was no way she could have caught him if he didn't stop in Akone's room. Akone was delighted to see them both and bounced on his feet holding the edge of the crib for balance. He'd be climbing out of there in no time. Cedar smiled, her job anxiety melting away. At least if she was stuck being a nanny for a couple of months, the job would be fun. Just how much fun remained to be seen. She liked this version of Teo. The playful, happy father. Maybe she liked him a little too much. A warning sounded in the back of her mind. Her parents were a lot of fun, too. So much fun they preferred playing to parenting, leaving Cedar with her little brother to take care of more often than not. If she ended up in a similar situation here, she could quit. And, at least she was getting paid. The only thing she'd have to watch out for would be those pesky butterflies in her stomach. She wouldn't pay them any attention. They were just butterflies after all, soft and delicate. Surely she could keep her head on straight, even around Teo Parada and his dimples. Chapter 12 Teo dropped the barbells with a grunt. This was his first full workout, cardio and weights, since his family flew home after the funeral. He bought the house because of the workout room. He didn't want to have to leave home to find a gym. Home was his refuge, his castle, there shouldn't be any better place on earth than at home. He downed 24 ounces of water and gasped for air. His muscles were pleasantly tired. With a cocky grin, he wondered if Cedar would notice a difference in them. Not that one workout would make that much of a difference, but still, a guy could hope. He'd caught her looking at his arms a couple times this morning. Not just looking but looking, and then she'd blush and drop her gaze, pretending that she was all innocent. He knew better. He just wasn't sure what to do about it. He used the gym shower and changed into some of the spare clothing he kept under the sink for just such an occasion. Not that he usually had a beautiful woman upstairs, but again, a guy could hope. He shook his head. Who was he kidding? The extra clothes were stashed because he hadn't taken the time to put them away upstairs. He really needed to pull his life back together. He wasn't a slob, not by nature. 
but after Amy passed, he'd been drunk on freedom and had let even his good habits slide. No more. He was going to take his life back, starting with eating right and getting his house in order. With that in mind, he made his way to the kitchen where a container of protein powder called. True to her word, Cedar hadn't cleaned the kitchen. He had to wash a blender before he could use it to make a post-workout recovery drink. Tao liked her all the more for letting the dishes sit. He poured the banana-flavored, sunlit chalky drink into a shaker cup and popped on the lid before heading out to find Cedar and Akone. Akone's giggles met him in the hall, and he followed them to the nursery. He poked his head around the doorframe to see what was so funny. Cedar was on her hands and knees on the plush carpet, chasing Akone as he trotted around the room. He grabbed a pair of footy pajamas and screamed like he knew the game was on. Cedar drummed the floor with her palms, chasing Akone all the way to the hamper. He shoved the pajamas inside and stomped his pudgy feet in victory. Cedar grabbed him, blowing a raspberry on his neck and eliciting more belly laughs. Best sound in the world. She backed up, and Akone looked for more clothes to put away. They were having such a good time, and it was hard to stay on the sidelines. Can I play? Teo asked. Cedar's head popped up and her cheeks turned rosy. I am not blowing raspberries on your neck, no matter how many shirts you pick up. Teo laughed so hard he had to tip his head back to let it all out. The laughter cleansed him, oddly enough. It broke through the hard shell around his heart and his thoughts. Euphoria lifted him up even as he got down on his knees and pointed at a football for Akone. I'll do toys, you do clothes. Oh. Cedar bit her lip. Sorry if that came out bratty. You're fine. He waved off her concern, just happy to be part of their little game. Happy to feel happy again. He hadn't thought about laughing, or laughter, or the lack of it in his life until he'd felt the surprising joy Cedar's comment brought to him. Akone raced to put the football in the basket, and Teo hooked him around the belly with one hand and a roar. Akone squealed and squirmed until Teo put him in front of the toy box and pointed. Footballs, go in here. Akone looked to Cedar for confirmation. You can do it. She clapped her hands and smiled big, her whole face animating with encouragement. Teo had to look away to regain his breath, she was stunning when she really smiled. There was something in her eyes that was wholesome and sweet and innocent and that caused a protective instinct to come to life inside of him. Akone slowly moved his arm so that the ball was over the toy box. His gaze went back and forth between the two of them, clearly confused that they were changing the rules. Teo waited, grinning and nodding like a fool. He didn't care. He'd be a fool every day for his kid. Finally, Akane dropped the ball and Teo commenced the tickling. It took several tries before Akane realized Teo and Cedar were playing and which box or basket they supervised, but he got it before the floor was clean. He's a smart kid. Cedar sat down and stretched her legs out in front of her. She leaned back against the sky blue wall and crossed her ankles. The room was decorated in a Noah's Ark theme with pictures of animals framed on the walls and soft blankets in blues and greens. He sure is, replied Teo. Akone crawled onto her lap and leaned his head on her chest. He was already at home in her arms. Of course, he'd spent a lot of time there the last few days. Teo could understand why the kid wanted to be held when he was worn out, especially held by Cedar. She rubbed circles on his back and ran her hands through his hair in soothing brushes. Her whole being was one big comfort, and Akone needed that. Teo wished she'd reconsider the two-month time limit and stay longer. A first day of preschool, though exciting, was a big moment in a kid's life, and he'd want to snuggle up and talk about it. Teo could do that, but Cedar was different than he was, softer, gentler, quieter. Teo fought the desire to settle in next to the two of them and put his arm around Cedar. 
Instead, he leaned against the mahogany crib. He already prefers you. Cedar's smile was gentle. Nah. He's a daddy's boy through and through. He looks just like you. She traced a finger over Akone's dimple and his eyes fluttered shut. He's in heaven. Tao looked down at his giant, rough hands. He had strength enough to protect his son, but Cedar's strength, though different, was no less obvious. Cedar laughed quietly. Stop being so insecure. The one and only word he knows is dad. I tried, but he wouldn't even attempt CC. Tao puffed with pride. His son did call him dad. Amy had kept Akone so close Teo could count on his fingers the number of times he'd held his son in his first six months of life. Cedar knocked his foot with hers. You're here, but your thoughts are in the locker room. He snorted at her analogy. Where'd you go? Teo considered not telling her, brushing it all aside. He would have if there wasn't this feeling that he could trust her, not just with Akone, but with the broken parts of himself. Amy was scared that I'd break him. He nodded to Akone, who was drifting closer and closer to his morning nap. She thought I didn't know my own strength. I didn't really get to hold him until after she died. He gulped as the familiar guilt swept over him. Dropping his voice low, he asked, Is it wrong for me to be glad she's not here to keep me away from him? Getting the words out was hard enough, but lifting his gaze off the floor to see Cedar's reaction was darn near impossible. He was so sure that he'd see scorn or horror as she realized what a horrible person he really was. When he finally had the courage to face her, he was knocked in the chest by the compassion she offered. You're a wonderful father, Teo. Just a few simple words, spoken sincerely, flooded him with relief. How he'd longed for confirmation that he wasn't screwing this all up. And Cedar handed it to him, a gift from her heart. He took the gift, held it securely in his heart, and let it feed his wounded soul. So, Cece? Teo asked. It's what my little brother called me before he could say Cedar. She shrugged. Do you have a nickname for Akone? Teo shook his head. Do you mind if I use one, sometimes? Nicknames were kind of thing at camp. Everyone had nicknames. There's kids that went home at the end of the summer, and I had no idea what their real name was. I saw one the other day and called out Dr. Pepper. He turned around and yelled Cherry Coke. We talked for twenty minutes and didn't use our given names once. Teo's chest went all warm and fuzzy. He wanted Akone to feel as though he belonged. Guys on the team gave out nicknames, too. Some of them stuck and some of them faded away. He wondered what kind of name she would have for him. The idea that his family could have that kind of camaraderie enticed him. You can make up all the nicknames you like. Thanks. She looked down at Akone, he never did quite drift off with them talking in his room. His eyes were heavy, though. For what it's worth, you're wonderful with Akone, Teo. Teo felt his cheeks lift in a smile, and his ears warmed under the praise. Thanks. Akone popped up at his name. He looked between them. Duh. That's right. Cedar cupped his face in her hands. That's your daddy. She pressed a kiss to his forehead. Are you ready for a snack? Akone grew serious as he worked his way off her lap and headed for the door. Snack was a word Teo's son knew well. The kid was an eater, just like his dad. Cedar got to her feet and hurried to offer her hand to Akone for support. He'd been walking for a month but going all the way from his room to the kitchen was a hike for him. So, Teo jumped up to follow them. Do you have any more games? Oh, I got game, Cedar said over her shoulder. But you're not getting the playbook, not on my first day. 
Teo laughed. Then I'm going to make a few phone calls. Cedar nodded. I'll feed Akone and get him down for a nap, and then maybe we can go over a schedule. I brought my calendar. Of course she did. You're like an executive nanny. That's the best kind. She beamed. Yes, you are. The words were out before Teo could censor them or the quiet admiration in his voice. She waved before disappearing into the study, which wasn't the fastest way to the kitchen, but she'd find it eventually. He made his way to his home office and sat behind the desk. This room wasn't anything like Elijah's office. There was a desk bot at an office supply store, a rolling chair, and bare walls except for his rookie jersey that was signed by the team and framed. He really should make an effort to hang some of his photos and buy shelves for his mementos instead of letting them languish in the corner in boxes and plastic wrap. As he scrolled through his email, he wondered over all he had opened up about with Cedar. He probably should have kept his mouth shut. He didn't know her that well. She had connections in the press, he'd seen her talk and be friendly with several reporters at the camp. She could sell him out in a heartbeat and he'd be the next big story. Football player glad his wife died. A headline that would sell for sure. It was just that with Cedar, he was content with himself and with talking. Which was strange, considering she hadn't liked him all that much on Monday, and he'd practically had to beg her to come work for him. She wasn't wound as tight today, though. Today she was comfortable, relaxed even. Which allowed him to relax. A man could get used to that feeling. Coming home to a home filled with giggles and games and even a sink full of dirty dishes was better than coming home to a hollow emptiness any day. Too bad Cedar could only commit to two months. There had to be a way to get her to stick around. They needed her. He needed her. The thought terrified him. He'd been doing well enough on his own. Surviving, but not thriving. No. Thriving included laughter, and Cedar was the one who brought that back to his day. A smile crept from cheek to cheek. He felt every millimeter of muscle movement in his face, like a door, shut long ago with rusty hinges and slightly swollen from disuse. Smiling shouldn't be a foreign feeling. As a general principle, he was a happy guy, he just needed to tell his face. And spend some more time with Cedar. She made being happy easy. Shaking off the introspection, he dove into answering email and focusing on the business side of managing his brand instead of the intensely personal feelings that came when he thought about Cedar. Chapter 13 over the next couple of weeks, Cedar, Teo, and Akone fell into a rhythm. Cedar would arrive at seven in the morning and wake Akone. Teo would chat with the two of them for a few minutes before disappearing into his home gym for a couple hours. After that, they would have lunch together, and then either she or Teo would go off to a meeting or take care of business. Cedar's days weren't cluttered, and she was getting used to seeing Teo on a daily basis. Used to seeing him? Yes. Unaffected by him? No. She hadn't quite mastered that skill yet. Tail managed to keep the house clean, or at the very least, the dishes washed. He must have spent hours that first night putting the kitchen in order. Things were never perfect, but they were sanitary. Cedar did her part, washing a bathtub or dusting as she saw a need. She'd not set so much as a pinky toe in Teo's private suite. That was considered forbidden territory. Not because Teo had decreed it as such, but because she needed to keep some professional boundaries between them. They worked so well together, managing both of their schedules and Akone's needs that she could easily believe she belonged here with the two of them. Only by maintaining a physical distance from Teo could she keep from admitting her admiration and attraction for him grew on a daily basis. This morning, Cedar was folding a basket of Akone's clean shirts while Akone toddled around the huge laundry room, putting mismatched socks in the drawers. 
She was going to have to fish them out later, but he was happy and busy, so she didn't stop him. Teo appeared, taking up the whole door frame. His house had been built with 12-foot-tall walls and vaulted ceilings. It was big, but then so was he, so it fit, right? Nevertheless, it often surprised her that he filled a doorway with his bulk. The woodsy smell of his cologne drifted her direction, and she savored the scent that was all Teo before checking her reaction and hiding the weak knees his cologne triggered. He leaned his shoulder against the doorway and crossed one leg over the other. How'd your exit interview go with the graduation counselor? He took a sip of his post-workout shake. For some reason, he showered in the gym downstairs and dressed before coming back up each day. While she appreciated his attention to personal grooming, she had this fantasy of him all rough and tumble after a workout that she couldn't seem to get out of her head. Just once, she'd like to catch him post-workout and see if the real thing measured up to her imagination. Clearing her throat and her thoughts, she replied, Good. I'm all set to graduate. He's sending me a few contacts at companies that might be hiring. Tao slowly lowered his glass, frowning at the foamy orange liquid. Is it that bad? She tapped the side of his cup with her fingernail as she walked by to put the laundry soap back in the floor-to-ceiling cabinet. It's fine. I'm just not hungry. Cedar clutched her hands to her chest. Are you feeling okay? He cocked his head, confused. Teo, if you're not hungry, I'm very concerned, she teased. He smiled. I'm fine. Are you worried about your lunch meeting with Elijah? Cedar asked. Teo had mentioned they were going over investment opportunities. Elijah liked to support local businesses and putting Teo's star power behind projects in the community helped them succeed. She thought it was great that he wanted to help people start their own businesses. If it wasn't a huge conflict of interest, she'd ask him to fund her startups. Asking for money was another professional boundary she didn't want to cross, among others. Why don't you come? Teo asked. Me? Cedar paused, her hand on the cabinet door. Sure. You're smart, and I'd love to have an unbiased opinion at the table. What about snuggles? Teo lifted an eyebrow. I know I said I was okay with nicknames, but can you at least make them sound manly? Cedar rolled her eyes and laughed. She tried several different nicknames for Akone, but snuggles seemed to fit best. Men. That's better. Teo smiled without showing his teeth. His dimples still made an appearance, and Cedar's heart skipped a beat. We'll bring him with us. Cedar lowered her chin and leveled him with a look. So I can spend the whole time trying to keep his fingers out of my food? We'll cancel the fancy restaurant and go someplace that has high chairs. Teo scrubbed his hands through his hair. Cedar told herself that her heart thrummed out of excitement to be in on a meeting with the man who was not only Teo's agent but his financial advisor. The knowledge she could gain just by listening to the two of them was huge, because one day she would pitch ideas to people exactly like them and knowing what the other guy was thinking would give her an edge. That had to be the reason her pulse raced. Otherwise, she was much too excited to go out with her boss. Teo bumped her with his elbow. You want this, don't you? Does it show? She circled her finger around her face. Teo nodded. I'll make the call. Cedar glanced down at her turquoise leggings and lace top. I'm not really dressed for a business meeting. You look perfect to me. Teo's ears colored and his dimples appeared, only this time he wore a bashful look. Cedar's breath caught and she became acutely aware of how little space was between them. Teo's cologne teased her senses, and his eyes took on an intimate warmth that made her insides all gooey. Thank you, she whispered, unable to draw a deep enough breath to speak up. Teo leaned away, like he was trying to leave, but his feet weren't listening. She couldn't deny the heavy level of awareness between her body and his. 
I'll meet you at the SUV, he said. K. She ducked behind her hair as Teo slipped away. She didn't breathe until the sound of his footsteps faded. Then she gulped for air, only to find his masculine scent was everywhere, teasing her with his manliness. Surely Teo didn't feel the same way for her that she felt for him. He didn't go all weak mead and doe-eyed when she walked into the room. Sure, he paid attention to her, but that was because he was a nice guy. One of the good ones. Well crap. She pressed her palm to her forehead as if she were checking for a fever. A fever would be one explanation for her inability to remain focused on something other than a hot man who was a great father, provider, and friend. Yes, they were friends. It wasn't a surprise. They spent a portion of every day together. They liked the same movies, action flicks with a romance thrown in, and spandex, if possible. Okay, that last one was her requirement, not Teo's. Tight, superhero uniforms just made movies better. They enjoyed being active, playing in the ball pit, hitting the park, going for a hike. They'd done all three with Akone. And now Teo was inviting her into another area of his life, an area that had nothing to do with Akone. The idea was thrilling and scary. There should be a term for that. She racked her brain looking for a word to describe the sensation of sitting in the front seat of a roller coaster and staring down at the tracks just as they make a vertical drop. Petri sighting. Petrifying, because her heart was still bruised from Darren. She'd thought he was one of the good guys, until he broke up with her, because she wanted children. He didn't. Ever. And didn't see the point in falling deeper in love with her if they were only going to part ways down the road. Because the kid thing was a deal breaker, for both of them. It wasn't like she wanted to have a baby ten months after they graduated. She tried to explain that to Darren, that there was no rush. He argued that they'd have an easier time finding someone else if they started looking now. As if replacing Cedar was just a matter of picking up a new girlfriend at the grocery store. She hoped it wasn't that easy for him. That would just stink. Exciting, because here she was having feelings for Teo. Which was electrifying, because Teo made her feel comfortably desirable. A feeling that also needed its own word. Combinations of those words already existed. Comfortable with sweatpants and messy ponytails. She didn't feel like that with Teo. When Teo looked at her, she felt like a little black dress, glossy lips, and, forgive this thought, a tight butt. Because what woman doesn't feel amazing when her backside looks perky? Desirability was another combination of comfortably and desirable that didn't quite fit because it brought to mind women who wore little clothing to garner a man's attention, and she didn't have to do that with Teo. She wasn't working to attract him. Well, besides making sure her hair and makeup were done each day, but she would do that for any job. So what did that leave her with? A whole lot of confusion, that's what. She couldn't be falling for Teo. The timing was off. Darren was too fresh in her mind to even consider another relationship. Her attraction to Teo was nothing more than the admiration of a fine man with a perfect body. She fanned her face. The perfect body. Akone slammed into her legs. He laughed as he watched her hands flap for balance and then tried to copy her. She lifted him into a hug, which he snuggled right into. While she may have things she wanted to accomplish, before she became a mother, she sure loved Akone. He made it easy to fall for him. One more thing you have in common with your dad. She kissed his temple. I guess you have a new nickname, tough guy. Let's see if that's manly enough for your daddy. She set him down so he could walk. He stayed close as she headed to the nursery to find the diaper bag. The irony of the situation, her finding a diaper bag for a business meeting, was not lost on her. 
But then, she was calling the snuggle bug in her life, tough guy, so apparently it was a day for contradictions. Cedar covered her full mouth with a napkin to hide her laughter. Elijah had dropped his fork and bent to pick it up, only to have Akane swipe a yam-covered hand across his cheek. The look on Elijah's face was part terror, part disgust, and part shock. She swallowed quickly and dove for the diaper bag to retrieve the wipes. Leaving the sweet potatoes to grow cold on Teo's agent's cheek wasn't good form. Elijah was going to need more than a linen napkin to feel completely clean. Sorry, I should have warned you not to enter the splash zone. She hoped to pass off Akone's attempt to start a food fight with a little bit of humor. Elijah accepted the wet wipe and leaned to the left, as far from Akone as he could get. He folded the wipe in exactly half before cleaning his face. It's good for me. I need to learn these things. Cedar pressed her lips together to hold in the questions that statement brought up. She exchanged a look with Teo, silently pleading with him to ask if Elijah was going to be a daddy because it wasn't any of her business. But Teo, Teo had known him longer. They worked closely together, talking on the phone on an almost daily basis and met once a week. Though she'd just met Elijah, she could tell he had his stuff together. He was the type of person she would want on her team, and she was grateful Teo had found him, for Teo's sake. Not that who Teo worked with was any of her business either. But, she believed some of the stereotypes in chick flicks that cast agents as little better than a desperate used car salesman. Teo took a long sip from his water glass. Meeting her eyes over the rim, he winked. Like the traitorous organ it was, her heart flipped and flopped and then decided to do a little dance. She wasn't sure when they had started communicating without words. It was a skill she hadn't known she possessed. Yet they pulled it off as if they'd been doing it for years. Thank goodness she was already sitting in a chair since her knees went weak and her legs numb. The tension of the unasked question grew while Cedar worked to calm her racing pulse. Focus on the elephant in the room. She widened her eyes, practically begging Teo to ask. Elijah watched the two of them, a half-smirk on his face. He wasn't about to give up the information though the pride on his face, shining like the midday sun, pretty much answered the question. Teo slowly set down his glass, wiped his lips, and said, Are you trying to tell us something? He appeared half-interested, only making Elijah seem all the more antsy. Elijah sagged with relief and a slow grin settled on his bright face. Deja's pregnant. Cedar squeezed her hands together in delight. How far along is she? Four and a half months. Ha! Teo smacked Elijah on the back, sending him crashing into the table and making their cutlery clatter. Congratulations, he boomed. Cedar steadied her water glass. That's wonderful. Elijah coughed, probably from being congratulated so heartily by Teo. We're pretty excited. He glanced at Akone and swiped at his now clean cheek as if he could still feel the yams. Mostly nervous. Cedar held back a giggle. Akone was a prince, compared to some of the kids she'd watched over at camp. If he made Elijah nervous, then the new parents could be in for quite a ride. Of course, most parents loved their children's antics or at least tolerated them better than they did other people's children. Something about that parental desire to love and protect put up a shield against annoying habits. For the most part. There were always exceptions but Cedar didn't want to think about her dad right now. Teo shook his head. No wonder you've been begging me to get things done. Elijah nodded. The more I do now, the more time I'll be able to take off when the baby comes. Let's get down to business. Teo folded his arms and leaned on the table, making it tip slightly his direction and giving Cedar an amazing view of his muscular definition. He caught her eye and nodded, telling her she was a part of this. Her cheeks warmed with his invitation. 
Elijah snapped up his briefcase like he'd been waiting for the green light. There are three local small business owners looking for startup money, a car repair shop that specializes in computer and sensor problems in newer vehicles. Cedar tipped her head to the side. The idea was interesting. She liked that they specialized in something that was usually handled at a dealership level, allowing them to break into a new market. The drawback was that it would take six months to a year to get something like that off the ground. Word of mouth only spread so quickly in a specialized field. A dry cleaner, continued Elijah. Not a bad idea either. This business was general, could serve a lot of customers, and had a quick turnaround so they could take in loads of work. No pun intended. But there were a great number of dry cleaners in Dallas. What made this one so special? If they didn't have a fantastic location, then they could sink quickly. And a hair salon for people with curly hair. Cedar's fork froze halfway to her mouth and her brain tripped. I'm sorry, what was that last one? Elijah consulted his notes. A hair salon for people with curly hair. Tao lowered his eyebrows. Is curly hair that big of a deal? He looked around the restaurant as if counting the number of women with curly hair. Cedar did the same. There were three in a room of twenty-five or so. But she'd bet her first nanny check that there were another ten women in here who had curly or wavy hair and straightened it every morning because they had no idea what to do with their natural waves and crimps. Yes. Cedar nodded slowly. It is. Both Teo and Elijah stared at her, and she realized they were waiting for an explanation. The research she'd done came back to her in a tidal wave of numbers, stats, and dollars. 45% of women have some type of curl in their hair. There are four types, ranging from a wave to a tight spiral, and all four types can grow on one head of hair. Women who embrace their curl, or want to embrace it, want someone who understands that to cut and style their tresses. Preferably someone who has curly hair themselves. Teo and Elijah exchanged an open-mouthed look. How do you know this? asked Teo. Elijah leaned over his plate dangling his tie awfully close to what was left of his steak. I, um, Cedar paused, moving her knife to the center of her plate and pushing it aside. I put together a business plan for just such a salon. My old roommate came home from getting her hair cut, looking like she'd stuck her finger in a light socket. She cried for a week. I saw a need in the market that wasn't being met and I did a lot of research, conducted a few surveys, and even made up a floor plan. I actually wanted Terry to run the salon. She's a manager at Baby Gap, but this would be right up her alley. Silence fell over their small table. Even Akone contentedly sucked on a graham cracker, his eyes big as he watched the adults. Cedar shifted in her seat. She never talked about her ideas, not since Darren. They'd met in a class where she'd thrown a few ideas around for a group project. After a couple kisses and fewer dates, he was already talking about the two of them owning their own mom-and-pop shops. He believed those were the best kind to make millions and stay under the radar. He loved the idea of being the unknown millionaire next door. Cedar didn't care about all that, but she had been flattered that he thought her ideas were worth millions. Somehow she'd confused that thought with the belief that Darren thought she was worth millions. Her mistake. One she wouldn't make again. Teo's appreciative gaze was only because he was interested in her mind. So you think the salon is the one to go for? Teo lightly touched her forearm, bringing Cedar out of her head and back to the conversation at hand. She looked into his warm brown eyes as soda bubbles tickled her skin where his fingers touched. She managed to lift a shoulder, a move she prayed made her appear relaxed and unaffected by his nearness. As if that were possible. I don't want to tell you what to do with your money. The idea that he would invest more money into this business than she would make in a year in something she suggested freaked her out. Doing class projects was one thing, but this was real life. 
If the business tanked, then Teo could blame her for arguing for it. He could probably sue her. He had the money and a lawyer. She wouldn't stand a chance. But if it were you, you'd do it, he pressed. Her back was up against the wall with all three of them staring at her, waiting for an answer. Yes, even Akone joined the men in their stare-down cedar for an answer tactic. Cedar's mouth was so dry Chalk would be jealous. She needed to get used to this pressure. One day, she would be the one asking for startup funds. Except, that would be easier because she believed in her concepts, researched the crap out of them, and waterproofed as much as any new business owner possibly could. She'd have the confidence of knowing that she would do her best to make the business a success. Would whomever was asking for money from Teo do the same? Probably. No one went into business expecting to fail. Of course, most new businesses did fail in the first year. After what must have been too long of a silence, Teo nudged her knee under the table. She jumped as a current exploded just under her skin. She rearranged her silverware. If it were my money, she swallowed, and the funds were free for investing and I was willing to take a risk on a new business, then yes, I would take a chance on the salon. Her body slumped forward, like she'd had to force the words out. When had she become such a wimp? That wasn't her, and she shrugged inside the insecurity like a scratchy bath towel. I'm in, he told Elijah. Teo's dimples appeared, sending warmth rushing through her body. How a man who was so big and tough could be so adorable was beyond her. Elijah made a note. I'll have the paperwork drawn up. He turned to Cedar. What do you think about a storage facility in Plano? I have another client who wants to put one out there, says there's a lot of new growth. Cedar considered the idea rather than considering Teo's dimples again. That area is growing. She paused, still a little uncomfortable that her confirmation could trigger major capital exchanging hands. Real life had so many consequences, compared to college. I'd like to drive by the site and check on the number of homes being built per year. She snuck a look at Teo, who was signaling for the check. I'm not here to make decisions for Teo. Please don't think I assume as much. I appreciate your input, said Teo. And I value your opinion. Cedar blushed under the praise and ducked under the trust. She had entered her internship thinking she had enough information and confidence to take the world by storm, but even just this small meeting among friends showed her she was one of the little guys, the new kid on the field. She had a long way to go before she conquered anything. Elijah swiped his mouth with a napkin. I imagine Cedar's knowledge of business is a lot like reading the football field is for Teo. You get a sense of things over time, the other team, their strengths and weaknesses. Hours of watching film, Teo added. Elijah dipped his head in acknowledgement. Same idea. Except Cedar studies the local economy and market trends. Cedar grinned, but inside she panicked. At school, she'd had professors and other students as resources. Now that she'd graduated, all she had was herself and anything she could find online, and she hadn't been taking the time to stay up on things because she spent so much time with Akone. Right now, she felt like a big, fat poser. Elijah continued, I'm just sorry Teo got to you first. If you're ever interested in consulting, I'd be happy to put you to work. Cedar relaxed into a smile. Thanks, I'll keep that in mind. It will depend on where I end up. Some companies frown on outside consulting. Elijah nodded. Where are you interviewing? This week? Club Corporation. You are? Teo scowled. The effect was intimidating, implying there was danger ahead, although it wasn't aimed at her. She had not once felt intimidated by him, despite his size. Cedar could only imagine how scary he looked on the football field when he was after a defender. 
I forgot to tell you I got an email this morning. She had meant to tell him. They talked about everyday activities, about the small moments of their day. Though she had yet to tell him much about her parents or what happened with Darren. Their conversations tended to focus on the here and now, like friends keeping each other apprised of their comings and goings. There the word was again, friend. Friends' heads don't get lost in the clouds when they decide to go to lunch together. That's exactly what had happened to her when Teo invited her to meet Elijah. Great. Now she had to come up with another new word. One that said friends with butterflies. Teo's brow furrowed. How soon will they want you to start? Cedar cut her vocabulary science experiment short. I, I don't know. I'll find out sometime around the second interview. You don't sound excited. Teo touched her arm again sending those soda bubbles over her skin and a marvelous shiver all the way to her toes. I'm cautiously optimistic. She'd been excited about the interview, as excited as she dared to get, anyway. Her hopes had been high for the tiny titans camp, and therefore the fall had hurt pretty badly. Going through that again wasn't on her to-do list, so she was keeping a healthy perspective. Teo sank into his chair, looking like a giant balloon with a third of the air let out. His obvious sadness tugged at her heart. She wanted the job, but she wasn't sure she was ready to give up her time with Teo and Akone. The idea was like a fist-sized rock in her chest. It's just an interview. I'm not even sure I'll get the job. You'll get it, Elijah assured her, but oblivious to Teo's change in mood. He took the bill from Teo and slipped his credit card in the leather folder. Thanks, Cedar mumbled, glad someone was confident for her. She busied herself getting Akone clean enough to lift out of his high chair. Eating was an experience he liked to use all five senses to enjoy. As she cleaned Akone off, she could feel Teo's eyes on her. She got the feeling he was holding back a flood of words with the same determination he used to hold back the opposing team's defensive line. He'd probably ask her to stay on as a nanny, and she'd be sorely tempted to take him up on that offer. This job was a cushion between college and the real world. Technically, it was a job, and it paid well enough to be respectable. But it wasn't the job she'd gone back to school to earn. And what would she tell her parents? Her dad already thought she was a scatterbrain that she'd taken after her mother just because they were both female. She'd set out to prove him wrong, though why she cared at this point in her life was hard to determine. Habit? Tradition? Some long-buried childhood need that remained unfulfilled? Without hours of psychotherapy she may never know. If she stayed a nanny, a part of her would always wonder what life would have been like if she'd struck out on her own. That wonder could easily turn to resentment if things weren't in harmony with Teo. Right now they gelled, having full conversations with their eyes and whatnot. What if that went away? What if Teo started dating again and he picked someone other than her to start with? A dragon of jealousy roared to life and breathed fire through her face. No way could she stay at home with Akone while Teo wooed another woman. Elijah said goodbye, shaking hands all around, including Akone's, which she gave him huge props for doing after the yam incident. She lifted Akone to free him from the seat, and his foot got caught in one of the straps. Cedar blew her hair off her forehead. Here. Teo slid his hands under Akone's arms to take his weight so Cedar could free his foot. She managed to do so easily enough. While her hands were empty, she busied herself with gathering their things. For some reason, she rushed, tossing wipes and a sippy cup into the bag and repeatedly tucking her hair behind her ears. As long as she was busy, she didn't have to look at Teo and think of him dating another woman. His sadness at her interview status was obvious. While she knew he valued her as a nanny, there was something else in his gaze that had caught her off guard. Something that made her wonder if he would miss her, 
just her and not her laundry monster game skills, when she left. Teo's warm hand came to rest on her side, pulling all thought and movement to a complete stop. We're not in a hurry, he said. She let out a nervous laugh, acutely aware that he was touching her hip. She liked that his touch was featherlight and lingering, that his strength poured into her. His dark brown eyes traced over her cheek and jaw and lips before capturing her gaze. Caught there, hanging in a state of clouded bliss, she muttered, more. She leaned closer, planning to brush her fingers across his temple and into his short hair. More? His hand kneaded her hip in the most delightful way. Cedar forgot to breathe as she tipped forward on her toes. Teo's body was warm. Being this close, she was overwhelmed with him. Her pulse pounded in her ears in a steady but quick thump, 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 thump. The sound blocking out all other noises. She breathed and Teo breathed, and she could hear his lungs inflate and feel the heat off his chest as it grew. He could kiss her right now. So easily. And, heaven help her, she'd let him. Akone unleashed a banshee scream for attention, crashing through the haze of temptation that had surrounded her and Teo and causing Cedar to jump. What was that? She reached for the baby, still trying to shake off the sensations that had overtaken her brain when Teo touched her. Every head in the dining room turned their direction. There's nothing wrong with him. She lightly poked around Akone's collarbone, and he laughed. Except that he's an attention hog. Teo dropped a fifty on the table for a tip. Whispered conversations happened all around them, and Cedar was suddenly aware that they were the still the center of attention, more so now that people recognized Teo. Teo was too large, too famous to stand around in the middle of a room and not have people notice. Thank goodness he hadn't kissed her. Except, she was more disappointed than relieved, and that was troubling. A guy two tables over smiled wickedly at Cedar. He held up his phone to take a picture. She turned away quickly to shield Akone from the camera with her body. She could only imagine what these people thought was going on at their table, especially after that long look she and Teo shared. If they were going to go out in public, she would have to be more aware of who was watching them. Teo didn't seem to mind the attention. He ignored the hubbub, taking his time weaving through the tables on their way out. Cedar wasn't as calm. She clutched Akone to her chest with shaking hands, feeling as though a pack of wolves nipped at her heels. Akone didn't protest and he didn't scream again. He was happy now that he had one of them all to himself. She'd have to work on his ability to share. Not that she expected him to share her with Teo, that was presuming too much. One look did not a relationship make. And, who was she to believe Teo was interested in her the way she was interested in him? He'd touched her. But they'd spent so much time together, touching would be normal. Maybe not touching her hip. That was personal. They stepped into the sunshine, and she relaxed her hold on the baby, though her thoughts were wound just as tight as ever as she puzzled over Teo's intentions. Teo handed over her sunglasses from the diaper bag before putting on his own. You were saying something? he asked. It was only then that Cedar realized he was well aware of the attention he garnered, and he handled it well. She tried to remember what she'd said before Akone's scream, but all she could think about was the way his hand had felt on her hip. I didn't. The words caught in her throat as they crossed the warm parking lot to his SUV. You said more. He held the door open for her and leaned against it, a cocky glint in his eye. Mortified, she ducked into the car. No, I didn't. In that moment, though, she'd wanted so much more of Teo. She'd wanted him to kiss her. Kiss her long and good and in so many different places she couldn't make up her mind. He could kiss her right here, he could kiss her in the laundry room with her back up against the wall, he could sit her on the kitchen counter, and she could wrap her arms around his neck and Akone screamed and arched his back, making it impossible to click the chest buckle. 
Cedar released the breath she'd been holding along with the thoughts she shouldn't have had in the first place. She tickled Akone's tummy until he collapsed in giggles, and she could do up the straps. He grunted and strained, turning his face red. Yes, you did, Teo replied. Cedar didn't have to look at him to know his brown eyes danced with amusement, she could feel it radiate from him. No she moved out of the back seat and squared her shoulders and thought quickly. I said S more. As in, we should make S mores over your fire pit. That is the dorkiest cover-up in the history of cover-ups. Akone will love them. Graham crackers are his favorite. Teo lifted one eyebrow. S'mores? She'd committed to it and now she had to sell it, even if she sounded like a complete dunderhead. It will be fun. We used to make them every night at camp. He opened her door. Why not? Cedar smiled as she climbed into the passenger seat. Inside she scrambled to pull herself together. Wanting more of Teo was one thing, acting on that want was something else altogether. A fun night around the fire would be low-key and campish. Just what she needed to keep her mind off the way Teo's touch made her heart race and her thoughts slow down. There were other things to think about than his firm and gentle touch and wondering what his lips would feel like against hers. So many other things to think about, she was just having a hard time coming up with one. Chapter 14 Teo turned off the floodlights in the backyard, dropping the space into muted darkness and creating a removed-from-reality experience. Firelight did that on the beach. How many times had his family gathered around burning driftwood just to talk? The temperature was down to a comfortable 86 degrees. He chuckled. 86 was like paradise, compared to the 96 that slammed into him during the day. The scene he found in his backyard warmed his heart. Akone wandered from one ball or toy to the next. There was a toddler-sized playground that he mostly used to hold on to as he wandered around. His legs were getting stronger, and he could walk farther than just a couple weeks ago. Probably because Cedar didn't carry him all over like Teo did. She held his hand and let him set the pace, an act that testified to her high level of patience. The playground was surrounded by astroturf. There were a few raised flower beds here and there, and then there was the beach. Half the yard was covered in beach sand. There were large poles with UV-blocking material stretched between them that kept direct sunlight off the sand so it didn't get too hot. There was room for a kiddie pool, but he had yet to set one up. To one side of the beach was a brick fire pit. In the middle of all the beautiful landscaping and under the starlit sky was the most captivating woman he'd ever met. Cedar's hair was long and loose, the two tones in sharp contrast in the firelight. Her profile was stunning with her elegant neck and pert nose. She was watching the fire, her hands on her hips. Teo could still feel the curve of her against his palm. She fit perfectly there. His head was still trying to wrap around the moment, the connection that had drawn them close and the way his blood pounded in his ears. She turned as he approached and offered a sincere smile. That might be what he liked about her best, her sincerity. She didn't say things she didn't mean, and she didn't hide. She was real. This place is a kid's paradise. She glanced at the Akone-sized trike the horse on springs, the swing, and the slide. Amy kid-proofed everything. Teo set the grocery bags on the sand by her chair. They'd stopped at the store on their way home from lunch to pick up the necessary items. Once home, Akone had napped, and he and Cedar had taken to their laptops to get work done. He liked the easy rhythm of their time together. There was no pressure to entertain one another and yet just being in the same room made the moment better. She would have put Akone in a bubble if she could have. Teo was surprised that the words didn't come out sounding bitter. For a few months, he'd been unable to speak of Amy without sounding like an ogre and therefore he'd chosen not to say anything at all. 
I'm glad she worked so hard to make the house safe. It made taking over for her easier. I'm sure. Cedar began removing items from the bag and lining them up on the stone lip of the raised fire pit. Marshmallows, square ones. Teo had no idea they even made square marshmallows, but Cedar looked until she found them. Graham crackers were next, followed by all types of candy bars from traditional milk chocolate to peanut butter cups and mint patties. Teo took off his sandals and sank his feet into the sand. Something about feeling sand under his feet centered him, like part of his soul was made up of the tiny particles. Why'd you stay with her? Cedar spoke evenly, not at all like she was digging for gossip, but like she really wanted to know what he'd been through. She ripped open the marshmallows and sniffed the package with a smile. Teo had asked himself the same thing many times. In the end, he was glad he hadn't left, because if he had, Akone would have been alone for who knew how long after his mother had died. At least he'd been there for his son when Amy collapsed. I look back and wonder the same thing. I guess I had hope. Time can work miracles. The truth of his words rushed through his body like a warm ocean wind. Cedar smiled softly. You and your miracles. Hey, miracles are real. My mama said so, and she should know. Yeah. Yeah. She had five boys. It's a miracle she survived raising us. Cedar laughed. There's no way I can argue that one. She handed him a roasting stick. Do you miss her? My mom? No, Amy. Cedar stared into the fire like she was afraid to look him in the eye. Teo shook his head. He had nothing to hide, not from her. I don't want to say it was a relief when she died. That sounds cold and heartless. I didn't want her to die. But it was a relief not to have her constant resentment and anger in the house. It was tangible and ugly. I can imagine. There must have been good times. Teo had thought long and hard about those times, wondering if he'd been blinded by Amy's beauty or tricked into falling in love. In the end, he decided he couldn't and wouldn't change anything. If he had to go through all of that pain to get his son, so be it. There were some. Those are the memories I'll give to Akone. Cedar smiled sadly. What about you? Me? Yeah, have you been married? She barked a laugh. Not hardly. I'm too busy right now. Too busy for marriage? Too busy for romance. That takes time, and I'm a little short on that commodity. I see. So, you're not opposed to romance? Her throat moved slowly as she swallowed. He took a moment to admire the graceful curve of her neck and the way her skin glowed in the light. He wasn't sure where he was going with these questions or if he'd be able to act on the answers. But asking them was akin to walking along the edge of a steep cliff. His heart beat erratically and his mouth went dry. I'm not opposed, she rasped, her eyes raking over his face and landing on his lips before it took flight again. Akone trotted over and slammed into Teo's leg. Grateful for the chance to change the subject, he wasn't quite sure how to fall off that cliff and survive. Teo picked Akone up and tossed him into the air. Are you ready for a treat? He tossed him again, making him belly laugh. Best sound in the world. He tucked Akone into his arm. What about you, Cedar? Are you Reed for Esmore? He emphasized the last word, teasing her about her slip this afternoon. She'd been caught up in the moment just like he was, and she'd wanted more. A fact that fed his ego like nothing before. Cedar pulled the lounge chair closer to the fire and sat down. Oh, I'm ready, she said, and he thought he heard flirting in her voice. Gripping the roasting stick between her knees, she pressed a marshmallow onto the tongs and tipped the stick over the fire. 
she managed to open the graham crackers and a candy bar while roasting a marshmallow. That's impressive. Teo nodded to her multitasking as he dropped a chair next to hers. Camp counselor, remember? She set the crackers on her knees and began rotating her marshmallow. Already, Teo felt the heaviness of their earlier conversation about Amy evaporating in Cedar's happy glow. She didn't shy away from him after his confession. He could easily be painted as a monster for saying it was a relief not to have Amy around. The words still didn't sit right. On the flip side, he was thankful Cedar hadn't criticized Amy. He wasn't sure he could defend her yet, and he was grateful not to be put in a position where he felt like he needed to. With the crackling of the wood and the warm air and moisture on his skin, Tail was transported back to the family beach parties of his childhood and teen years. If he closed his eyes, he could hear the surf. There was one question that had followed him around most of the afternoon and another one burning his lips. He doubted she had a boyfriend. She didn't text often, nor had she mentioned dating or needing time off for dates, but he was dying to ask her if she had a man of interest in her life. Instead, he went with the other, non-threatening question. So, he let Akone hold their roasting stick. Akone waved it around haphazardly, not getting the marshmallow anywhere near the flames. Teo put one hand up to shield his face from an attack. What are these business ideas you've cooked up? Cedar looked at him out of the corner of her eye. The orange glow of the fire played across her cheekbones, giving her an exotic appearance. You'll think they're silly. Are they? he challenged. I don't think so. Then tell me. Just one. She hesitated. Come on. He circled his free arm. This is a safe place for sharing. Okay, well. She smiled and wiggled in her seat. There's been a wave of homeschooling sweeping the nation. He'd have to take her word for that. Amy had put Akone on the waitlist for private schools the day two pink lines showed up. Well, I wanted to create an art and craft curriculum for preschool through second grade for homeschooled kids. Each month would have a theme, something like nature or bugs, and then parents wouldn't have to come up with something. I'd want to include all the supplies and directions to make it as easy as possible. The idea was so cedar. Inventive, fun, helpful, and centered around children. She was going to be a fantastic mother one day. A vision of a little girl with his dark hair and her ocean eyes looking up at him with a teddy bear clutched in her arms appeared. The girl was so real his chest clenched with a sense of fatherly protection. That's cool, he sputtered. I think it would be fun for the kids and make life easier for the parents. She pulled a perfectly golden marshmallow from the fire, pressed it between two graham crackers, and held the treat out for Akone. Here you go, tough guy. Your first esmore should be a traditional one. Akone dropped the stick he'd wielded and grabbed for the treat. He'd be a mess in no time, but that's what bathtubs were for. Teo liked that cedar wasn't worried about messes. Is there anything you can't do? He asked her quietly. Cedar's cheeks took on a deeper glow than the fire created. I can't play the piano or the guitar. Hmm, Teo reached out to finger the lighter strands of hair that framed her face. How have you made it through life without knowing how to play the piano, he teased. I'm just coasting by, I guess. She leaned into his touch and his hand found its way to cupping her cheek. At the absolute acceptance, the wanting, in Cedar's eyes, Teo's mouth went dry. Her hand went to his neck, her fingers dancing across his skin, and he pulled her closer, her sweet pineapple scent mingling with the smoke and chocolate smells twirling in the space between them. Tao moved slowly, sure that he'd never wanted something as much as he wanted to know what Cedar's mouth felt like against his. His skin warmed with anticipation and his heart pounded like the drums from the best of his childhood memories. He lowered his lips to hers, tasting sweetness as Cedar welcomed his kiss and responded to his touch. 
This was no gasping for breath or crazed hormonal kiss. The kiss was slow and exploratory, full of meaning. This was a kiss that changed the entire playbook. When they pulled apart, Teo smiled. You're good at everything. Cedar ducked her head, suddenly shy. Teo brushed his fingers across her cheek. Her mouth fell open. Tough guy, she gasped. Teo followed her gaze to find his shirt smeared with S. Mores, and his son mighty proud of his artwork. Funny, he hadn't even noticed the kid finger painting marshmallow on him. Teo rolled his eyes. It's past your bedtime, Picasso. Cedar smiled and reached for Akone. I'll give him a quick bath if you want to change. The heat between them was slipping away, and they were falling back into nanny and daddy mode. He wasn't ready for their time as a couple to be over. I'll meet you back out here, he offered. Cedar studied her pale pink painted bare toes in the sand. Teo's eyebrows pulled together. Of all the times to be shy, why now? He'd made a bold move. Wasn't it obvious that he liked her? He paused. Maybe it wasn't obvious. Maybe she thought a kiss was just a kiss to him. That was no ordinary kiss, though. That kiss had proven they were more than compatible, more than friends, more, more, more. Akone twisted, trying to plant his chocolate-covered hands on Cedar's face. She dodged him easily enough, but if she didn't get Akone inside she would be just as messy as Teo. Cedar, eyed, can we talk? About what just happened? She nodded and hurried towards the door. Teo scooted around her and opened the door, pausing to kiss her hair. I'll be out as soon as I can, she said. I'll be waiting. He kept his hand on her back as they went through the house, not wanting a moment to go by that they weren't together. He had to show her that he was interested in her, not as a nanny, but as a smart, fun, beautiful woman with major Esmore skills. Chapter 15 Thankfully, Akone settled in without a fuss. Having a bedtime routine made all the difference for him. He liked to sleep on his tummy with his little bum in the air. It was the cutest darn thing. Cedar rubbed his back and hummed nonsense, her mind in the backyard where that amazing kiss had taken place. In the second before their lips came together, her good sense told her to back away and create distance, but her heart ruled the day, and she'd melted into Teo's kiss like a piece of chocolate next to a warm marshmallow. An odd sense of accomplishment, one that had nothing to do with an A on a term paper or a word of praise from a professor, filled her as she kissed Alcone goodnight. His contentment and feeling of safety were partly because of her. She couldn't take all the credit, but knowing that she was an influence for good for this precious little being wrapped her in love and contentment. She'd made a difference in his world, and that felt pretty remarkable. Other amazing things had happened today. Like meeting Elijah. Not only had he valued what she'd said, he treated her like an equal, asked her advice, and had even offered her a consulting position. He wanted to pay her for her thoughts. That was huge. But the most amazing thing that had happened, the thing that had her heating up from the inside out and wiping her damp hands down her pant legs was Teo's kiss. Cedar could sort all the first kisses she'd experienced with boyfriends into four categories. First, the nervous kiss. With this one, the guy grabbed her shoulders too quickly and clumsily and almost missed her lips. A nervous kiss could be forgiven, but if it happened again, she had to break it off. Who wanted to spend their life kissing a guy who couldn't find the target? Second, there was the I'm going for it all kiss where the man would take things as far as she would let him and then push for more. He seemed to grow three more arms and think his tongue was a sword. Third, the cookie monster kiss. When this happened, the guy would attack as if he were trying to devour her whole face. Yuck. A cookie monster kiss would mean the end of the relationship. There was no coming back from slobber. 
Finally, there was the sweet and sultry kiss. The kind where she and he were on the same wavelength. They both wanted the kiss and were equally matched in enthusiasm. This kiss meant there was going to be a second date and probably a third. Men who kissed that good were hard to say goodbye to when the relationship went south. But after tonight, Cedar would have to add a fifth category to her kissing history. A category she was going to have to call Teo's kiss. His kiss had been as perfect as any first kiss could be, soft and achingly slow, tender yet firm, strong, because that was him. Teo was tough. He was a man in all the best ways. And yet she sensed that he had been wounded deeply by Amy's rejection. And who wouldn't be? To have the one person you pledged your life to change their mind would be awful. Amy had died a little over six months ago, if Cedar remembered the online articles correctly. While she didn't doubt the sincerity of his kiss, she wondered if he was ready to start another relationship. If the wounds Amy inflicted, whether intentionally or unintentionally, had healed. Perhaps it would be better if Cedar backed off a bit, gave Teo some space to sort through things. Then again, it wasn't like she'd pushed him into kissing her. They both moved closer. She shook her head. There was no denying they were attracted to one another, and she did want another kiss, maybe ten. The thought made her insides quiver with anticipation as she made her way to the backyard. Pausing at the doorway, she took in Teo. He was in a lounge chair, his bare feet propped up on the edge of the fire pit. The firelight danced across his chiseled features, revealing the warrior inside who earned a starting position on the titan's offensive line. He was fierce and beautiful, and he took her breath away. Light-headed, she stumbled out the door and to the beach. The sand was warm around her ankles, but not hot. Her cheeks, on the other hand, burned. Teo's feet dropped, and he reached his long arm out to bring her chair right next to his. I've been saving this seat for you. Thanks. It's hard to find a chair around here, she joked. There were four other chairs within spitting distance. She sat down, forcing herself to appear relaxed, because every molecule in her body was stretched tight. Teo took her hand in his, unleashing butterflies in her stomach. You're the first person who's been back here since my family flew home. The sand was my dad's idea. He said I needed a reminder of where I came from and that there were people there who loved me. He traced circles around the back of her hand. Cedar's mind raced. Surely he wasn't going to say that he'd fallen in love with her. That was crazy. She cared for him, liked him, but wasn't to the love stage of anything yet. Your dad sounds wonderful, she hedged the best. Teo grew quiet, and Cedar grew anxious. When she couldn't stand the silence anymore, she said, Teo? His dark, captivating eyes were full of firelight and desire. The combination knocked the breath right out of her. Are you, I mean, is this fast? She squeezed his hand. Too fast for you? Teo released her hand and leaned forward, resting his elbows on his knees. I'm not worried about what people will say, if that's what you mean. Cedar hadn't even given that a thought. But she could see how he would, how he had to. They'd been spotted in public today, photographed with Akone. Rumors were bound to fly. I'm not worried about that either. I'm worried about you. Worried that you need more time to mourn. There was no better way to spoil a romantic mood than to bring up a man's first wife, but Cedar needed to know what she was up against. As much as she liked Teo, and she did like him an awful lot, she didn't want to fall into anything that Teo would find overwhelming and jump out of when it got too real. He traced her jaw with his fingers, sending a shiver down her spine. I mourned my marriage long before Amy died. While I always maintained hope that she would change, I'd given up on what I thought we could have together. I believe I have forgiven what needs to be forgiven, but there's some letting go that still needs to take place. 
Cedar's insides hardened. She slowly got to her feet. I understand. She cleared the emotion from her throat. Apparently, she liked Teo more than she thought she did. She hurried over to where her shoes rested. I'll be here tomorrow at my regular time. Cedar. Teo was behind her in a flash. For a big guy, he sure moved quickly. Of course he moved quickly, that was what he did for a living. He stood behind her and placed his warm hands on her shoulders. Her thoughts and feelings jumbled around inside of her. I didn't mean time without you. What I feel for you is separate from what happened with Amy. You're not her, and I know that. I'd really like to see where this is going. His voice dropped. I like you, Cedar. She turned to face him, his arms enveloping her, and tipped her chin up so she could get lost in his delicious eyes. Where is this going? Her hands went to his arms, needing to steady herself. He was quickly overwhelming every part of her with soft and slow caresses up and down her back. The next time his hands went up, they continued until his fingers dug into her hair, and Teo brought his forehead down to touch hers. I think we're headed towards good things. Cedar's eyelids fluttered shut as their lips came together. She drank in his touch, skimming her hands across all the muscles in his arms and shoulders and up into the prickly, tickly short hair on the back of his head. A soft moan escaped as he effortlessly lifted her against his large frame. As Cedar lost herself in the moment, she decided she was pretty happy with his answer. Chapter 16 Teo sat in the living room, watching Akane play while he ate his mid-morning snack of eight scrambled eggs with spinach and a protein shake. Pre-season workouts with the team were a month away. He finished the eggs and set the plate on the side table. He just needed to choke down the chalky vanilla drink and he'd be good until lunch. The first part of the summer had been an adjustment, balancing Akane's needs with his own. After Cedar came into their lives, everything sort of clicked. He felt good. Strong. He needed to be. The triple threat was no longer a triple. Ace's injury meant he was out for a season, probably out for good. Every member of the Titans needed to bring it this year if they were going to knock out the Destroyers and win the Super Bowl. This was their year. He would not be the weak link in their offensive line. No one was going to get past him. The sound of a familiar vehicle in his driveway had him chugging the drink and setting the cup by the plate. He'd get to them later. Right now, he had something of the utmost importance to take care of. Tail bolted to the door and ripped it open just as Cedar was about to enter the security code on the keypad. She startled a little and then burst into a smile. Teo gathered her into his arms. He kissed her once, right there on the front porch in front of the whole neighborhood. Then twice, and three times before backing through the door with her in his arms, spinning around, and kicking it shut behind them. Cedar giggled and kissed him right back. She didn't hurry things along. He was quickly caught up her playful mood. He pulled in Teo's belly. He loved that she was so lovable and loving, so easy to show affection to, because she gave it right back. He moved to kissing her neck, making her giggle all the more. How was your interview? Her skin was warm against his lips, and she smelled of sweetened pineapple and sunshine. He drank in her scent, burying his face in the crook of her neck. She was laughing hard now and wiggling. He set her on her feet so he wouldn't drop her. Fantastic, she said, almost out of breath. She leaned into his body, putting her chin on his chest as she gazed up at him with those ocean eyes. When Tail put his chin to his chest, they were only a few inches away from kissing. That was his second favorite place to be, with his first favorite being zero inches away from kissing. He brought his eyebrows down low. Darn. Ah. Uh. She patted his arm. You promised to be the supportive boyfriend. 
Mateos pressed his lips together to keep from smiling. He loved it when she called him her boyfriend. Ever since the night around the fire pit, he'd known his life was changing for the better, and it was all because of Cedar. She was the perfect fit for both him and Akone. She was an excellent partner in life, someone he could work with and laugh with. When they were together, he felt whole. I am the most supportive boyfriend in the world. He kissed her nose. I was looking forward to cheering you up. He tickled her sides and she danced away, laughing. Cedar had been on three interviews in the last week. The first interview was a total flop, and she insisted on drowning her sorrows in melted marshmallows and chocolate. Not a bad way to go, if you ask Teo. He could handle commiserating by firelight while holding the hand of a beautiful woman. Cedar said the second interview went much better. They called the next day to tell her they had gone with someone else. Teo took one look at her downcast face and packed them all up to hit the water park. Akone couldn't go on the bigger slides, but they had a great time playing in the kiddie area, splashing and flirting with one another. Taking in the broad grin on Cedar's heart-shaped face, he figured he wouldn't need his backup plan for the day. That was a pity. Flying them out to Park City for a private concert with Montana crew and a few close friends would have been a lot of fun. They could still do it, but he had a meeting with Elijah scheduled, and with the baby on the way, Teo didn't want to stress out his agent. Cedar tipped her head, considering him. I thought I was happy when I left the interview, but you took that up a notch. She brushed her fingers up his arms, sending goosebumps over his flesh. I am happy with you, Teo, she said quietly. Teo's whole chest burned with bliss. He lowered his head, and Cedar reached up on her tiptoes to meet him for a passionate and longing kiss. Cedar suddenly broke them apart. Wait, don't you have a meeting? Teo groaned. Do I have to go? He was going, but he wanted her to know he'd rather stay. Cedar laughed as she slipped out of his arms, heading toward the family room. She stopped in her tracks in the doorway, staring at the giant ball pit Akone rolled around in. Teo had to push the couch to one side to make room for the inflatable toy, but the effort had been worth it. He and Akone had spent the morning playing together. Akone liked to wrestle, and in the pit, Teo didn't have to worry about him rolling off his back and getting hurt. You are crazy. She smacked Teo's arm. Akone heard her voice and let out one of his banshee screams. Teo rubbed at his ear. He hadn't quite gotten used to those and wondered where his silent baby had gone. Akone scrambled for Cedar, falling down several times in his attempt to get to her. There's my tough guy, she cooed, and she scooped up Akone, smattering him with kisses. Teo's heart sputtered at the sight of his boy in his woman's arms. He wrapped them both in an embrace and kissed their heads. I'll hurry back. There's no rush. I'm free for the rest of the day. That's why I want to hurry back. He gave them a gentle squeeze. How stressed would Elijah be if he cancelled, then hurry back? Cedar stretched up and placed a soft kiss on his neck, sending his heart pounding. Tao growled, burying his face between her shoulder and her jaw. She laughed and squirmed and pushed him away. Go! She gasped a breath. Or Elijah will be mad at all of us. Not you. He thinks you're made of gold. Cedar lifted her chin. He's a man of good taste. Why do you think I hired him? Because you're brilliant. Tao gave her hip a squeeze before taking one step backward. The first few steps away from her were the hardest. Once she was out of sight, he could function almost normally, though she was never far away from his thoughts. He shook his head at himself as he climbed into the SUV. He really didn't want to leave his house and should have invited Elijah there for the meeting. He'd always been a homebody, even as a kid, he preferred hanging with his family to running with a pack of boys his age. 
They'd go from house to house playing video games and eating their way through the each pantry like locusts. He enjoyed having people over, it was just that home was his center. As he'd grown, the football field became an extension of his home. He felt right on the grass, the same sense he had when he was ankle-deep in beach sand or setting up a ball pit for a cone. Holding Cedar felt that way too, like he was right where he was supposed to be and doing exactly what he was supposed to do. He arrived at Elijah's downtown office only a few minutes late. Elijah greeted him with a handshake. His bald head was extra shiny today. Teo teased him about having gone in for a wax and shine at the salon. He was all smiles and reported that things were good with the baby and Deja. They settled into the plush chairs around the coffee table and got to work. I sold your interest in the chain of tanning salons, Elijah said. You came out on top, but if you want to avoid a hefty tax on the gains you need to roll the profit into something else. Teo wished Cedar was here. She would love this. I'm sure you have suggestions. Elijah leaned forward. Actually, the business developer who had the idea for the curly hair salon put out another plan. Really? Teo leaned forward too. Shouldn't that be a red flag? It would be, if this other plan wasn't just as good. He rifled around the coffee table before coming up with the folder he was looking for. Even I liked this one. It's a bakery with a cookie and brownie bar where you can decorate your own treats. Teo steepled his fingers, intrigued but not sold on the idea. A what? Elijah grinned. Picture an all-you-can-eat buffet, except instead of lettuce and soups under the glass, you have frostings, sprinkles, candies, and the like. The cookies are cut in holiday-appropriate shapes, and there are decorating ideas with instructions posted on the walls. Elijah had painted a sweet picture in Teo's mind. Really? Sounds great, right? Date night. Family night. Times when you want more frosting than cookie. Besides the decorating station, people can purchase a finished product from the display case. Teo could see himself taking Cedar and Akone to a bakery like that. They could spend some time building their own treats. They would love it. Keeping Akone from grabbing fistfuls of sprinkles would be an issue, but the effort would be worth the experience. Let's do it. Elijah jotted down some notes. I think it would be a good idea to meet this guy. Especially if you're going to back more than one of his startups. And if all his ideas are this great, then we want to be in with him before anyone else. Teo could see the wisdom in Elijah's suggestion, but he was already feeling the pull to get back home. I'm bringing Cedar and Akone, so make sure it's a family restaurant. I'll let Deja pick. I want her and Cedar to meet, too. His agent was smart. Cedar was quickly becoming an important part of Teo's life, and he wanted her to know all the people he knew, wanted them to know she was significant. He grinned. Perfect. They went on to talk about a couple commercials for sponsors and his schedule. He wouldn't film during the season, so they had to cram as much in as they could before workouts began. Time was flying by, and as it passed, a sense of change approached. Cedar would probably get the job she interviewed for today. That meant his time with her would be limited to evenings and weekends, and his weekends would be spotted with games and travel. He wanted to lay claim to her every spare minute and soak up her sweet zest for life. As he promised, he hurried home to the two people he cared most about waited. Chapter 17 Well, that was a bust. Cedar flopped onto the couch next to Teo. She rubbed Akone's back. The poor little guy had buried his face in Teo's neck when the possible nanny snapped at him for throwing one of the plastic balls from the ball pit at Teo. She wasn't all bad, Teo offered lamely. Cedar waited. He wrinkled his nose. Never mind, she was horrible. Cedar shook her head. 
Did you love her speech about tough love for toddlers? No. No one is strapping my kid in a chair for any other reason than safety. He already hates his car seat. Can you imagine what he'd do if he were forced in there for letting out one of his screams or smearing jam on his high chair? Cedar laid her head on Teo's arm. I take back every not so nice thought I had about you when you dropped Akone in my arms on that first day. Hiring a nanny is exhausting. So far, they'd interviewed a woman who barely glanced at Akone but spent a lot of time staring at Teo or parts of Teo, depending on the moment. Then there was a grandmother who spent 20 minutes telling them how dangerous football was and insisting Teo retire immediately. They interviewed a man who eyed Teo's football signed by last year's Titans team. He expressed so much interest in the keepsake that Cedar was sure that if the house was on fire, he'd grab the football and leave Akane behind. And then there was Helga. Helga wasn't her real name, but Cedar had taken to thinking of her as such halfway through the interminable interview. Nice to know I've been redeemed in your eyes. Teo shifted so he could check the time. Are you ready for our dinner date? Cedar's stomach flipped. Meeting Elijah's wife was kind of a big deal. Since moving to Texas, she'd made some friends, but they all ran in different circles. She'd barely kept up with where her fellow students ended up after graduation. Many of them were out of state and a few had gone out of the country. She hadn't missed them too much. Teo was quickly becoming her best friend. Strike that, he was her best friend. If she had to pick one person to be stranded with on a deserted island, she would pick him. Not just because his kisses melted her down to her toes, but because he was easy to be around, easy to work with, easy to talk to. Plus, he was strong enough to break trees, and that was essential for making a shelter to survive tropical hurricanes. Still, it would be nice to have a girlfriend she could call on, and even though Teo and Elijah's friendship was based around business, that didn't mean she and Deja had to keep the same parameters. She checked her tight heather pink jeans and gray lace baby doll top for any signs of Akane's lunch. She was clear, but wanted to make sure her hair was in place and apply a fresh coat of lipstick. I just need to freshen up. You want to get fresh with me? Teo pumped his eyebrows. I'm not opposed to that idea. Cedar laughed. I know you're not. She pressed herself against him and kissed just below his ear. Let's rock this dinner meeting and then come back here for a fire on the beach, just you and me. I'm all in on that plan. Teo's voice rumbled low and sexy. K. She kissed him again, enjoying the manly smell of his cologne. It was deep and kind of sweet, just like Teo. Cedar grabbed her purse and headed to the guest bathroom. She flipped her head over and shook out the big curls. She liked the blonde hair around her face, but it was starting to grow out. She'd either have to have it redone soon or color the whole thing dark. Tipping her head from side to side, she wondered what Teo would think of her with dark hair. You're losing it, girl, she told her reflection. Her mom would have told her to go ahead and do whatever she wanted and not let a man dictate what she wanted for hair color or in life. That wasn't the point of her musings. Teo wouldn't like her more or less because of her hair color. He wasn't that shallow. Neither was she. So why did she feel like she'd done something wrong by considering his reaction to a change in hair color? Tossing her cosmetics back into her purse, she adjusted her top and shoved away the weirdness she'd felt. As if summoned by her thoughts, her mom's name and number lit up her phone. Cedar had it on silent for the interviews. Her heart rate picked up and the hair on the back of her neck stood on end. She answered, Mom? Hello, Cedar. I don't have much time, but I wanted you to know your father and I are selling the house and moving to Arizona. Cedar leaned against the counter. The house in question was her childhood home, the one constant in her life growing up. She'd like to go back, pack up a few things, say goodbye to the place. 
It was unfair of her to expect her parents to keep the house just so she had a place she called home. When? Tomorrow. Cedar choked on her own spit. She coughed and wheezed and finally stuck her face under the faucet for a drink of water. How can you move states without giving me notice? I am giving you notice. Twenty-four hours is not notice. Cedar cleared the remained cough from her throat. Her mom waited. I have a lot of good memories of that house. We all do, sweetheart, but it's just a house and it's getting old. We found a nice little place without a yard. No more weeding. Cedar pressed her hand to her chest. I just always pictured you two in that house. The place they always return to. Don't be selfish, Cedar. We're going to be better off, and it's not like you come home all that often. What about the holidays? Who knows? Cedar could picture her mom flicking away her concerns with a flap of her wrist. We'll figure it all out when the time comes. Sure. Sure. Do you have news? A job? Cedar scraped her teeth across her bottom lip. She hadn't told her parents about working as a nanny. They wouldn't understand. No, but I've met someone. Sweetheart, you'll find a job soon. Don't let the job search bring you so low that you go looking for your confidence in the arms of a man. That never works out. I can't believe you just said that to me. Do you even know me at all? I changed your diapers, I know you well enough. Cedar shook her head. She'd said it before and she'd say it again, parents were exhausting. Mom, I have to go. I have a meeting with, what was one little lie? Investors. That's right, you go get those dreams. But have fun, life is supposed to be fun. Sure. Bye now. Bye bye. She stared at her phone for a full minute before dropping it into her purse. The loss of her childhood home was not so great that she couldn't survive. What hurt was the flippant way her mother disregarded her feelings on the matter. With a quick tug at her shirt, she set her jaw and nodded once to herself in the mirror. She didn't need a fawning mother to survive, and she wasn't a sentimental fool, either. Life would go on much as it had before her parents relocated. For a brief moment, she wondered how long it would be until her mom sent her the new address. A week? A month? Thanksgiving? The longer the better as far as she was concerned. She had played with the idea of introducing Teo and Akone to her parents during the holidays. She wanted to show Teo where she grew up, the playground she frequented, the burger joint where she took her first job. Sharing those memories would bring them closer. They could still make the trip but part of her had wanted to make a memory of Teo in her childhood home, to bring her two worlds together and swirl them like cinnamon twists, imprinting Teo into her life like no other man had ever been before. With a shake of her head, she pushed thoughts of parents and homes and childhood out of her head. Ready? Teo asked. He stood by the front door, a cone in one arm and the diaper bag over his other shoulder. He wore a blue polo shirt and golf pants that accentuated his trim middle and broad shoulders. His eyes were inviting. Inviting her into his evening, his heart even. Maybe she didn't need to take him to her past to imprint him on her heart. Falling into his life had worked out pretty good so far. Ready as I'll ever be, she quipped. The drive to Los Tios was uneventful, and they were soon seated with Elijah and Deja. Deja was adorable in her maternity top and tight skirt that accentuated her baby bump. She had short, crazy curly black hair and a high forehead. Her eyes were bright and her smile was contagious. Have you found out what you're having? Teo asked. The busboy put a high chair between Cedar and Deja, and Cedar strapped Akane in. 
He pounded the table with his palms until she sprinkled some vegetable puffs on the surface to keep him occupied. It's a human, replied Elijah, feigning intense interest in the menu. Stop teasing. Deja smacked him in the arm. It's a girl, and he's over the moon. Teo grinned. Better you than me. I'd be a nervous wreck to have a girl. Elijah set down the menu. Are you kidding? Boys are so hard on things, our house would never survive. My little princess is going to have all the stuffed bears and tea parties she wants. Deja turned to exchange a wide-eyed, can you believe him look with Cedar. She pressed her lips together to keep from laughing. If the man they were here to meet was anything like these people, they were going to have a great night. She already suspected she and he were kindred spirits. After all, he was already living her dream life, starting businesses and the like. She'd been looking forward to picking his brain tonight. Elijah's attention shifted to the front door. There's the golden boy now. He stood and waved. Cedar went to stand to greet the final addition to their little dinner party. Akone screamed, lifting his hands towards her as if he wanted to be included. He'd developed some fantastic lungs lately, and rather than have him disturb the whole dining room, she bent down to lift him out of his chair. While she was busy with the latch, she heard Elijah introduce everyone. And this is Cedar, and Teo's son Akone. With a big smile, Cedar turned to meet the man with the brilliant ideas. Cedar's happy feelings evaporated like a puddle in the Texas sun as she stared at the man she'd hoped to never see again. Darren? Darren placed his hand on his stomach and let out a hearty, completely fake laugh. Cedar. What a coincidence. It's so good to see you. He leaned over and gave her a lingering peck on the cheek. Cedar smelled his expensive cologne, the one his mom bought him every year for Christmas. He only used it on special occasions. Their first date. Their one-month anniversary. That scent triggered a half-dozen memories, none of them bad. Cedar realized she was staring at Darren. To say she was stunned would be an understatement. Darren was the man Elijah had taken to calling Golden Boy? Anne, the best offensive tackle in the NFL. Darren clapped Teo on the shoulder as if they were long-lost teammates. It's good to see you again, man. Teo cocked his head. I'm sorry, have we met? Cedar clamped her lips together to hold back the haw. That threatened to escape. She may not have put Darren in his place, but Teo had no trouble keeping the smooth talker at arm's length. Teo put his hand on the back of her chair, and Cedar fell into it with as much grace as a baby horse on shaky legs. She should have shoved Darren away or not let him get close enough to kiss her in front of her boyfriend. She'd done Teo a disservice. In her defense, she'd been blindsided. Surely a football player would understand how that felt. If she'd known they were meeting her ex-boyfriend for lunch, she could have prepared herself for the onslaught of memories and emotions, especially the ones that had risen so easily to the surface at his kiss. Do you want me to put him back in his chair? Teo asked, reaching for Akone. Cedar settled him better on her lap. She wanted the baby close, needed his serenity. She didn't have to worry about Darren snatching a baby. He wanted nothing to do with anyone under the age of 18, she reminded herself. Maybe, if she kept Akone close, Darren wouldn't be tempted to touch her again. I'll hold him for a bit. She smiled up at Teo. How do you two know each other? asked Deja. Darren ended up in the seat across from Cedar. She'd been ravenous when they walked in, the smell of melted cheese and spicy meats tantalizing her senses. Now, she wasn't sure she could force herself to take even one bite. We were in the same master's program, Cedar supplied before Darren could bring up their short but meaningful relationship. She needed to tell Teo that she'd dated Darren, 
but this wasn't the time nor the place to bring up a personal attachment. Besides, she didn't want Teo to look down on her for dating Darren. His dislike for the man was as easy to read as his name on a jersey. And we interned for the Tiny Titans camp. Darren was all toothy smiles and self-congratulations. Like you did any work, Cedar mumbled into Akane's hair. She prayed Darren would keep it professional tonight, despite her mutterings. She'd been the injured one, the brea key, not the breaker. Now there was a term completely appropriate for what Darren had done to them. He'd broken them. And, in the process, caused collateral damage to her. He didn't seem to be any worse for wear and yet she fumbled with her silverware and nearly tipped over her empty cup. Their server came by with chips, salsa, and waters for the table. Hey, Teo. Haven't seen you in a while. Teo smiled easily. Hi, Anna. I've been a homebody. He waved his hand around the table. Everybody, this is A. Sanchez's cousin, Anna. Anna, this is everybody. Hi. She waved to the group and then placed a hand on Teo's shoulder. I'm sorry for your loss. Cedar closed her eyes. Teo didn't act like a man whose wife had passed away not long ago. Sometimes, she forgot. They were so wrapped up in each other and what was going on at the moment that the past just didn't come up or even seem to matter. Teo was working through some things, and every once in a while she'd find him deep in thought with a stony face, but he was generally content if not happy. Likewise, she'd kept her past relationships under her hat. How she wished she'd told Teo something, anything about Darren. Then he'd understand why she would bow out of the meeting. But, since there wasn't much she could do, short of pinching Akone so he'd throw a fit, which she would never do, she was stuck. She chanced a glance at Deja to see if her thoughts were spelled out on her face. Her lower lip was slightly out, and she had a sympathetic tilt to her head. Cedar wondered if Deja thought she and Teo were moving too quickly or that Cedar was a rebound. Did people have those after their spouse passed away? Not used to all this insecurity and ticked that she let Darren get to her so easily, she fussed over Akone's shirt, making sure it lay just right on his back. Thanks. Teo pointed to his menu. I hope you don't get a cramp carrying all this food. I'm in training. He grinned at Anna. Anna laughed. You're just like Ace. He could eat one of everything on the menu in one night. She held her pen over her pad. Shoot, Texas. I'm ready. They ordered, Darren going last so he had a chance to look at the menu that the rest of them had already looked over. After Anna left to put their order in the kitchen, Elijah turned to Darren. How are things going with the salon? Just for curls will open its doors in three weeks. Everything is right on schedule. Cedar's blood ran cold. Just for Curls was the name she'd planned for her business. Darren not only stole the idea, he wasn't creative enough to come up with a different name. She narrowed her eyes at Darren. What's that name again? Darren coughed. Just for Curls. He sipped his water. When she didn't look away, he took a longer drink. Good. She hoped she was making him feel hot under the collar for practicing corporate espionage. Okay, so the term didn't exactly fit since she wasn't in business, but that didn't mean he hadn't stolen information from her that would have made her business a success. A moment after the air grew thick with Darren's discomfort, she turned away, studying a red, yellow, and green sombrero on the wall. That's a cute name. How did you come up with it? I mean, you have straight hair, so why not do a salon for straight-haired people? Teo's hand came to rest on her leg under the table. He asked her what was the matter with a look. I thought you liked the idea. I think it's brilliant, she gushed. 
I'm just wondering how a guy without a curl in sight would find this specific hole in the market. She applied a tight-lipped smile to her face. What sparked that creative genius inside of you, Darren? Darren leaned back in his seat and hooked his arm over the back of his chair. It came to me while I was working for the Tiny Titans camp. Cedar barely held back her snort. I met Alyssa, one of the Titan cheerleaders. I'm sure Teo here knows her pretty well. She's the blonde with the big, curly hair and big. He cut off when Deja cleared her throat. Teo's hand tightened on Cedar's leg. Cedar chewed the inside of her cheek. She had been practically living at Teo's house during the day and not once had he gotten a phone call that wasn't from the team or Elijah or his family that he left the room to take. Most often, he talked while right next to her, making it impossible not to overhear his conversation. As transparent as Teo was, she wasn't with him all the time. He left for meetings, photo shoots, to film commercials, she couldn't account for his whereabouts 24 hours a day. An icy chill trickled between her shoulder blades. If he knew his words were ice cubes down Cedar's back, Darren didn't slow down to give her time to recover. Alyssa has this amazing hair, big curls every woman dreams about. He winked at Deja. Deja jerked. Cedar could see her trying to work out if she'd just been insulted. Her hand went to her own tight spirals. At least Cedar wasn't the only one thrown off by Darren. His lies continued. She was always complaining about how hard it was to find someone to cut it and cut it right. And, well, there it is. He layered on the cheesy grin like he was making an I'm a big fat jerk quesadilla. Cedar held back from telling him just what he could do with that smile. The trouble was, even if he did steal her idea, there was nothing she should do about it. Darren had the money, and he had the jump on her. Three weeks from opening. Growling. One look at his smug little face, and she knew he knew it too. No wonder he was so confident in his bold-faced lies. You should have brought Alyssa with you tonight. We could have squeezed one more chair around the table. Deja glanced around the room as if Alyssa would appear at any moment. I'd love to meet the inspiration behind the man. We, uh... Darren picked up the straw wrapper and began twisting it. We are no longer seeing each other. I'm sorry to hear that. Deja managed an appropriate level of sympathy. Or maybe she was really sympathetic. She had no idea what was going on under the surface. None of them did. Well, they would. But Cedar wasn't going to make a scene. Not in front of all these people. The cameras and whispers that had surrounded Teo the last time they went out were still fresh in her memory. She didn't want to cause him bad press. Cedar was trapped in this box made up of all the angles and consequences she could foresee. Anna came back with a large tray full of steaming dishes. Cedar tucked her anger away and put Akone in his high chair. She didn't want him grabbing one of the hot plates and getting burned. The table was quiet as everyone took their first few bites. Cedar's chicken enchiladas were full of seasoned meat, chilies, beans, rice, and cheese. I have passed through the pearly gates and am eating in heaven. Deja dropped her chin as she chewed. Darren began asking Elijah questions about being an agent, the ins and outs, and what cut he got of a player's income. The last question had Elijah choking on his beef taquitos. Cedar enjoyed her food so much more when she tuned him out. Once Elijah stopped coughing, Cedar asked Deja questions about baby names, and they were off on a discussion topic that left the men on their own. Partway through their debate over girl names that sounded like boy names but were spelled differently, Cedar heard the words cookie bar. Her head turned so fast the room blurred. I'm sorry, she interrupted Elijah. Did you say cookie bar? Elijah wiped his chin with a napkin. The melted cheese was stringy and kept getting stuck in his beard. That's exactly the kind of reaction we're hoping for. 
He slapped Darren on the shoulder. This guy is a real go-getter. He's already looking at opening his second business, called the Cookie Bar. The room blurred again, only this time Cedar hadn't moved a muscle. Her brain connected all the dots and drew very clear pictures. Darren was an even worse ex-boyfriend than he had been a boyfriend. She could let one idea go. Call it a stupid tax for discussing her future with a nincompoop. But there was no way in this big old state of Texas she was going to let him get away with harvesting the best parts of her. A raging fury built inside, churning over and over itself until she was unable to silence the good sense that told her not to make a scene. I have to hand it to you, Darren. You've got more guts than I gave you credit for. Thanks. He lifted his cup her direction. Yep. It takes a lot of courage to sit at the same table with someone you stole business ideas from and then try to sell them right back. Cedar couldn't sit any longer. She pushed her chair back, the legs scraping against the floor. Your ideas? Elijah asked in disbelief. She glanced around. A few people looked her way. She hated that they scowled at her as if she were the problem just because she was standing up and talking a little loudly while Darren, the real culprit, blinked up at her from his seat. He froze, his cup hallway to his lips. He watched her for a moment before setting his cup down. She's right. The air squeezed out of her and Cedar sank back into her seat. Did you just admit you stole my idea? Darren wiped his lips before answering. Cedar and I discussed many business ideas. We worked in the same groups and attended the same classes. She's, he took a deep breath and turned his eyes to meet her gaze. His look said he missed her. That he believed what he was saying. Pretty amazing. Cedar pressed her palms into the top of the table. I made a big mistake letting this one get away. Teo stiffened. If Darren noticed the hardening of Teo's muscles, he didn't react to it. In a manner of speaking. I would love nothing more than the opportunity to work with you on the cookie bar, Cedar. We're a great team and we could take this to the franchise level in 18 months, I'm sure of it. Cedar stared at him. Are you offering me a job? Because that was a kick in the gut. Working for someone else to develop her company would be torturous. No. I want us to be partners. He tipped his head, implying there was more to this partnership than just a business. Cedar groped for her glass of ice water. Partners? That was insane and flattering in a weird way. Darren had done all the work to get investors thus proving that he could succeed and thrive in the business world. His charm had taken him further than Cedar's dreams in the sky had taken her. But, if they worked together, she glanced at Teo. If they worked together, Teo needed to know everything. Otherwise, she'd feel like she was sneaking around behind his back. Facing Teo, she smoothed her top and spoke as evenly as she could. Darren and I used to date. There. It was out there now like some ugly snail in the garden of conversation. I told him I wanted to start companies. We even talked about doing it together before we broke up. Excuse me? Teo got bigger. The place went quiet, so quiet the soft music coming through the speakers in the ceiling could be heard. Up until that point, Cedar had no idea music was even playing because the din of conversation had been loud enough to drown it out. Cedar put her hand on his arm, hoping to calm him down and avoid a scene. She wanted to tell him that she was over Darren, that Teo was the only man for her, ever. But there was this draw to Darren and his offer she couldn't ignore. They had so much in common, including their career paths life would be so much easier if the guy she was with worked right alongside her. She and Teo had something special, something she'd never had before. They felt like a family. And, while that was nice and all, there were other parts of her that needed to be fed. 
Darren may not be family material, but he made her feel important and smart, like she was capable of more than entertaining a one-year-old for the afternoon. Not that Teo made her feel stupid or treated her like she was incapable of a masterful thought, he just didn't need that side of her. Confused and irritated at herself, Cedar pulled her hand away. Elijah cleared his throat. We should take this conversation somewhere more private. Deja placed her hand over her belly, her nose wrinkling. I know I was craving Mexican tonight, but I shouldn't have had the fried peppers. Would anyone mind if we called it a night? Cedar's heart sank. She'd caused everyone to feel uncomfortable, and now Deja was looking for a way out of the evening. She'd blown it big time. Darren pointed right at Deja's face, his finger invading her personal bubble. You and that baby are what's most important. He quickly got to his feet. I'm going to wash my hands. I'll meet you all up front to say goodbye. Heads nodded, but no one really looked at him as they got to their feet and collected purses and diaper bags. Darren was so calm about having just upset the balance of their lives. Deja linked her elbow around Cedar's ramrod straight arm. It took Cedar a moment to realize she was showing support, showing that she believed her side of the story without coming right out and saying so. She relaxed her limbs and bent her elbow so they were linked together. Will you walk out with me? Deja asked. I'm feeling warm and I don't want to wait for Teo to make it out of the crowd. Cedar glanced over her shoulder and saw several people watching them. Just like before, they waited until Teo was done with his meal before showing obvious interest. Thank goodness. The idea that they'd been eating in a fishbowl made her squirm. Life with Teo was definitely different than regular old Cedar's life had been. I'll take a Kone, Elijah offered. Keep him away from the cameras and all. Thanks. Cedar relaxed a little more. Instead of dropping her for the embarrassment she'd caused them by blurting about her and Darren's past relationship, Elijah and Deja rallied around her and helped her out. They'd gone above and beyond what was expected from a brand new friend. And they were her friends. After tonight, they'd solidified her loyalty to them. She and Deja wound through the tables, making better time than Teo, who was stopped every few feet for a selfie and a handshake. They reached the front doors and spun around to wait for the guys. Teo was laughing with a man and his date, already stepping away to signal his need to move on. Elijah was a few feet behind him, holding Akone. Darren had come back from the men's room and was smiling and talking with Elijah. His hands were moving, but they were controlled, calm. She could only imagine what story he was making up. A sick feeling began to overtake her. One that was like poison moving from her center then slowly through her veins, and a pounding in her pulse points returned with a vengeance. Suddenly, she was a vulnerable young teen with an overbite and stringy hair. Her mom said everyone went through an awkward stage, but Cedar returned there every time she faced a high-pressure situation she didn't know how to handle. It haunted her. Don't look at him, Deja instructed. Not until you can be calmer than he is. Cedar huffed, turning her back to the room and folding her arms. I don't know what to do. I mean, I want the job, but I can't say if I want to work with him again or not. Deja rubbed her back. And part of you still loves him? Cedar snorted a laugh. I'm not sure I know what love is supposed to look like. I thought we were in love, but then he broke up with me so easily that I questioned my love meter Deja smiled. Ah, see. Now, with me and Elijah, there was no doubt. It said that when you find the one and the time is right, you'll know. Cedar nodded. I can't help but wonder where I would be if Darren hadn't broken up with me. Would we be opening just for curls together? She shook her head. But you wouldn't have met Teo and Akone, Deja offered. Nothing happens by chance, my dear. 
You need to embrace where you are now and then figure out where you want to be. Cedar agreed. I can't change the past. But we don't have to let it ruin our lives or kill our dreams. That's giving ex-boyfriends far too much power. Cedar paused. You think I'm being weak? I think you are stronger than you believe. Thank you for believing me. Deja patted her hair. Between you and me, I could kick that guy to the curb. Looking at me like I don't measure up to some cheerleader? PFT. Just because I'm pregnant doesn't mean my brain turned off or my body isn't beautiful. Cedar laughed. Darren's signature charm had failed him with Deja. For some reason, that made Cedar like her all the more. You weren't fishing for it, but I'm throwing this one in the boat. You are so beautiful that you put butterflies to shame. Deja lifted her chin. That's what I'm talking about. She pulled her cell phone out of her purse. Okay, give me your number, because I want to go out with you without the boys. It was Cedar's turn to glow. I'd like that. They exchanged numbers just as Teo and Elijah, and unfortunately Darren, made it to the waiting area. Darren stepped forward and offered his hand to Deja. She eyed it dubiously before taking his in a limp hold and removing it without actually shaking hands. He made his way through the men next and saved Cedar for last. It's wonderful to see you again, he said for all to hear before wrapping her up in a hug. I've missed you, he whispered in her ear. His special occasion cologne brushed against her memories, making Cedar forgive him a smidge. He pulled back and patted her arm. Let me know about the partnership. You have my number. Cedar stared, unable to express the dozens of questions and comments that stampeded through her brain. Before she could gather a complete thought, Darren clicked his key fob and strode away. She did have his number, and she felt like a slimeball for keeping it in her phone even though she had slid right from the internship to Nanny. The next thing Cedar knew, she was in the passenger seat of Teo's SUV and they were pulling into traffic. She'd been so caught up in her head and yes, even part of her heart, that she didn't remember saying goodbye to Deja and Elijah or clicking her seatbelt in place. Teo hadn't said a word, or if he had, she hadn't responded with anything more than a soft grunt. The sun had set while they were eating, and the streetlights made dark shadows across his square jaw and chiseled features. He gripped the wheel with both hands, his triceps bulging. Cedar stared down at her hands in her lap. That was weird. She glanced his way and then out the window where she could watch Teo's reflection in the glass. Was that weird for you, too? Yeah. The light changed from yellow to red and Teo slammed on the brakes. Cedar braced herself on the dash for the stop. Waves of angry heat rolled off Teo's body and slammed into her. If I had known we were meeting with Darren, I would have told you about our past. Why didn't you? Because there was no need. It's in the past. Is it? Because you seemed kind of friendly back there. He was friendly. You weren't stopping him. I was taken by surprise. Teo harumphed and leaned closer to his door. Even though it was just a few inches more between them, Cedar felt the space as surely as she would have felt a wall between them. She twisted her knees so they pointed forward and stared out the windshield. A few minutes later, Teo asked. Are you going to work with him? I don't know. She said so quietly she wasn't sure he hurt her. I need a job. You've applied to dozens of companies. Cedar's hackles went up. I've applied to a half dozen companies. None of the positions are my dream job. And working with Darren would be your dream. No. Building the cookie bar would be. It was my idea in the first place. I'd like to see it come to fruition. But, she cut off, not wanting to express the confusion Darren had created in her heart. She didn't love Darren, he'd hurt her too deeply for her to go running back into his arms. 
his small arms. Now that she thought about his hug, he really was scrawny compared to Teo. When Teo wrapped her up, she was cocooned and protected and overwhelmed with hormones. When Darren held her, even when they were together, she didn't feel all that. But? Teo prompted. But my situation has changed. I've changed. She shifted, turning her knees towards Teo once again. Darren and I broke up because I wanted to have children and he didn't. You were talking about having kids? That's serious. His lips became a thin line. We talked about our futures a lot. It's what people do when they're about to graduate. Anyway, he thought kids would be a chore. I thought they'd make life all the sweeter, and we parted ways. He made that comment about Deja and the baby being a high priority. Cedar brushed invisible crumbs off her lap. I don't know if that was him trying to charm Deja or if he really feels differently now. What if he does? Where does that leave us? Cedar reached out and laid her hand on Teo's arm. I, I don't think I want to get back with Darren. You don't think? She dropped her face into her hands. Teo, this is all a big mess, and I haven't had two minutes to process anything. I want to give you the answer you want to hear. I do. I want to make you happy and wipe those wrinkles off your forehead, but I need to think first. Fair enough. He pulled into his driveway and put the car in park. Elijah says we are legally committed to back the salon. I can't get out of the contract. You'd lose so much. Teo waved away her concern. There's more important things than money. Cedar's gut twisted at the thought of Darren walking away with Teo's money. She put her hand on the door handle. I've got to go. Her apartment would be quiet and was freshly stocked with cherry soda. She could drown her sorrows while she figured out her future. I'll see you in the morning. At the last possible second, she burst across the console and kissed Teo's warm cheek. Her heart did a little flip. He brushed her hair over her shoulder. They stared into one another's eyes for a moment before Cedar tore herself away. As she made her way to her car, she noted the difference between saying goodbye to Teo and saying goodbye to Darren. Darren left her edgy and discombobulated. Teo made her feel warm and wanted. She climbed behind the wheel and started the car. The drive back to her place was filled with self-evaluation. Who was she? Who did she want to be? There was no denying the entrepreneurial spirit raging inside her being. Yet she'd enjoyed being a nanny, enjoyed it a lot. Even as she'd interviewed for other jobs, she'd known leaving Akone was going to be so much harder than she ever thought possible. The chubby baby held a large portion of her heart in his hands. And then there was Teo. Playing house with him was real, so very real. She could easily fit into that life without having to change her shape. Darren couldn't offer her the same deal. He'd want to change who she was, harvest her ideas and abilities, and leave behind her need for a family. Cedar made it home and made herself a warm cup of cocoa. Even now, after leaving behind Camp Buckeye, a cocoa before bedtime ritual calmed her down and settled her thoughts. As the steam wafted from the mug, warming her nose and lips, she came to a realization. The woman who had dreams and goals wasn't lost the day Darren broke her heart, she was right here, waiting for Cedar to give her the green light to make things happen. She needed to be bold. She needed to pull her dreams out of the clouds and set them in motion. So what if Darren had stolen two ideas? He had all of them, somewhere, so she had to get moving if she was going to beat him to the punch and get the others up and running. Tonight wasn't a great night, but it was a necessary experience, because it showed her that she was on the wrong path professionally. She wasn't made to work for someone else, to be a cog in a giant machine. She was a machine maker. Teo would call that revelation a miracle. 
he'd say that the Lord was teaching her about her potential. Cedar smiled. She loved Teo's faith, his optimism. Even though he hadn't looked so optimistic on the drive home. She hated leaving him waiting for an answer, but she wasn't about to say something she couldn't back up. He accepted her as she was and didn't want to take anything away from her. He'd supported her as she graduated, changing his schedule if needed so she had the time to meet with counselors and turn in her internship evaluation or go to interviews. If she had to pick between the two men, she'd pick Teo. Not because of all the butterflies he could unleash with one look, although that was a bonus, as was his physique. No, what really mattered was that Teo was the type of guy she'd been hoping to find in Darren. He may not meet all of her needs in every area of her life, but finding a fit like him was like looking for a unicorn. She set aside her half-full mug and stretched. Tomorrow, there would be a long conversation with Teo, one that needed to happen. There was so much to clear up, so much to explain. It was time to come clean about all of it. Time for both of them to shed their layers. And if that went well, then they had something to build upon. If it didn't? She shuddered. Life without Teo and Akone wasn't a life she wanted to plan. Hopefully, Teo was ready for this conversation. If they made it through, then she'd consider that a miracle. Chapter 18 Teo paced in front of the couch while Cedar paced behind it. Neither one of them were able to sit still as Cedar laid out everything that had happened between her and Darren. She said she wanted things between them crystal clear, so he didn't worry. Teo did worry. He worried the whole time she talked that she was going to tell him she wanted to be Darren's partner. Small knives rolled around in his stomach, cutting him up from the inside. He'd fallen for Cedar. Fallen hard and fast and he didn't want to let her slip away. He opened and closed his fists. So what I learned from all of this is that I'm not meant to work for someone else. That's what you've learned? He stopped and threw his arms out. Cedar, I've got to know where we stand. I can't wait in limbo any longer. I'm not good at it. Cedar stopped moving and leaned on the couch. I told you I didn't want to go back to Darren. No, you said you didn't want to work with him. Oh, she glanced down shyly. In my head they were one and the same. They aren't. Teo climbed on the couch, his knees digging into the cushions. Cedar's sweet pineapple scent teased him closer and gave him the courage to cup her face in his hands. I slept like crap last night. Cedar giggled. I'm sorry. She traced her fingers lightly over the bags under his left eye, her touch reaching all the way to his heart. I wanted to be sure of myself. Are you? He searched her ocean eyes finding the deep greens and blues that had captivated him the first time they'd met. I'm sure I don't want Darren, professionally or personally. Tail brought her hands to his lips and pressed a kiss to her fingertips. Her skin was soft and warm and sweet. He took a deep breath, ready to tell her he loved her, that he wanted her in his life from here to as far as he could see and beyond. Cedar spoke first. I need to get my life back on track. Teo could see the wheels turning in her head. She wasn't caught up in emotions right now, she was calculating her next big move. Which meant she was confident that the two of them were settled for the time being. That wasn't a bad thing. Her perception that all was well between them meant she felt confident in their relationship. He could wait to lay his feelings bare. He glanced around the living room. This wasn't exactly a romantic setting. He let out a sigh. He could do so much better. She continued, if Darren can find backers, then I can do it, too. He may not be able to say I love you right away, but money he would gladly give away. You've already found one, how much do you need? Cedar didn't answer right away, and the silence lengthened between them. 
Eventually, she took a deep, fortifying breath, the kind that pulled her chest up and her shoulders back. I can't take your money. She spoke so quietly that he had to lean sideways to catch the last word. That was unacceptable. Teo had worked hard, darn hard, to get where he was in life. If what he had couldn't help the people he cared about, then what good was it? Why not? Because it's too easy. She pulled her hands out of his grasp and placed them on his cheeks. And that's a bad thing? I need to pound the pavement, pay my dues, put in the time, and work my contacts. I need to build this myself. Does that make sense? He just wanted the peace they'd had over the past few weeks at home where ex-boyfriends didn't pop up and Cedar didn't talk about shutting him out of a part of her life. The old, familiar shaking in his hand started and a thousand-pound weight of dread settled on his chest. Amy had shut him out, too. He thought he'd conquered all of her rejection, put it in the ground when he buried her, but this situation was too familiar. He spent several seconds working to calm his hands. Cedar was not Amy. Cedar wasn't trying to keep him away from his child. Cedar was determined and wanted to make it on her own. Her grittiness was something to admire, not fear. Still, the weight remained. There was only one way he knew to conquer and that was to hit his opponent hard. Except he couldn't hit Cedar. I can respect that, he managed to say. Cedar leaned her head against his chest. I need to dust off the old plans I wrote. Go through files. Make some phone calls. I feel busy all of a sudden. Teo listened as she continued to discuss her first steps back into the business world. He managed to rub her back as she spoke. It's still early. Do you want to spend some time on the beach? The soft sand had become their special place. Which was perfect, because before that, it had been just his. There was no one on earth he would rather share it with than Cedar. She shook her head. My brain is going a hundred miles per hour. I've got to get to my laptop. Rain check? He clenched the couch to keep his hands from shaking again. This was important to Cedar, and he needed to give her space to be herself. He repeated many of the phrases that had gotten him through life with Amy in his head. Sure. We'll celebrate out there, together, when you've got everything settled and ready to go. Darren had upset Cedar, spurred her into action. Cedar's reaction to the event was a positive one. She wasn't in a ball on the couch crying her eyes out. She was taking the field. Like in a game. If you got knocked down, you got up. As he entered the house with Akone on his shoulder and Cedar's headlights on his back, he couldn't shake the feeling that they'd entered a new ball game, and he didn't know the plays. Chapter 19 Cedar brushed her fingers through her hair, wincing at the feel of the two-day-old product. Akone was out of sorts, and she was running out of patience. Her heart wanted to just sit down with the boy and rock him as his new teeth wreaked havoc on his otherwise peaceful life. But her head ran in circles, reciting the many tasks she had yet to accomplish. She stared longingly at her laptop sitting open on the coffee table, just out of reach. Akone had been content being rocked as she stood at the kitchen counter and typed with one hand while holding him in the other arm. But after twenty minutes, he started to cry. He didn't want to have to share her attention with the computer and only settled down when she snuggled into the couch with a cotton blanket. She hummed a tune she couldn't remember the name of and ran her fingers through his hair over and over again. The inability to accomplish anything grated across her neck muscles, making them tighten in the most uncomfortable way. Being a nanny was supposed to afford her some free time, but Tail was filming a commercial of some sort for body spray or foot spray or hairspray. She couldn't remember what he'd said before he left that morning. Akone had kept him up most of the night, and he had bags under his eyes. 
The poor guy needed some pampering, if only she had 20 minutes to take care of him or wash her hair. On top of the pain in her neck, her back was killing her from holding Akone for so long. He was not a small kid, and since he wasn't feeling well, he hung limp. The baby pain medicine would take a few more minutes to kick in. She just needed to bide her time, and then she could lay him down in his crib and get some work done. Several hours later, Cedar put away the thermometer. Akone didn't have a fever, but he was still fussy, which was so unlike him. Her phone was overflowing with web pages offering advice on how to soothe his pain. He shoved away a cold washcloth when she tried to get him to chew on it. He wanted nothing to do with the teething ring. She was so desperate, she brought up her mom's number. She stared down at the number on the screen, unable to press the call button. Her parents thought she was still working for the Tiny Titans camp. Telling them that she had been let go was not an option. They had expectations for their daughter, and being a nanny wasn't on the list. The philosophy that life was meant to be fun only extended so far. Akone cut off Midwale and slumped against her, having finally given in to his exhaustion. Cedar didn't dare lay him in his crib. That was her mistake last time. The second she put him on his back, he screamed as if the walls were coming down around him. She put a pillow behind her lower back and settled onto the couch with Akone's head resting on her chest. They were reclining, sort of, and she was able to lay her head back and take some of the tension out of her neck. She just needed a minute of rest, and then she would bring her laptop over and type one-handed again. Just a minute of rest. Cedar. A deep, inviting voice called her name from somewhere far away. She liked the voice, she just didn't want to go to the place where the voice came from. Staying in the nice, cozy darkness was so much more pleasant. Cedar. No way, she muttered. Shifting so she could roll over, she felt a weight on her stomach, holding her down. A heartbeat later she remembered Akone and stopped moving, afraid to wake him and start the whole process all over again. The baby needed sleep. She needed sleep. Teo needed. Teo. Her eyes popped open, and she stared into the most handsome face she had ever seen, except for the makeup. The thick powder coated Teo's face, making him look like plastic. What? she asked. Hi there, sleeping beauty. She pushed off the couch with one elbow while steadying Akone with the other. What time is it? Just after eight. What? She tried to stand and was thrown off balance by Akone's weight, landing back on the couch. I have so much to do today. Teo gave her a half-smile that was downright adorable. She paused in her rush to admire him. Though he'd been up most of the night, he looked all right. The bags were gone, probably hidden by all the makeup. She'd have to find out what brand of concealer they used, because dang. The whites of his eyes were bright too. He took Akone, tucking the sleeping baby into his elbow. Wait, did you take a nap? she asked. Teo ducked his head. I may have caught a few power naps while they were changing sets. Cedar wanted to throw a pillow at him. She'd had a full night's sleep, but after a day of trying to mind-read a baby and anticipate his needs and listen to him scream in her ear when she didn't get it right, she was more than a little jealous of Teo's easy day. Sure, he had to shoot a commercial and work, but he'd been the star, pampered. At least she could check pampering him off her to-do list. Wait. If she didn't pamper him, who had? Some woman with a tight shirt and a platter of donut holes? The image made her gag. She hadn't been able to completely block out those kinds of thoughts lately. Not since Darren planted the seed of distrust in her head. She pulled her shirt away from her body. Akone's body heat had made her sweat under the blanket. I stopped at the grocery on the way home and bought a couple of steaks. I thought we could barbecue tonight. Teo headed to the kitchen. 
Cedar followed, rolling her head from side to side. I'm going to have to pass. I didn't get anything done today, and I have so much to do. Teo's bright eyes dimmed with disappointment. Oh. Okay. Cedar went to him and slipped her arms around his middle, resting her head on his chest. He smelled so good, rustic and fresh all at the same time. She probably smelled like sweat and greasy hair. Ugh. It's definitely time for a hot shower. Teo kissed her temple. You always look beautiful. She snuggled in a little closer before pulling away. I'd better get going. I'll be here tomorrow. One more day of filming? She didn't want to seem too eager to have a day off, but she needed time. Personal time was a luxury when she was caring for Akone. Yeah. Do you have plans? Teo hoisted Akone higher on his shoulder. Work. I need uninterrupted hours to read through the proposal from start to finish, and I still need to refine the presentation. I should drop into it and swim around for a while. Ever since she'd turned Darren down, Teo had become the best boyfriend ever. He paid attention to her needs, like bringing steak home and offering to cook for her. He hugged and kissed and tickled her until she shook off the seriousness of the day and had a chance to unwind. She loved every minute with him. There were times when she felt like he was holding back, working to control something inside of himself, but she didn't dwell on those times. Or tried not to. The green-eyed monster wasn't a good look, and she hated giving in to her own insecurities. If Teo could remain faithful to a wife who didn't love him, then being faithful to a girlfriend who cared would be all that much easier for him. I get that. Teo followed her to the door. Thanks for getting him to sleep. Cedar brushed her finger over Akone's cheek. He can have another dose of the pain meds in half an hour. She hovered in the doorway. The tasks ahead pulled on her, urging her out the door, while the fact that Akone needed her tugged her the other direction. Adding to that end of the tug of war was also her need for a good make out session with Teo. He was such a good kisser, finding every sensitive spot on her neck and igniting her lips with every kiss. If they started kissing now, she wouldn't be home until midnight at the earliest. She couldn't afford to put things off, even for a blissful evening with Teo. And really, she was a hired nanny. She had to separate her duties on the job from her duty to the little boy and her feelings for his father. She loved Akone, she really did, but she had no claim on him. Teo could fire her at any moment, and she'd never see Akone again. Not that he would and not that they'd found a replacement for her. They'd decided to put the interviews on hold for a couple days while Teo filmed and she finished up her project. This whole thing would be a lot easier if Teo would sweep her into his arms and lay one on her. She wouldn't fight, maybe protest a little, but that just made staying all the more fun. Confused at the many sides of her at war, she took the concrete steps slowly, cringing at the sound of the door closing behind her, it rang out like a warning that there was too much at stake to mess this up. The trouble was, she wasn't sure what she was messing up, her personal life or her professional one. Chapter 20 Cedar Hit Print The sound of the inkjet jetting ink was a victory tune. She was too tired to get up and dance, though. Her apartment was a mess. Piles of papers were scattered on the side tables and across the kitchen counter. Half-eaten bowls of cereal were stacked next to the couch, added to the pile when the solution to the problem she'd been pondering hit her out of the blue. Protein bar wrappers, a nasty habit she picked up from Teo, lay here and there, and the carpet was in dire need of vacuuming. The massive amount of cleaning she faced was worth finishing the presentation. She let out a contented sigh just as her phone rang. Hoping it was Teo so she could share the good news, she answered quickly. Hello? She hadn't seen him in two days. 
While working on the presentation had been fulfilling and exhausting, she'd felt the loss of not holding Akone or kissing Teo. She very much wanted to share this moment with them. Sunshine, is that you? Noah Baker's voice boomed through the phone. Noah's family owned Camp Buckeye, where Cedar had worked every summer of her high school years. She and Noah had worked together before Noah went off to the police academy. Two years ago, he'd taken a private security job and fallen in love with the woman he was hired to protect. That woman happened to be one of the wealthiest people in Texas. Cedar was networking the tar out of her connection to Camp Buckeye to get this phone call. She'd had to call Noah's mom and explain everything to get an email address he might look at. Billionaires took their privacy seriously. Noah wasn't who she was expecting, but the good fortune of getting his call wasn't lost on her. Noah! How's the weather? If he could pull out the old camp nicknames, then she was free to tease him about his given name. Teasing was good. Teasing was relaxed and open and friendly. At least with Noah Baker it was. Noah laughed easily. If a flood was coming, I'd put my money on Texas to survive. They are too tough here to drown. Don't I know it. Wait, are you in Texas, sunshine? I've been here a couple years. I just graduated with my MBA. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thanks. She gulped. Where exactly in a conversation should a person cross over from friendly catching up to asking for $50,000? Noah continued. Harley and I read your email. We're definitely interested in talking to you sometime about this doggy cafe. Cedar squeezed her eyes shut and worked hard to contain her squeal. Great. When are you available? Well, we're headed out of town next week, so we can do Monday or in three weeks. Cedar pressed her hand to her stomach. Monday was the day she and Teo were supposed to take Akane to the zoo. There were just three weeks left before Teo had to report in for preseason workouts, and then his life, and their time together, would revolve around the team's schedule. She had no idea what that meant, having never dated an NFL player before, but got the distinct impression that the carefree days of off-season were about to disappear. Nevertheless, she needed this meeting, and she couldn't wait three weeks. Darren may be out there schmussing his way into a contract for his own doggy cafe as she sat there in her pajamas. In three weeks, Akone would have a new nanny and she'd be out of a paycheck. She needed to ensure an influx of money before that happened. I'll take Monday. She petted her laptop like it was a cat, grateful she'd spent the last two days buried in her work and could accept the earliest date available. It made her sound confident prepared. Teo would be upset. He'd been feeling neglected lately. Not that he'd said as much, but she could see it in his warm brown eyes. He was battling demons of another sort, but she was the one who raised them from where they slept. If she could just get this business up and running, then she would be able to make things right. Great. I'll email you directions to Harley's office. I'm looking forward to meeting your bride. I can only imagine the woman you roped into marrying you. She laughed. Ha! Huh. I can't believe she agreed to it in the first place. There's a whole story there. I'll fill you in when you get here. They said their goodbyes and hung up the phone. Cedar pressed her warm hand to her clammy forehead. She'd known Noah for years, seen him play tag with children, ghosts in the graveyard with teens, and had even pranked him a few times, but asking him for money caused her limbs to quake. She was independent by nature. She started doing her own laundry at ten, not because her parents made her, but because she felt it was time she stepped up. They, of course, were all too happy to have one less responsibility. She needed to continually remind herself of the fact that loans were part of a business. And just because she was borrowing from a friend, didn't mean she was any less of a success than if she'd borrowed from a stranger. 
The question of why she didn't take Teo's money popped up and made her sit down. Teo was different from Noah. She wasn't dating Noah. Of course, she hadn't been on a date with Teo in over a week, either. Still, she wanted to keep Teo separate from all this. Not that she was worried that things would end between them, on the contrary, they fit so easily together there was no reason for insecurities between them. The reason she didn't want Teo's money was that she wanted to show Darren up, and she didn't want Darren thinking she had to date a man to get him to hand over funds. Heaven forbid, she gave the impression she was sleeping with Teo or that they had a quid pro quo thing going on. Keeping Teo out of this was the only way to maintain her reputation. Another big argument for doing this on her own was that she didn't want to feel obligated to Teo, like she owed him for anything. She just wanted to be free to be with him, without a loan, muddying up the mix. Suddenly wondering why she was sitting in her messy apartment when she could be sitting on Teo's beach, she sprang into action. She fit what she could in the dishwasher and called Teo. He answered on the second ring. Hello, lovely lady. Hey, stud. Teo laughed, a deep, throaty, intimate sound that sent a thrill all the way to her toes. Stud? Can you call me that in front of the team at least once? I'll call you stud once a day if it will get me a kiss. She was happy to be all bold and flirty since he couldn't see the misshapen t-shirt and sweats she wore. Deal. There was so much happiness in his voice, so much, dare she say, love? That it gave her pause, before she broke the bad news. She had no desire to wipe those adorable dimples off his cheeks. So, I have some great news and some gray clouds. I don't like the sound of gray clouds. Let's start with the great news, then. She shut the dishwasher and selected the hot wash cycle. Some of those bowls were crusty. She proceeded to tell him that she'd landed a meeting with a promising potential investor. He heartily congratulated her, which made her feel all the worse for adding, the not-so-great news is that I have to take a rain check on the zoo. The only day there in town for the next three weeks is Monday. That's one big rain cloud. Teo spoke low. I know. I'm so very sorry. I don't mean to disappoint you and Akone. I didn't really have a choice. He sighed into the phone. I don't know when else I'll have time to go. I'm booked with preseason interviews. The pictures of us at the restaurant a couple weeks ago came out, and everyone wants to know about the new woman in my life. Really? I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. She picked up a clean washcloth and dug the disinfectant out from under the sink. I won't give them your name. They're mostly going to ask things about getting over Amy's death and moving forward. Cedar scrubbed at the counter. I still don't like it. There's not much I can do about it. He sighed again. So is this your official notice? Do I need to hire a new nanny on my own? Cedar cursed under her breath. I scheduled two interviews for Wednesday. I just forgot to tell you. I, I am not sure what's going to happen after the meeting. I can change the times if you need me to. I'll rearrange some things and make it work. The finality in his tone was not right. Tail was warmth and sugar and hot kisses. This stoic man was part stranger. And she didn't like that he had appeared in their lives. Cedar would have done the interviews, but Teo wanted to be there. Of course he wanted to be there, he was Akone's father. And what was she? Right now, she felt like a nanny on her way out the door, not like the girlfriend and partnering caregiver he'd treated her as before. She felt like a huge jerk for dropping this on him. When she'd taken the job as his nanny, they hadn't planned on her falling for him or Akone. The whole thing snuck up on her and sucked her in without a conscious thought. She should really take a minute and think about where she wanted to be in a year. Did she want to be trading off a kid with Teo? Was she ready to make a commitment to the two of them? 
There was no way to love one and not the other. A husband and kids were on her list of life goals. They were one of the top priorities. Getting everything she wanted in life, the chance to build her own business and a hot guy and a darling little baby, was overwhelming. She wanted it all, she just wasn't sure she wanted it all now. A family was a big commitment. They came with responsibilities. She glanced down at her Friday the 13th wardrobe. She was holding her life together by loose strings, how could she consider taking on more, even if they were the best parts of her life? Cedar? She could see Teo in her mind. He was probably running his square fingers along the edge of the countertop. She could even tell by the slight echo over the line that he was in the kitchen. She smiled to herself. The fact that she knew him well enough to smile at the thought of him told her that her heart may not have waited for her head to decide anything. S'mores, she blurted. Let's do s'mores after my meeting on Monday, to celebrate. There was only a short pause as Teo adjusted to the new conversational direction. Sounds like a plan. We'll be here and have a fire going. I'll bring the goodies. It's a date. She cradled the phone. I can't wait. Chapter 21 Tao wandered around the backyard, picking up toys and sweeping sand off the patio and into the beach. The house, his refuge, was too quiet. Akone had finally cut his tooth and was back to his quiet, studious self. As much as Teo enjoyed the time with his son, he'd missed talking to a grown-up. And not just any grown-up, he missed Cedar. She filled a hole in his life and his heart that he didn't think would or even could ever be filled. When they'd first kissed, the world seemed just right. They could spend the whole day at home together and not fight. Not once. He wasn't dumb enough to believe that a couple would never have a disagreement. Heck, they'd had one the day she cancelled going to the zoo. If you could even call it a disagreement. They hadn't yelled and there was no name calling, not that he was prone to either behavior. They just sort of stumbled through the hurt feelings. He wasn't sure they'd solved anything in their stumbling. At some point, they'd have to have a conversation about what they wanted out of all this. Five weeks of dating wasn't usually the point in the relationship where a deep conversation needed to take place, but they were facing some major changes, and he needed to be focused for the season. Relationship drama was the number one distraction for a football player. The team was counting on him to be on his game, and he needed to figure this out. That's why tonight was the night he was going to tell Cedar he loved her. They had the evening to themselves. They had the firelight. The setting was romantic and intimate. He'd showered and shaved and ironed his button-up plaid shirt for the occasion. It wasn't every day a man said those big words to the woman he was dating. With the backyard in shape, he started the fire. It was still warm enough to roast a turkey on the sidewalk, but the shade tarps had kept the sun off the beach. The sand was warm, but not too hot on his feet. He must be getting used to living in Texas if he looked forward to a fire on a summer day. Or perhaps he was looking forward to holding Cedar and having her all to himself. He needed a night of the two of them, whispering while they cozied up together in a lounge chair. When he was satisfied with the yard, he took Akone inside. His son was red-faced, so Teo gave him some water to help cool him off and wiped his face with a cold cloth. He checked the clock. 7.33. Cedar had the code to get in through the door, so he decided to start Akone's bedtime routine. At 8.15, he went out to the fire to wait for her. Really, she should be here by now. Worried, but not wanting to appear needy, he sent a picture of the low-burning fire and a text that said, ready for something sweet. She replied with a smiley face emoji without any words. Hmm, Teo slipped his phone in his pocket and folded his arms to keep his hands from shaking. She could be driving. At 9.30 he called, assuming she was on her way and would answer. 
It went to voicemail. He followed up with a text, things must be going well, and the same emoji. He wasn't sure what time it was when he fell asleep in the lounge chair, but his last thought was that his arms were empty and cold, and he hadn't been able to say I love you. Chapter 22 Cedar put the car in park and cut the engine. Teo's house was dark, the windows black and the solar lights ran low on energy. The sound of her door opening echoed down the row of adobe houses. Her heels clicked on the stamped concrete walkway and the keypad light lit up the front porch. All of it drew attention to the fact that she was late, so very, very late. She'd texted Teo when she left Harley's office, but hadn't gotten a response. Noah had met her in the lobby of the office building in downtown Dallas. The place was huge, with glass walls and chrome accents. Harley was detained, but Noah had given her the grand tour, ending in a small kitchen with a kind woman who offered them homemade cookies and fresh lemonade. They talked for a while, reminiscing over pranks between their cabins and asking where other counselors were now. The longer she waited, the more she understood that Noah had set this up as a favor. She wondered if she should just offer to come back. But three weeks was so long, and she was ready now. Harley breezed in at 3.12, looking as composed as if she'd just had a day at the spa. That wasn't the case. Cedar could hear her on the intercom to the secretary and receptionist throughout her time in the kitchen. Noah had introduced them, and Harley wanted to know as many stories about Noah as possible. She was good friends with Paige, Noah's sister, who was also Cedar's good friend. Paige had a baby not much older than Akone. Their conversation merged into business, and before she knew it, they were ordering in dinner. There wasn't a break in the evening where she could politely step away and call Teo. The heaviness of letting someone down, someone who was important to her, settled on her mind as she discussed first quarter gains. Cedar looked around, hoping for some sign of life. If Teo was in bed, she couldn't walk into his house, his bedroom, and wake him up. She'd never set foot in his room, and she wasn't going to go in now while he was sound asleep, like some weird stalker. She slowly made her way back to her car. Despite having secured the funding for the doggy cafe, she had the feeling that things were slipping away. Between missing dates and phone calls and texts, she was becoming the world's worst girlfriend. The longer she was away from Teo the more she missed him. That was a sign, right? A sign that they were meant to be together, that he was her match. Deja said there was no doubt. When the timing and the person were right, then she'd know. Cedar looked around for a shooting star or a spotlight to land on the house. Nothing happened. The timing could be off, because she had decided to go after the doggy cafe with a vengeance which meant this void in their relationship was her fault. The realization hung around her neck like a boulder. I am in control, she said to the windshield in an effort to convince herself she had everything under control. The answering silence was not reassuring. Chapter 23 Are your hours flexible? Tao looked up from his phone where Mrs. Parks resumed stared up at him. She had all the right qualifications, and Akone hadn't run to hide behind the couch when she came in. You bet. Mrs. Park smiled, creating several parentheses around her lips. She wore a long, light pink t-shirt with the Texas Titans logo on the front and a pair of darker pink slacks. Her running shoes were white. My husband passed a couple years ago, and my son lives out of state. I can schedule my visits during the off-season. She tucked both sides of her short blonde hair behind her ears. I'm sorry for your loss. Teo nudged Cedar, who was staring at her phone. She jerked in her seat. Huh. Teo tipped his head towards Mrs. Park. Oh, I'm sorry. Cedar clicked her screen off. How do you feel about a variable schedule? Teo waved off Mrs. Park, who looked like she was about to launch herself into the same speech he'd already heard. 
he'd had enough and got to his feet. Thank you for your time. We'll be in touch. He escorted her to the front door and made sure she was headed down the street before going back inside. He found Cedar balancing Akone on her hip while she scrolled through emails on her phone. She'd come dressed the part of an executive nanny today with her long, flowing skirt and button-up blouse. The large belt around her middle accentuated her curves, and her hair was in a messy bun that looked just right. He reached for his son, hoping to steal a quick kiss. Cedar handed Akone over without making eye contact. Teo checked his hold as his hands began to shake. The familiar feeling of being dismissed crept over him. Cedar wasn't freezing him out to spite him, but the chill was just as strong. He set Akone in the ball pit. A few steps and shots of courage later, he slipped his arms around Cedar from behind. Hello in there, he murmured in her ear before kissing her neck. Cedar leaned into him. Her phone went to her side and her head tipped back to allow him better access, a fact he would make good use of. Hmm, mmm, she hummed. He kissed her earlobe and she gasped. Teo smiled against her sweet, pineapple-smelling skin. He splayed his fingers across her belly, loving the way she fit against him. Cedar's phone signaled a text, and she jolted and hurried to read the message. The warmth between them cooled as quickly as fresh muffins on a granite countertop. Teo released her and ran his hands through his hair. You're like a big storm cloud brewing. Cedar looked over her shoulder, her thumbs over the keyboard. He made sure they made eye contact. That didn't happen all that often these days. Her eyes were still ocean blue with green waves in them. Still beautiful. What's wrong? Her phone went back to her side. Teo scratched the back of his neck. There were so many things he wanted to say, like, can you put your phone away long enough to look at me? But he wasn't looking to start a fight. He'd had enough fights to last a lifetime. I miss you. She lifted her arms slightly. I'm right here. No, he picked up her hand and tapped the phone. You're right here. Cedar smiled softly. I'm sorry. The permit came through right before the interview, and I have 30 people that need the green light. This is exciting. She put her arms around his middle. What about the interview? She shrugged. I liked her. What about her husband? Teo asked, testing. It was a dirty, rotten thing to do, but he was pretty sure Cedar wasn't paying attention, and he wanted her informed opinion. He sounded nice, she hedged. Teo gritted his teeth. He's dead. Cedar chewed her bottom lip. I must have missed that. You're missing everything lately. Cedar nodded. I know it's crazy right now, but things are going to get better. I can do this. Her arms tightened around him. There were no such promises from Amy, and yet Teo had a hard time believing she meant what she said. How could she promise that? She had no frame of reference, no idea how busy a season was for him. He didn't necessarily need or want a woman at home, barefoot and pregnant and at his beck and call. He liked Cedar's drive, the fact that she didn't need him but wanted him in her life. At least, he thought she wanted him. He wasn't so sure of that anymore. And he couldn't go into the season with all these questions. People implied that his less-than-stellar performance at the end of last season was because of Amy's health. They'd never come right out and said it was a surprise that she'd died, and the media assumed she'd struggled with blood clots for a while. He let people believe what they wanted, too wrapped up in learning how to be a father to care what was said. This season was supposed to be different. He owed it to his team, the fans, and himself and Akone to be settled before football took over their lives. Teo shook his head. I can't do this again, Cedar. Do what? 
I can't be pushed aside or put on a shelf. I don't want to be second string to your job. Cedar lifted both eyebrows. Says the man about to give his life over to football. What does that mean? Cedar dropped her arms and stepped away. Nothing. Never mind. Teo dodged around her. Tell me. She pressed her lips flat. From the get-go, this whole arrangement was about you and what you needed. You need a nanny, you need to meet with Elijah, you need to shoot a commercial, you need to play football. You. 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 What did you think I'd do? Drop my life and pick up yours? That wasn't at all accurate. He'd been there for her. I, Cedar folded her arms over her chest. I didn't mean all that. I'm stressed and I shouldn't take it out on you. Teo plowed ahead. I thought we gelled. I fell for you, Cedar. I fell for you, too. Cedar's body lost some of the edge, but when he reached for her, she leaned away. There's more here to consider than just a few kisses. Are we, either of us, in a place to make a commitment? Teo's hands went cold. His heart soon followed. If you have to ask the question, then the answer is no. Her mouth opened and closed. I guess, I'll, go. Her eyebrows came together as if she was trying to figure out what she'd just said. She wandered around the living room, picking up her purse and laptop and the sweater thing she'd folded over the chair a couple weeks ago. He'd left it there, like seeing something that belonged to her when she wasn't there. She stopped in the middle of the room and did a slow circle. With a sudden burst of energy, she ran to Akone in the ball pit and pressed a kiss to his forehead. Her eyes dropped shut, the lids fluttering. Teo longed to pull her close and run his hands down her silky hair, to stop her from leaving. He wanted to blame this all on Amy, to say that she'd messed him up and he was worried and sick and needed validation because he was insecure in a relationship. He couldn't get the words to form. He knew what he wanted out of love and marriage. If being married to Amy had taught him anything, it was what he didn't want. And this felt very much like what he didn't want. The big difference was the sorrow in Cedar's blue-green eyes. There had never been sorrow on Amy's part. Cedar was bent over trying to carry what she felt, what he was causing. She bolted for the door. Teo let her go, knowing the whole time that when she'd picked up her belongings, she'd also taken his heart. Chapter 24 The hot Texas summer turned into a warm Texas fall. Cedar worked like a dog to open the doggy cafe on time. She planned the schedule and should have known better than to create such a tight deadline for herself, but she was working to forget Teo and decided that the less downtime she had, the better. He was into pre-season workouts now. She wondered how he was holding up under the intensely physical sessions. How much did he see Akone? Did either of them think of her, miss her? She missed them. Sometimes, before she fell asleep, she would remember the feel of Teo's lips against her ear, and she'd giggle at the memory of the tickle when he hummed. Those moments didn't last long. She wouldn't let them, or she'd end up crying into her pillow. Opening day arrived, bringing eager dog owners into the cafe. Cedar spent the morning educating customers on their specialty meals for puppies and active and older dogs. Each owner had concerns about their pet's diet. One woman stopped in to demand she open a similar cafe for cats. Cedar smiled and told her it was a wonderful idea and that she would see what she could do about that. Around three, Noah and Harley walked through the door. They'd been home for a week and a half. Seeing them brought back a host of memories Cedar wasn't ready to face about the night she'd stood up Teo. She deserved to be dumped, but that didn't make her miss him any less. Harley told her labradoodle, Elvis, to sit, and he did. She smiled down at him as if he was the smartest animal on the planet. 
Cedar, this place is wonderful. I love the colors and the clean lines. She hugged Cedar. You're a miracle worker to get this up and running so fast. Cedar stepped back and dropped her gaze. There was that word, miracle. She couldn't hear it without thinking of Teo. He saw miracles in everyday moments. Her heart gave a squeeze. Hey, you too. How's Elvis? She reached her hand out for the dog to sniff before patting his head. With a dog around, there was always something to talk about. Elvis leaned into her, lapping up the attention. Noah reached over the dog to give Cedar a hug. You look like you could use a break. Noah! Harley shoved him aside. Hush! You look beautiful, Cedar. She threw an I can't believe you said that glare over her shoulder. Cedar chuckled. Noah has seen me after a muddy tug of war, covered in briars, covered in horse hair, and covered in pie after I lost a pie eating contest to his little sister. If he says I look like I need a break, then I must look horrible, and he was being kind. She brushed her fingers over her messy bun. I haven't been sleeping well since, she cut off, not wanting to burst into tears in the middle of her business on opening day. Harley gave her a sympathetic look. Since you and Teo broke up? Yeah, she admitted, her throat scratchy. She worked to swallow down the emotions that swelled up inside. Harley patted her arm. She was being so nice and so understanding that Cedar couldn't keep the confession inside. I should be thrilled today. She waved her hand half-heartedly, indicating the stained concrete flooring, the counter where several dogs ate their specialty meals, and the wall of dog toys and accessories. One woman was putting headbands on her pug and taking selfies with her. She had several headbands in a basket by her feet and was adding to her pile of purchases. The doggy cafe was a success. But all I can think about is that he's not here. She pressed her fingers over her lips to stop the quivering. Noah nodded. Do you want me to shoot you? Cedar dropped her hand and her jaw. Excuse me? Harley puffed out air and rolled her eyes. Noah lifted his chest. It worked for me. I took a bullet to the shoulder and woke up with Harley in my bed. Your hospital bed. Harley punched his shoulder. And you're not allowed to do that ever again. Cedar widened her eyes. That sounds like an interesting story. The bell above the door rang and four older men in golf pants and polo shirts filed in, leading four dogs of varying breeds. Cedar looked back and forth between Harley and Noah and her customers. She held up a finger. Can I hit the pause button? Harley laughed easily. We'll look around for a while. I'll call you so we can get together in a couple weeks. Thanks. I'll see you two later. She went to talk to the men, who were clustered together and looking nervous. Noah touched her elbow to hold her back. Since I can't shoot you, his eyes danced with laughter. From what she remembered of him, Noah was rarely serious unless it came to protecting his family or police work. I'll just tell you that guys like women who go after what they want. Even if that means she has to apologize. Cedar scowled. You're assuming I did something wrong. She had, but he didn't know that. Noah lifted one side of his mouth in a lopsided smile. If you didn't, you'd be sleeping a lot better. He held up both palms. Don't shoot the messenger. I wouldn't dare. She moved out of his reach. Not that I'm afraid of you. Your wife, on the other hand, Noah grinned. I tell her all the time that she's terrifyingly gorgeous. Cedar shook her head as she crossed the short distance to her newest customers. Noah and his siblings were the closest thing she had to cousins. Working for the Baker family at Camp Buckeye was like being adopted. 
she hadn't realized how much the camp had influenced her for the good in her formative teenage years. She glanced over her shoulder to see Harley and Noah discussing the display of organic dog food samples. From where Cedar stood, Harley had it all. She had the money. She had the business. She had the man of her dreams. And she looked happy. Not fake happy, but the real kind of happy that was in her eyes and her soul. Noah was right, she needed to make things better between her and Teo. The opening of the doggy cafe should have been a triumph, instead, it was a revelation. There were times when she was dating Teo that she'd been alone, but she never felt lonely. Every day without him was empty and echoed with what could have been. She'd been so worried about striking out on her own that she had isolated herself from the man she loved. All the success in the world couldn't touch her heart the way Teo had, let alone fill it. She needed to find him. She needed to find them. A happy life wasn't about balance. Balance was a cruel joke. There was no such thing as balance. There were priorities, and hers had gotten out of alignment. That's why she couldn't eat. That's why she couldn't sleep. That's why her heart ached. Cedar squared her shoulders and welcomed the four golfers to her store. Her smile wasn't forced. Her conversation flowed easily. Funny, all this time she'd been trying to shove Teo out of her head when she should have been welcoming him into her heart. As she stood there, listening to the men brag about their breeds, her heart warmed. That's the miracle. She smiled. Love is the true miracle. Teo had that figured out, and it was about time she caught up. Hopefully, he'd give her a chance to prove that miracles happen, even to her. Chapter 25 Teo ran down the tunnel, the sound of cleats on concrete bouncing off the walls. He took off his helmet, and his head was immediately scrubbed by the quarterback. Great game, the Zeus boomed, grinning so wide he could have been on a toothpaste commercial. Long live Zeus. Teo thundered back. Zeus laughed and bounced around the locker, running high on their win. Winning the first game of the season was a great way to start. He could only imagine what the announcers were talking about in the booth. This was the year of the Titans. Teo entered the locker room. He wanted to celebrate with his team. On the outside, he was all smiles. On the inside, he was an empty shell. Breaking up with Cedar was supposed to make things better, to remove her as a distraction from the game. It didn't work. Cedar had lit up his and Akone's world. She made small things special. That was a gift he had taken for granted. He'd driven past the doggy cafe on opening day, thinking he would drop in and say hello. Without a dog, it was pretty obvious he would be there to see her, and he wasn't ready to put himself that far out there. He imagined walking in and seeing her happy and content and realizing she didn't need him the way he needed her. And then he drove away. Yeah, he'd chickened out. If any of the guys on the team knew, they'd razz him for weeks. He'd lost his shot. That was all there was to it and he had to suck it up and live with his issues. The party atmosphere prevailed as guys changed clothes, gave interviews, and met their ladies to head home. Teo kept his head down and stayed out of the camera lights. He pushed through the doors to the back hallway, which led to the player's parking lot. This area of the building was off-limits, to press and much quieter. A large poster board had been taped to the floor. He stopped to read it, curious. Lost, one boyfriend. A total stud. If found, please return to parking lot. He chuckled. Some poor guy was going to get teased about this one. Teo took two steps, hesitated, and then went back to read it again. Stud? Hmm. He joked with Cedar about calling him that in front of the team. He squinted. She wouldn't, would she? 
he hurried around the corner, where a trail of posters lined the way to the exit. Each one said something different. I gave my heart to a football player. This one gave him pause. He wanted to believe Cedar loved him as much as he loved her, that she missed him. We all make mistakes. Falling in love with a football player isn't one of mine. They'd both made mistakes. But he could learn from his, and she could learn from hers, and they'd be okay. They'd be better than okay. If this was really Cedar. If not, he was getting his hopes way too high. You have no idea how fast my heart beats when I see you. Maybe not, but he had a pretty good guess. The idea that Cedar was waiting outside the door, which was only one poster away, made his heart pound so furiously he was sure it shook the roof on the stadium. Wanted, a great kisser. Please apply in person. He laughed out loud, then looked around to make sure none of the other guys had heard him. This one had Cedar written all over it. He shoved his way out the door at a run and scanned the parking lot. There was a group of guys bunched around his SUV, so he made his way that direction. From a few feet away, he could hear Cedar's laughter. Sorry, I'm pretty sure the position has been filled. Hey, you can't advertise for a great kisser and not expect me to show up, said Seth Dallas. Like a bull in the arena, Teo saw red. He pushed his way through the group of about six second string linemen and planted himself in front of Cedar glaring at the applicants. Like she said, the position's been filled. Teo? No way. Seth guffawed. This is your lady? Cedar's delicate hands came around his middle and she poked her head out from behind him to address the group. I'm most definitely his lady. Though she spoke with a note of authority on the subject, she looked up at Teo with a question in her eyes. Teo twisted around, wrapped his arms around her, and lifted her up so she was within kissing distance. Cedar's look flipped from uncertain to ecstatic. Teo's heart gave a giant leap as she kissed his cheek once, then again. The guys grumbled and made their way to their own vehicles. All the while, Teo drank in the feel of Cedar in his arms, against his body, and so close he could smell her sweet pineapple scent. I'm so sorry, Teo. I should have been smarter. He kissed her forehead. You are the smartest person I know. Ha! Huh. She kissed his cheek again. If I was smart, I never would have left. If I was smart, I never would have sent you away. Sounds like we deserve one another. Teo chuckled. I would very much like to give that a try. She drew circles on his chest, right below his collarbone, right where his pulse thundered. Love is the miracle, she said quietly. What? He set her on her feet and cupped her face in his hands. Say that again. Love is the miracle. You once told me that miracles happen all the time. I didn't believe they would happen for me, but I figured it out. Love, the kind I feel for you, that's the miracle I get in this life. Teo brushed his thumbs over her cheeks. That's a pretty amazing miracle, Cedar, he whispered as he lowered his head to kiss her. I'm sorry for what I said. I wish I could take it back. Cedar's breath caught as Teo brought her closer to him. She told the truth, her love for Teo was a miracle because it had changed her whole outlook on life. We can't go back, she said, but I want to go forward with you. I love you, Cedar. The words were barely out before Teo's lips captured hers in a long, slow, seductive kiss that filled her insides with butterflies and had her lifting on her tiptoes for more. His large arms wrapped her up, and she melted against him, grateful for his strength, because his achingly perfect kiss had knocked her feet right out from under her. He moved to deepen the kiss, and she went positively limp in his arms. Teo, she gasped. He smiled against her lips. I like it when you say my name like that. She laughed. 
Wrapping her arms around his neck, she pulled him closer. Teo, she whispered seductively. I love you, too. He growled and kissed her with urgency. She thought she'd been swept away before, but there was a whole new connection between them. Several cars honked and they broke apart. Cedar buried her face in Teo's chest, embarrassed that she'd been so bold in public. Do you want to come over for esmores? Teo pumped his eyebrows. Cedar felt her face heat up. I'd love more. Don't you mean esmore? Nope. I mean more. She winked. More kissing. More of this. She ran her hands up and down his arms. More time with you. He hit the button on his key fob and the doors unlocked. More it is. Cedar hopped into the front seat and buckled her seat belt. They could come back for her car. Teo hurried around and got behind the wheel. He reached for the call button on the dash. I can call and ask Mrs. Park to stay for a cone. No, Cedar put her hand on his. I'm dying to hold him. Please, can we all be together? Teo's dimples appeared. That sounds great. Cedar leaned back in her seat, her fingers lacing with Teo's, and took a deep breath. The weight that had been dragging her down for weeks had finally lifted. Her life had taken a sharp left turn the day she met Teo, but now she knew that it was the right path for her. You've been listening to The Miracle Groom A Texas Titans football romance novel Written by Lucy McConnell Narrated by Christina Dimmick. Well, how was your time in a football romance? I hope you enjoyed it. I actually got one um, review on this one that said it was quite a bit steamier than my other books, which made me laugh because I thought, I mean, it's all very chaste. <laughs> So let me know in the comments if you think that these kisses were a little steamier than my normal ones or if they were about the same. Also like, subscribe, and do all those wonderful things for the channel to help other people find it so that I can keep creating wonderful audiobooks for you. And thanks for being here and thanks for listening. Have a great week.